is based on the use of ultrasound for imaging and for therapeutic purposes as well. Ultrasound is the frequency of sound beyond the hearing ability or the range, which is 20 to 20 kilohertz. And we generally use uh, the range of uh, one to maybe even up to 12 megahertz, uh, uh, one to maybe even up to 12 megahertz, uh, uh, one to maybe even up to 12 megahertz, uh, uh, one, there is some echo there. Okay, sorry about that. So that's, that's the frequency that's commonly used in clinical ultrasound. Just briefly about the history of ultrasound, uh, the reason I put this in is to make people understand where this uh, revolution came from and how long it has taken to completely change the face of medicine. So it was in 1880 where Pierre and Jack Curie uh, were identified the piezoelectric effect it was 1914 when the first ultrasound generator was made using piezoelectric effect. And in about 30 years, it was first used in diagnostic uh, medicine. And when it was initially used in diagnostic medicine, it wasn't real-time imaging. It, so it was more like A-mode imaging and it was only for the experts. The boom started in the 60s. Real-time imaging hit uh, clinical medicine in the 70s and spectral and color Doppler got into clinical practice in the 80s. We as trainees and early consultants saw uh, ultrasound as point of care ultrasound machines available at the bedside uh, somewhere in the late 90s. I remember using my first ultrasound medicine uh, machine in ICU somewhere around 1998. So why has, what has made ultrasound uh, so ubiquitous presently in the ICU and in, in, in clinical medicine and everywhere else? The most important thing is that it allows us to see inside the body and that too in real time. And this is a great advantage. Uh, quite often when we examine a patient, we can only see uh, what, what is on the surface. For example, you can see a patient's anemic or has got icterus or has got a rash. But beyond that, what's happening to his internal organs uh, or what is the source of infection is quite often not possible to identify other than by clinical uh, examination. Um, ultrasonography has changed all of that uh, dramatically and we'll talk about that in the next few minutes. The big advantage is, is that there is no radiation so you can do it again and again. The decrease in the miniaturization of the ultrasound machine has made it very, very portable. The extension of the ability of batteries has also increased portability. It's quite easy to learn. It's a pattern recognition uh, where you can identify problems, you can identify organ systems. And the most important thing is the decrease in the cost of the machines that uh, allows it to be used everywhere today. For example, in a small hospital like ours, uh, we have two ultrasound machines just for ICU, ER, and, uh, and, and the operating theaters. Uh, so what's resulted in this explosion in application of ultrasound? So one is decrease in the cost of, of the equipment, a significant improvement in the technology. So you now have different probes and, uh, which can reach various parts of the body. For example, you have a transrectal probe, you have a transvaginal probe. Miniaturization has allowed the probes like endoscopes to have probes, for example, the gastrointestinal and bronchoscopes with the e-bus. Digital imaging is the other major thing and uh, battery technology allows it to be used widely. So these are some of the reasons why there has been an explosion in the applications. Just briefly going on to the areas of major impact, it's majorly impacted diagnostic medicine. We'll briefly talk about that. It's also increased the safety of the procedures we used to do. I still remember trying to put in uh, blind uh, internal jugular cannulation in, in the early 90s when I was just training. And you know, when we got a first hit, we were very, very, we used to be very thrilled. But today with the presence of ultrasound, you know, that is almost a given. And then there are therapeutic applications of ultrasound. I will not talk much about it because it doesn't affect us as anesthetists uh, very much. So I'll talk very briefly about it. So 
talking about the radiological applications of diagnostic ultrasonography, this is the usual stuff that we are all used to. Now, uh, ultrasound can reach, the, the reach of ultrasound is only limited by bone because bone does not allow ultrasound to penetrate through it and, and air. So these are the two major things. So if you have areas where the bone and air are not a major problem, ultrasound is very, very useful and allows us to uh, you know, come to a diagnosis much, much more early. Ultrasonography uh, is very useful for measurement of Doppler blood flows for vascular diseases. You know, its reach has been improved in colorectal as well as obstetrics and gynecology by the presence of or the development of the transvaginal and the transrectal probes. Its role in, again, uh, pulmonology as well as gastroenterology has been expanded with the present availability of the EBUS, which are the endoscopic uh, ultrasounds. Today, there are even intravascular ultrasound probes, which you put at the end of a catheter, which allows you to put uh, you know, the catheter into the coronary artery and, and do ultrasonography of the coronary artery. So these are all some of the areas where diagnostic ultrasonography and obviously uh, there is echocardiography, which, which is a major thing, which is a, a major part of cardiology, right? Uh, obviously the ultrasound uh, guided biopsies and drain placements by, by the uh, radiologists is a very, very, very important part of therapy today for source control. So uh, briefly going on to the next topic, which is uh, the domain of the cardiologist. Uh, you know, it's completely transformed cardiology. I no longer hear anyone telling me that there is a mid-diastolic murmur in the mitral area. It's likely to be a you know, mitral stenosis. Today, we can pick up an echo probe exactly see that it is mitral stenosis. We can calculate the mitral valve orifice, tell there is a clot on the LA or not, right? So that's, that's how uh, echocardiography has completely changed uh, cardiology. It's bedside, it's real time. We can assess the cardiac function. You can quantify the cardiac output. Uh, we can do tissue Doppler to tell how fast the, the tissues are moving. Right? And we also do contrast echocardiography. This uh, is very, very interesting. Uh, for example, we recently had a case where we had a uh, left IJ cannula go down the left, you know, on check x-ray showed that the cannula was in the, on the left parasternal area. So what we did is created micro bubbles in a syringe and injected it. And we were able to confirm that the vessel, the, the, the cannula was still in the vein. Uh, by the bubbles being noticed in the right ventricle. So it was basically a patent left uh, uh, internal jugular vein. Transesophageal echography is a totally, uh, you know, a chapter in its own. Um, it helps to diagnose uh, diseases of the heart in situations where you're not able to get a good picture of the uh, heart because of lungs or the bones uh, in, in the chest. and it's, it's something, the application of transesophageal echo in cardiac surgery, uh, live during procedures, is something that's transformed cardiac surgery. So again, just as exactly as uh, palpation and percussion is more or less dead, uh, you know, we, probably people are now writing uh, the end of the stethoscope as well. Uh, obstetric ultrasound is, is a, another, uh, you know, area that has completely transformed clinical medicine, especially obstetrics. We are able to scan for fetal anomalies. We are able to exactly monitor the growth of the fetus by biparietal diameter, femur length. Uh, we are able to do uh, diagnostic procedures, for example, amniocentesis or uh, chorionic villi biopsy on, and all of these things. So these are some of the areas that have completely transformed obstetric uh, medicine. Musculoskeletal ultrasound uh, is something, again, uh, very, very, is, is a rapidly growing area. It allows us to assess soft tissue injuries easily, helps us to get to a diagnosis, which probably uh, would have required an MRI, which 
would entail much higher costs uh, and uh, would require much longer time. So it's brought the diagnosis in the hands of orthopedic surgeons, physiotherapists, sports medicine people, it's point of care. So, you know, especially for soft tissue injuries, this uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound, um, you know, it's growing leaps and bounds and more and more orthopedic surgeons and physiotherapists are embracing this technology. Again, as I briefly said, vascular ultrasound, uh, not only by Doppler, but for <coughs> intravascular ultrasound uh, for both arterial and venous disease. It helps us better quantify and localize disease. It's point of care. At the hands, in the hands is the most important thing. Ultrasound by it getting out of the hands of the radiologists into all the clinicians, clinic, you know, significantly empowers the clinician to make an earlier diagnosis rather than depend on clinicians uh, or a radiologist to be available, which will often delay the process. So the other major revolution of, of ultrasound is the focus. Now, uh, point of in, in the emergency medicine, it's point of care echocardiography. Uh, you know, for example, somebody presenting in chest pain, if you have, uh, you know, regional wall motion abnormality in addition to a raised stroke, it's likely to indicate that it's ischemic heart disease. Transthoracic imaging, you can identify whether it's pulmonary edema, whether it's a pleural effusion. Uh, in, in the emergency medicine, uh, ultrasound guided vascular access uh, is, is almost now routine. We use uh, focus uh, ultrasound guided fluid resuscitation. Uh, EFAST in trauma patients can significantly decrease the time major abdominal injuries or major thoracic injuries, you know, hemoperitoneum or hemothorax. In a cardiac arrest, we can identify whether this is because of bad heart, whether it's because of a PE. And the other thing that uh, the diagnostic ultrasonography is used in emergency medicine is for DVT screening uh, in, in conjunction with a suspected PE. So these are some of the common things. Uh, again, contrast. So when we go on to uh, focus in critical care, it's more or less exactly along the same lines that we do in emergency medicine. We use it a lot for point of care echocardiography, thoracic imaging in patients who are on ventilators or are deteriorating. We can identify the cause and do the correct treatment. We use it routinely for both arterial venous and central venous and peripheral venous cannulation, uh, fluid resuscitation, which ultrasound guided uh, as well as clinically guided is, is, is the way we manage things. Again, in cardiac arrest, DVT scanning, scanning and contrast echo are some of the common things that we do in critical care. Uh, coming on to, to more of relevance to us, it's the perioperative care and chronic pain. Ultrasound guided nerve blocks uh, have made nerve blocks safer, more effective, allow us to do the blocks on arrival in, in the ER, allows us to do uh, ultrasound guided catheter placements. So all of this has increased the scope of regional anesthesia uh, and the predictability of regional anesthesia. And uh, it has made regional anesthesia more uh, you know, acceptable to both the anesthetists as well as the surgeons. And uh, the other major area where uh, ultrasound is impacting is ultrasound guided central neuraxial blocks in the extremely obese or the difficult spines. This is something that allows us to use, do a spinal or an epidural in situations where we were initially not able to do so, right? The other common things exactly as in emergency medicine, as well as in uh, intensive care in the perioperative period, uh, more and more anesthetists uh, are using point of care echocardiography, they're using thoracic imaging to understand why the patient's oxygenation is worsening intra-op, uh, it's being routinely used for vascular access, both arterial and venous. Uh, we use it routinely for guiding fluid resuscitation intra-op. Uh, even if we have a difficulty in access to the abdomen, we do a transhepatic IVC. Um, it's very useful for diagnosis of cardiac arrest or peri-arrest in the intraoperative period. 
uh, and post-operative DVT scanning, and uh, especially in cardiac anesthesia, intraoperative and perioperative transesophageal echo is more or less becoming routine today. Intravascular ultrasound, I will, you know, this, this is uh, a very niche area. It's just about beginning to come in. It allows us to identify intimal thickening, clock volume, lumen size, clot burden. So these are things that, uh, you know, uh, will add to the armamentarium of diagnosis in patients with both coronary and vascular disease. Uh, surgeons have also taken to ultrasound other than the obstetricians. Today, surgeons do their own procedures. We have a lot of surgeons who will confirm that when they are doing a DNC that the, the uterus is empty. We routinely have our hepatobiliary surgeons use ultrasound intraoperatively to identify and better localize the lesions. So these are some of the I'm just giving a flavor of how ultrasonography has moved away from the hands solely of the radiologist to everyone else and has just completely transformed clinical medicine. Uh, very briefly on therapeutic ultrasound, uh, mainly by physiotherapy. It's used for both patients with acute and chronic pain. Uh, use of ultrasonography, ultrasound helps promotes healing, improves circulation and relieves pain. It's being extensively used uh, today. It's kind of made infrared and all of those therapies uh, defunct. So, and the other area where it's being used for therapeutic uh, use is in urology, where for treatment of kidney and ureteric stones, you have ultrasound uh, based uh, lithotriptors in addition or combined with pneumatic uh, lithotripsy. It helps better stone clearance. And, uh, you know, the pneumatic one depends on the stone staying constant, whereas with the ultrasound, that's not the case. So in summary, uh, I'm just in time. Ultrasonography has completely revolutionized healthcare in the last maybe couple of decades. Uh, the application of ultrasound is likely to continue to grow exponentially and focus uh, and the increasing number of specialties embracing ultrasound is responsible for this growth. Uh, ultrasound is, uh, increases the safety of procedures and the ease of diagnosis, which is critical uh, in, in clinical medicine today. If there is one take home point that I would like to, uh, everyone to take away from this meeting is, uh, today clinicians will need to gain proficiency in ultrasonography to stay relevant in the coming future uh, and to, to make their own practice safe. With that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are questions, uh, I'll, I'll take them. OK, all right. We'll take the questions later. Shall we go on to the next, right? We have still have got, I think, uh, time. I have given some time in between. You can stop sharing screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, they, there aren't any any questions yet, yet on the uh, YouTube thing. You're still, you're still sharing uh, your screen now. So. I know, I know. I'm just, I'll just get okay. off. Yeah. Uh, Next uh, one, the next talk is, again, a basic, I think you covered quite a lot, uh, some on uh, <laughs> about ultrasound everywhere. I think uh, whether it's in anesthesia, medicine, or in emergency medicine, medicine gastro, everywhere. So it's, it's great. Uh, but uh, what's the science, science behind um, regional anesthesia and uh, why is it actually gaining so much of popularity? Uh, uh, Devesh is going to talk to us about that in the next uh, 20, 30 minutes. Yeah, I think uh, we are uh, well. Devesh, if you just give me one second, I'll just briefly uh, yeah. introduce you. Just, just one second. Yeah. Okay, okay, fine.
other if you're trying to uh, share a slide you could actually just tell divesh <laughs> he's the, he's a king of haryana yeah <laughs> <laughs> works relation so, yeah so uh, dr divesh thank you very much for uh, volunteering to participate in this program actively so as a brief uh, introduction to about dr divesh as uh, dr shiv said he he is not only the king of He is not only the king of Haryana. He is also the director and head of department of anesthesia and OT services in Asian Hospital in Faridabad. Uh, he is also an NABH assessor. He is a green OT assessor. He is the past president of the uh, Haryana ISA State Branch. His areas of interest include quality and safety in anesthesia, ultrasound guided regional anesthesia, fluid management strategies, and intraoperative lung ventilation strategies. I won't stand between uh, Divesh and all of you, right? um okay divesh this it's your time now uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen uh, is my screen visible yes okay uh at the outset i'd like to thank uh, global anesthesia society as well as uh, prakriya hospital for giving me this opportunity i'll be speaking in next 20 25 minutes about the science which has led to increase in the role of regional anesthesia in the present day anesthesia practice i bring greetings from mission hospital which is a 425 bed hospital situated in faridabad haryana and we are very actively involved in teaching in terms of dnb as well as regional anesthesia so for this particular set of lectures uh, i do not have any conflict of interest i will be sharing many images which are from google and the references are from pubmed So let me introduce this topic, my dear friends. Regional anesthesia is the art and science of selectively relieving pain in a specific part of the body by the percutaneous administration of local anesthetic drugs, which we all know. And if you actually look at this editorial, very recently published in 2021 in Anesthesia, they have stated very beautifully that we are currently in the golden age with regard to the practice of regional anesthesia. and in next few slides we'll try to understand why are we in this golden age so if you actually look, look at the past uh, history of anesthesia be it general or regional parallel developments have been taking place in the last millennium and uh, if we actually look at it till 2000 uh, regional anesthesia was defined as an arcane and it was a difficult art which was practiced only by a small group of enthusiasts but what has happened in this beginning of this new millennium certainly there is a renaissance in the regional anesthesia practice and which is multifactorial and my job is to help you in understand why regional anesthesia has become so popular in modern day anesthesia practice so one of the, first and the foremost reason what i can think is that we have a better understanding of the anatomy of the nervous system i mean the clinical anatomy and uh when we all studied mbbs we relied on this famous book bd charashi and i can assure you everyone of us has studied this book but now this is an era of smartphones and we have so many apps and it has led to a better understanding of the anatomy of the nervous system we can actually have a virtual as well as augmented reality and we have a visible human body project and we can analyze layer by layer different aspects of human anatomy pertaining to the nervous system and this is one of the principal causes in my opinion and there is certainly a paradigm shift and initially we were practicing definitely when i started my residency at jamnagar gujarat we were using paresthesia technique and then when i came to delhi it was an era of pns and in 2007 february i can still recollect from indian society for study of pain Uh, annual conference at lucknow and dr atul god was there he would demonstrate to us the use of ultrasound and that was the first ex actual exposure for me and maybe for majority of the indians uh, who were beginning to practice uh, usd guided regional anesthesia so ultrasound my dear friends has revolutionized the field of regional anesthesia and it is giving a big impetus to the modern day practice of anesthesia ultrasound as it is called as a third eye or the sixth sense and modern day stethoscope for anesthesiologists and lot many developments have happened and from a big size machine it has become a very compact and touch screen based machine with 
could artificial intelligence already incorporated good resolutions. <clears throat> So this is the biggest reason that we are seeing a big renaissance in the field of regional anesthesia. Parallel with the development of ultrasound, we have development of USG guided needles, which are ecogenic, continuous catheter sets, and we have pressure monitors also. So let's compare the difference between ultrasound versus peripheral nerve stimulation. So ultrasound definitely has more advantages. It decreases the procedure time definitely increases the success rate and prolongs the duration of block because we are able to deposit the drug more accurately close to the nerve. And it has helped us in decreasing the vascular puncture, decreasing the last, as well as it got a faster block on set. So uh, it can, should we be abandoning PNS in the current era? Certainly not, my dear friends. It can be used as an adjunct and it can be used to monitor the needle nerve contact, especially in deep blocks like lumbar plexus, sacral plexus, anterior sciatic nerve blocks, and particularly for obturator nerve blocks, as it has been stated in the literature. I urge you to read this review article, which has been published very recently, where they have defined how can we use PNS in the current era of USD-based regional anesthesia. So another important reason which, uh, reason which has led to an increase in the regional anesthesia in these last 20 years is the increase in the volume of ambulatory or the outpatient surgery. Our healthcare managers, particularly from US and now, nowadays in India also, they want to bring efficiency in the system. So in last two decades, we actually have seen mushrooming of ambulatory surgeries. And regional anesthesia has become quite popular in context because it provides optimal pain control. The PACU times are short the discharge is facilitated, the opioid use has become reduced and less PONV and less readmission rates. If you actually see the reasons for readmission rates, they are in proper pain control and PONV because of opioid use, but regional anesthesia has helped us in decreasing all this. Another important development which has occurred, we know that last has been a dreaded complication of regional anesthesia. Since early 2000s, we have discovered that intralipid can serve as an antidote. And this has helped in increasing practice more and more and venturing into more and more complex blocks with the higher concentrations also. And we all know this last 20 years has been an era of enhanced recovery after surgery. And it is defined as a multidisciplinary, multimodal approach to perioperative care of the patient undergoing surgery. It's essentially a fast track surgery and accelerated recovery. It started with colorectal and it has nowadays involved majority of the surgeries, my dear friends. So if you actually look at ERAS, it's nothing but a bundle of interventions divided into preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative period. And if you look closely, we have some kind of epidural analgesia or some kind of nerve blocks which have been cited for providing analgesia during intraoperative and postoperative period in the ERAS guidelines. This has provided a very great impetus for increasing role of regional anesthesia in modern day practice. And there are tremendous benefits of using uh, regional anesthesia in ERAS or elsewhere non era settings. First and foremost, definitely we know it provides improved analgesia. And when once we give good analgesia, we definitely decrease the opioid use. We can uh, uh, have a good early ambulation because good analgesia translates into good recovery. Definitely DVT incidence goes down. We have less PONV proritis because we are using less of opioids. And because as we know, opioids cause some degree of sedation. So mental status is much better if you use predominantly RA-based strategy. Definitely recovery room stays have been shortened. Readmissions have been shortened as I already have cited. And this definitely leads to enhanced patient satisfaction. So this is from the website of ERAS Society and I would request you to go through it and we have guidelines ERAS for each and every surgery you can think of and regional anesthesia is one of the cornerstones. So what we are actually looking at modern day anesthesia practice is that the patient should have a good functional recovery, not a simple recovery. And we have quality of recovery scores and we have an acronym by the name DREAMS and American Society for Enhanced Recovery and Perioperative Quality Initiative have done a lot of work in this direction. DREAMS is an acronym which stands for drinking, eating, mobilizing and sleeping. It's not just a simple pain relief. We need to provide pain relief at rest as well as at moment and definitely rest will all follow through because if you give a good pain relief, it uh, results in early ambulation, patient feels like eating, drinking, 
and they have a good sleep. I imagine a patient who doesn't have a good pain relief will not be able to sleep. So the functional recovery would be hampered. So this is a big impetus in the field of regional anesthesia. And definitely we have already looked through that regional anesthesia definitely has got positive outcomes. And definitely in the field of onco-anesthesia, although there are certain papers which say that definitely we get a reduction in the cancer recurrence and there are certain which state it doesn't happen. Let's leave aside that, but it has got positive outcomes in majority of the fields what we study. And modern day Western uh, world particularly is dealing with opioid crisis and soon uh, India would be also dealing with it. And if you actually look closely, the regional anesthesia helps in decreasing the opioid usage and helps in providing us opioid free as well as opioid sparing anesthesia. And it has been very well covered in this article in RAPM in 2019. So another impetus which has helped in increasing the role of regional anesthesia is the research which is actually happening in the field of regional anesthesia, be it clinical studies, radiological, cadaveric, randomized trials. And nowadays we have active regional anesthesia societies which are trying to bring guidelines and practice advisories for young fellows so that they can follow those guidelines and advisories and practice regional anesthesia very safely. So if you actually look at PubMed, uh, PubMed and I type systemic reviews and meta-analysis for regional anesthesia, they were negligible till 2010. And from there you start, uh, you can easily visualize for yourself that there has been an increase. And this increase has happened in last 10 years or maybe 15 years. And we have a prospect group, which is a procedure specific post-operative pain management. They have been bringing out guidelines. They were very slow initially. If you look at it, they brought out TK and abdominal hysterectomy guidelines in 2005 and 6. And it has also taken a couple of years. And actually, this group is a unique collaboration between surgeons and anesthesiologists. And as young anesthesiologists, they would be very fortunate that the evidence has been crystal clear, analyzed, and objectively suggested in form of what you should be actually using, the kind of block, the kind of multimodal analgesia regime. And this is a big uh, impetus to the growth of regional anesthesia in last 20 years. And definitely, as I stated, our ASRA and ESRA have brought us so many guidelines for the benefit of anesthetists, particularly, particularly pertaining to LAST, in case you have any kind of neurological complication after a block. And uh, if the patient is on antithrombotic drugs, they have revised this guideline very recently. And in terms of standardizing nomenclature, and as you know, these days is an era of facial pan blocks, and we have so many plain blocks. But ASRA and ESRA have come together and have, are helping anesthetists all across the globe to standardize the nomenclature. And COVID, my dear friends, since last two years, we know the general anesthesia is associated with aerosol generation and regional anesthesia has ve become very popular, so much popular that uh, there were guidelines from reputed societies regarding how to practice peripheral work blocks as well as neuroaxial anesthesia. And we have all gone through these guidelines. And on the uh, basis of COVID pandemic, and there were certain patients who would require frequent anesthetics, for example, burns dressing, there they advocated use of continuous catheters so that you do not have to take the patient to OT again and again and subject the healthcare workers to aerosol generation in case the patient is COVID positive. So as I have already said, uh, because of the better understanding of anis, uh, uh, regional anesthesia anatomy, good resolution, uh, availability of good resolution ultrasound machines, we have a lot of facial pain blocks which have come into picture. And this image is courtesy Dr. Amit Pawa and TAP was the earliest facial pain block described as early as 2001, but it was initially described as a landmark basement. Slowly, uh, we have had mushrooming of so many facial pain blocks. This all happened because of availability of under, uh, good resolution ultrasound machines and better understanding of the nerve pathways. And I urge you to go through these articles which help you understanding the anatomical basis of facial pain blocks. And definitely, how can we forget social media? And right now, we are witnessing the power of social media. We came together in the Facebook group, the anesthetist. Now we are around 32,000 members all across around 105 countries. And this also has helped in increasing the revolution of regional anesthesia and field of anesthesia. And this has already been published also. It's not just whatever I'm saying. We have already witnessed and this has been come in the papers also. Apart from social media, my dear friends, we have CMEs right now. We are 
part of it and within next two weeks we'll be face to face also we are con having conferences workshops and we are having fellowship as well as observership programs and these are providing good deal of impetus for the youngsters to get involved and to practice regional anesthesia and that is why regional anesthesia is increasing day by day and definitely not to forget the development in the field of pharmaceuticals a lot of development has already occurred. Um, big credit to Neon for bringing out two new molecules, ropivacaine heavy as well as levobupicaine heavy for practicing spinal anesthesia. And this provides an impetus for more research, more thesis in academic institutes and leads to increase in regional anesthesia or neuraxial anesthesia. And definitely we do have additives for prolonging the action of regional anesthesia duration and we have continuous blocks. And this is an excellent article where uh, role of dexamethasone has been particularly highlighted and particularly perineural is uh, these days preferred over, sorry, intravenous is better preferred over perineural uh, dexamethasone. So there has been also a resurgence in uh, revival of the lo old local anesthetics, particularly prilocaine and chlorprocaine. Um, there were certain reports prior to 2000 regarding TNS, so that is why they were withdrawn, but there has been a better understanding and uh, preservatives have been removed. This uh, uh, infographic is from the UK side where they have actually included prilocaine as well as chlorprocaine in the daycare surgeries with the adequate protocols for the majority of the surgeries. This also again has led to an revolutionized the neuraxial anesthesia component of the regional anesthesia. So what is the future of regional anesthesia? My dear friends, it's very bright and artificial intelligence is coming in a big way and we do have robotics coming in regional anesthesia and definitely better understanding of the uh, pharmacology and the anatomy will take us different uh, understanding of the blocks. And I request you to please go through, uh, this is an open access article regarding use of artificial intelligence published very recently. So, we have discussed that regional anesthesia is very popular in these last 22 years. But is it every patient who deserves a block is actually getting a block? Uh, the answer is big no. And this is a big registry of more than 1 crore 29 patients published in RCN and GCI 2018. They actually looked at what percentage of the patients were actually amenable to peripheral nerve blocks and they found 25% were amenable. But out of these 25%, only 3.3% were actually given uh, blocks. So we have to work hard, my dear friends, to increase the patient access to regional anesthesia. So one of the ways is to we have to audit our own practice. I'm almost coming to the end of my presentation. This is a small audit which we presented at the recently concluded Academy of Regional Anesthesia uh, conference at uh, Mumbai. We did a six month retrospective study in our hospital from Feb to July. And the study was done by my fellow candidate. And we found that there we did around 3,900 cases out of which blocks were indicated in around 35% of the cases. That means around 1,339 cases. But actually we were able to give in only 47% of the cases. That means 637 cases. And we have still a lot of room left before we actually increase the patient access. That means more than 50, around 52% of the patients, we could have actually given the blocks, but we didn't give because of the various needles. We tried to understand. And the biggest reason in our practice was, uh, uh, in a way, difficult to convince our surgeons. So we need to audit our practice. We need to do an audit cycle, try to find out the gaps, and then we have to understand that how we can improve our practice. So the take home message from this lecture of mine is that we are presently witnessing a revolution, not in presently, my dear friends, in the since last 22 years, and this is bound to continue. And ultrasound has been a big player in this success of RA in the modern field of anesthesia. This is because we have a better understanding of the anatomy. We have so many facial plane blocks, which are very easy to understand, teach and perform, and definitely, COVID has taught us so many things and there is a resurgence in regional anesthesia because of COVID pandemic and Western countries are dealing with opioid epidemic and soon we will be dealing because oral opioids like oxycodone are very soon going to be available in our country. So thank you very much, my dear friends. Uh, I would like to uh, conclude by stay, saying that the quest for knowledge never ends, my dear friends. It just leads to more curiosities 
and that leads to a greater mind. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Hi, Dr. Devesh. Thank you very much. Uh, a very, very entertaining lecture, very good slides. Uh, you know. uh, there have just been a few questions. I think Shiv has answered in the group uh, on, on YouTube. Uh, there's a question. I'll just give you an opportunity just to give your viewpoint in addition to Shiv's. Okay. Uh, one is, uh, it's a question from Jamie Matthew saying, pardon my ignorance, you mentioned that PNS as an adjunct can be combined with USG. So is the nerve stimuplex needle, PNS needle, echogenic? Can we use it directly for ultrasound guided blocks? Yeah, uh, the modern day needles are designed for two purposes. One, if you want to use as a PNS, they can be used as a PNS guided needle also, as well as these are ecogenic needles. Uh, obviously, there are standalone needles for PNS available, but uh, the in my context, what I was mentioning that the needles can be used for a dual purpose. I use Pejank and they can be used for both the purposes. Even b -brown needles can be used for both the purposes. Yeah, so, um, you know, with the ultrasound, obviously uh, in uh, big centers, they have high quality ultrasound, uh, but some of people may not actually have that kind of quality ultrasound. And where visibility of structures is not that good on ultrasound, uh, combining PNS. So you keep low current. You don't actually keep like 1.5 milliamp. You can start, we can uh, set the current to 0.5 milliamp. And uh, as you go near to the, uh, the nerve, you will start seeing the twitching. So people use it. Uh, some people also talk about like the uh, safety in regional anesthesia, which includes use of... Uh, ultrasound, PNS, and pressure monitoring. So uh, that is not everybody believes in that, but I think uh, uh, people who don't have very high quality ultrasound or who don't have echogenic needles, uh, they can use PNS along with the ultrasound. I think the other, other question was about the statistics which uh, Devesh mentioned. Um, Unfortunately, if you actually look at the literature, we do not have a denominator for number of blocks done across the world because there is no data. Leave alone, I mean, developing world, we do not even develop world like you can US actually have that uh, statistics. So when we talk about, uh, for example, nerve injury, the already it is very low, but if you actually had the denominator of each and every block, I mean, you had the numbers, then you would see that it is so small. So data is not available. So talking about uh, the percentage of patients who can receive regional anesthesia and are re uh, receiving regional anesthesia is very small, but this data is from US and uh, the world is not US. <laughs> the, real, the real world actually does a lot more blocks. If you actually look at India, there are centers uh, which do, you know, a blocks in a month, which people do in a year. So numbers, we need numbers. And uh, we have just, uh, uh, Guru is not here, but launched the Medicis gas app, which will start collecting data uh, from, from the real world. I think uh, as more and more people start using them, we will have more and more data on that. We already started collecting data on uh, segmental spinal anesthesia. Yeah. Uh, the you. audit which uh, the audit which I presented uh, it's uh, very recent from month of Feb till uh, July six month data we collected, and uh, we were able to give blocks in forty seven percent of the cases where it was actually indicated. Still, we yeah. have fifty two percent more left. Like, yeah. uh, and that uh, uh, I think everybody needs to do some kind of audit to introspect why we are not able to actually give the blocks. I actually have one little problem uh, uh, here, which I, I think is uh, very dominant, uh, especially uh, we talked about social media. Social media seems to actually show as if people who are not doing ultrasound guided blocks are actually inferior to others who are actually doing PNS and uh, landmark guided block. I think that's a very, very wrong trend. Um, and if, if people are saying that ultrasound is the only safest way of doing blocks, I think they're very wrong because there's no data actually showing 
that people who do landmark guided blocks and PNS blocks have higher incidence of nerve injuries. Unless that, data, unless, unless that data is actually available, we cannot definitively actually say that no uh, you know, complications occur with ultrasound. And unless we have that each and every block is, uh, you know, uh, registered, every each and every block, every block is followed. So one of the problems with regional anesthesia is, is also follow up for patients. And e ERAS is actually one of the causes of so the same day surgeries. So what are you actually looking at is a very, uh, you know, near uh, kind of follow up till the patient is discharged. What happens to the patient after discharge? we probably are not actually aware in a lot of cases. Thank uh, you. If we, uh, if we actually look at the safety as uh, highlighted by Dr. Shiv, uh, the practice advisory regarding neurological complications still states that uh, USG uh, cannot, still cannot, we cannot say with confidence that it will actually reduce the neurological injury vis-a-vis -vis PNS. So till date, we do not have definite data to support the use of USG in preventing neurological injury vis-a-vis -vis PNS. Definitely, USG will reduce the vascular puncture, the risk of blast, but the statistically speaking, still it cannot reduce the risk of neurological injury. So I think uh, what Dr. Sheva said, we need to collect more data and the follow-up period should not be limited to first 24 hours. It has to be more prolonged, especially for ambulatory settings. So then we'll get a real picture as to what is actually happening. How are we with time, uh, Anil? So uh, we're not able to hear you, so. So we have another 10 minutes uh, to 12. Yeah. I'll just bring in two comments here, uh, if you don't mind. So one thing is about safety. I think ultrasonography by itself will not reduce uh, the risk of complications. I think in the hands of someone who's a good ultrasonographer will reduce the risk of complication. Because, you know, if we see a lot of people doing, you know, vascular access uh, in the ICU, they use ultrasound and they don't follow the tip of the needle. Yes, so it really does not increase the safety of doing the block or the vascular access. So. You know, you can go past the back end. You're not knowing that you're crossing the back end of the vessel and you could be hitting the pleura and you will not know. So what I just probably like to qualify is that in the hands of somebody who knows what he's doing and has gained sufficient proficiency in the use of ultrasound, ultrasound is likely to reduce uh, complications. So that, that's, sure. that's one thing. And the second thing that I'd just like to say is we see, I still have surgeons complaining to me saying anesthetists are taking uh, longer to give anesthesia. I had somebody complain to me day before yesterday that the anesthetists are taking too long. And if it does improve the quality of the post-operative period for the patient, then I think uh, that that is time well spent. We don't have to use OR time. We can find a place where we can do the box and then move the patient to the OR. And I think that's, that's very important. My counter answer to most of these things today is surgeons are also taking more time and they forget to, you know, uh, you know, an appendix that could be done open is done laparoscopically instead of 15 minutes, it takes two hours. So they, they just forget that. So uh, I, I think we focus on what is best for the patient and not what the surgeon wants. And we do have reluctance from surgeons, but in terms of, uh, I think the acceptability of regional anesthesia is increasing among the surgeons when they see how their patients are post-operatively. Dr. Somnath, you have made a very pertinent point regarding safety. See, uh, I agree with you. Uh, even uh, even anesthetists, not intensivist, I would say, in the beginning of their career, they are they are very excited to use ultrasound for vascular access. Let's take that example. And they are not able to see the needle, but accidentally they puncture and they get a backflow and they are happy that they have done ultrasound. And so this could be one of the reasons that we are not able to demonstrate safety. That doesn't mean ultrasound uh, is not helping us in delivering safe regional or vascular access. But this could be one of the reasons that what my feeling is uh, regarding the safety aspect. Yes, Shiv, sorry, go ahead. Um the uh, 
proficiency is is a big issue and um, what i actually look at the trainees what they complain to me is that uh, they would be in list where that somebody does ultrasound and then there could be weeks and weeks where they don't get the opportunity to practice ultrasound and uh, that's how uh, they are and there are actually studies which actually have shown that you need to be doing 90 blocks of on a, in a, that's a particular block 90 blocks a year uh, to maintain that proficiency and uh, absolutely hand-eye coordination what i have actually observed in the youngsters they have wonderful hand-eye coordination uh, compared to some of us uh, uh, because of their using mobile phone and uh, you know being yeah. uh, gaming. play gaming gaming and <laughs> things like that. they have they have wonderful hand-eye coordination all they need is just you know guiding them regularly um and there, there are actually chances where they get overconfident as well. That this, I had a very recent experience with uh, one of the trainees very recently, and uh, that really upset me, <laughs> and probably upset the trainee as well. I think uh, people need to actually see that it takes years and years of reaching the level uh, of uh, someone who is considered as an expert. Then again, uh, one thing, like I said, social media is a wonderful thing. Uh, but just, you know, uh, focusing on a saying that ultrasound, ultrasound is the only way of giving nerve blocks, uh, that doesn't serve the purpose for uh, promoting uh, use of regional anesthesia. I think uh, the people who are leaders in uh, regional anesthesia, they need to actually also uh, state that, no, ultrasound is just one of the methods of uh, giving regional anesthesia and other methods are equally safe. But unfortunately, some of these young leaders actually have had no exposure to PNS. I can tell you that confidently uh, when actually I at least uh, converse with them. These people have never probably had a, a touch uh, of using, using the PNS, which is a wonderful uh, instrument. So yes, uh, practice, practice, practice is going to make it better. Uh, and uh, Proficiency is, again, based on numbers, uh, how much you do, and how you keep refining your skills. Uh, shall we move on to the next uh, lecture then, uh, Som? There isn't any... Um... Yes. Shiv, there is just a comment of, from comment. Dheeraj Isle in the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, Dheeraj uh, Isle has just commented, I use a combination of ultrasound and PNS, where the yeah. PNS acts like a car parking sensor. It alerts yeah. us around structures which normally we don't focus on. It's uh, I set it at 0.5 milliampers and it does, and it does help. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, it's exactly like good, what you said. Good Shubh. analogy has given. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll just share my screen. I'll just take a second to introduce Sai uh, Janani. Right. Um, welcome, Dr. Sai Janani. Thank you for uh, volunteering to participate in the FARA. Thank uh, you, sir. So Dr. Sai Janani is a consultant anesthetist at Fortis Escorts Hospital in Faridabad. Uh, she has got areas of interest in acute and chronic pain, regional anesthesia, uh, perioperative medicine, obstetric anesthesia, and medical legal studies. Today, she'll be speaking to us on RA beyond the operating room, on arrival blocks, role indications, and contraindications. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Sai Janani. Yeah. Yeah, good morning all. Uh, today I want to speak about regional anesthesia outside the operating room. And I want to stress that on arrival blocks is a small part and we have a lot of part to play which we have probably not even realized as anesthesiologists because most of the time, like we spend 90% of our time in the operation theater. So uh, let's now see what we can do in front of the curtain. So disclaimer, I have no conflict of interest or uh, financial implications. Also, I work in a quite a low volume center for uh, regional anesthesia. And we work with the available portable USD machine, which is with the radiology department. Also, I want to say that in places where we don't have the uh, USD machine, we do even LOR blocks or with the PNS because we firmly believe that all patients should get a block when they need it. 
know introduction uh, this is uh, this is one place where the anesthetist is in front of the curtain and we should grab the zone before we give it up to other specialities also uh, we must stress that our hospital should be a pain free zone that is when we get cooperation from other departments and uh, this is multi dimensional whenever we can use for example whenever we can use regional anesthesia we should use it be it in the cath lab or in the radiology suite or in the uh, emergency department the con of this is we are outside comfortable environments so we should start equipping people outside our uh, comfortable ot zone to work with us firstly to have an informal meet up and next to train them in acls next we train them in last and then we start working there so once they have an anesthetist with them they are very comfortable in handling situations and they also start calling us for uh, other indications like difficult vascular access or when they have a baby to be sedated and other things and that's how our uh, practice in front of the curtain will increase now interdisciplinary coordination there is absolutely no shame in taking help from an uh, interdisciplinary colleague like um, like when we want to do if you want to do a deep block or sometimes in pain practice like uh, celiac plexus or something to have a radiologist with you or to see if a ct guided is needed or any such thing this is just an example and we should have interdisciplinary coordination we should coordinate with the orthopedicians whenever we do an on arrival analysis yeah this is very important and though it takes a little bit of time to get them on the same page it is very much possible now training of staff outside the or this is very important we try to make pain teams and get a pain nurse let me tell you this is not very necessary uh, we were kind of refused a pain nurse so what we did was uh, we trained all the sister in charges and all the night nursing supervisors so now we have a group of nurses who are trained in using pca pumps in trained in using uh, people on opioid uh, patients on opioid infusions and trained in um, calling uh, recognizing a pain problem be it on post op day 2 or 3 and calling the anesthesia uh, pain services for uh, the for block or any other wholesome pain management needed also i would like to say that my sisters call me even at 10 pm at night if the patient has pain also the same in the ed if the patient comes with breakthrough pain the sister will herself ask the medical officer to call so this kind of training is better when we start with nurses and we should do it a uh, regular and a checklist and a dedicated trolley wherever we go outside the or be it emergency room be it cath lab be it radiology suite pick up one corner make a trolley and uh, paste the i we usually paste the aura stop before you block or any other uh, thing saying that this is regional anesthesia trolley and we keep uh, interlipid wires so once we know that we have our uh, um, things over there we just take a technician with us and we are comfortable outside the ot as much as we are inside the ot now a few dimensions where we work outside the ot on arrival anesthesia this is not only limited to orthopedic trauma but also to polytrauma other rib fractures breakthrough cancer pain or any other acute or chronic pain syndromes and rebound pain after a diagnostic block and also sometimes patients get blocked for surgery they go home and after a few days they come back with rebound pain this uh, usually people just give tramadol and send them back but um, from the time that acute pain services has intervened even this has been much improved and also some places like uh, some conditions like sickle cell crisis and also metastatic bone pains then uh, the role of fast and e fast in trauma a little bit of extension of regional anesthesia is fast and pet examination this takes a uh, less time to learn once you are uh, already well versed in regional anatomy and in uh, plain and in facial plane blocks we slowly extend to spine zone anatomy and then fast and e fast and pet examination this is extremely helpful in the uh, emergency department then vascular access difficult iv cannulation central venous cannulation and pick lines these also can be done by us now once we start doing all this the anesthetist is then the most sought out doctor in the hospital 
Now, on arrival blocks, why should we do them? It's a game changer in trauma care. There is pain relief as soon as the patient comes to the hospital because the main complaint of the patient after trauma is pain. Then this automatically gives a good uh, confidence in the doctor. There is pain-free examination of the extremity. The radiographs, which are usually taken in very awkward positions in an already broken limb, can be done better. And there is reduced opioid use. Also, we should not underestimate the opioid abuse scenario in at least our area uh, in the country. Because we do have drug addicts, we do have opioid users. They use regional and com uh, common names. So that is why uh, we may not even understand what uh, has happened. And after anesthesia, we see withdrawal symptoms sometimes. So we should reduce opioid use. Also, we should uh, realize that... Um, which is, uh, sorry, and with, we should reduce opioid use, which is enabled by using on arrival blocks. Also, we should realize that the age group of uh, patients which come with uh, RTAs and trauma, they are young uh, adults. And once they start getting fentanyl infusion, they start having a drug, uh, they are very uh, prone to having a drug seeking behavior. So this also can be reduced by an on arrival block. Now, uh, oligoanalgesia in the emergency department is a well-known and uh, well-recognized problem. This is because, firstly, we are, uh, the staff and the ED doctors are hesitant to give opioids. Then a uh, patient comes with hemodynamic instability or respiratory compromise. Also, once we give opioids, then uh, it is difficult to have a good neurological assessment of GCS and to rule out head trauma. And opioid-induced uh, delirium in elderly is common. So all these things, uh, all these problems can be averted by using um, regional anesthesia in the emergency department. The progression to chronic post-trauma pain is 77%. And the most important factor in this was the intensity of pain at the time of acute trauma. Now, where does on arrival block stand in the ATLS protocol? Usually a primary survey is done and once the vitals are stabilized, an on-arrival block is given followed by the secondary survey. In uh, our setup and in many setups, we cannot give on-arrival block before radiology or before talking to the orthopedician for obvious reasons. So it is okay to give it even after secondary survey, but somewhere in the algorithm, we must fit in so that the patient is benefited. Requirements, there has to be um, resuscitative and airway equipment wherever we do blocks, including the 20% uh, intralipid. Then anesthesiologists should be in-house 24-7. If they're not in-house, at least they should come as early as possible. Coordination with orthopedicians is very important. And because um, in sometimes there are nerve entrapment injuries and there are sometimes impending compartment syndromes, these have to be recognized. And uh, the, traf, the staff on site should be trained, especially in assisting us and in giving CPR. And first of all, there is primum non nausea, which is our dictum. And wherever we feel that the block is going to do more harm to the patient, we should not do it. Who can perform a block? Anyone with needle, drug, and syringe. This is our dictum, and we should always follow it, that regional anesthesia should be offered to every patient where it's indicated. The person who is doing the block should be trained in resuscitation, can recognize and manage local anesthetic toxicity, USG guided if you have access, otherwise a PNS guided or a landmark guided block can also. Now, uh, this is from UK, the algorithm for uh, treatment of undifferentiated acute pain in emergency department. They also have started giving blocks in the emergency department. However, I'd like to say and uh, proudly that uh, blocks on arrival had started in India in a peripheral uh, city of Coimbatore in the Ganga hospital. And this is a very proud moment for us and we should take it forward and we should do it in every hospital in India. Now, common blocks in ED, these are extremely uh, common blocks which the anesthetist we do in the, as anesthetist we do in the operation room and we should do it in the ED and then um, any peripheral places when needed. Now, in, place, in patients with multiple rib fractures, we can do a paravertebral catheter. Or if you cannot do that, we can do an erector spiny plane catheter, which also works as well. 
or if there is a difficulty in finding the erector spiny plane, we can also go for rhomboid intercostal. And also, if there are, is the anterior fracture of the vertebrae of the ribs, we can also go for external oblique intercostal, which is a very beautiful block and very easy to perform. Next is in the shoulder and upper arms. Uh, shoulder pang is a very good block, which is uh, which needs a lesser skill. And um, instead of going for a selective upper trunk and or interscaling catheter, a subclavian perivascular catheter can also be inserted. Also, the costoclavicular block is a very good intra infraclavicular block in which the uh, phrenic nerve palsy is zero. As we know that in all above clavicle blocks, the phrenic nerve, uh, the phrenic nerve palsy is non-zero. Then uh, for forearm and hand, we can go for axillary brachial plexus or costoclavicular or infoclavicular blocks, or we can do, uh, just do the small blocks with hardly two ml LA in for each of the nerves at the elbow or the wrist. And if only one digit is also broken, especially in children, we can give small digital blocks and uh, it's very easy to convince the child. Also, even for small uh, CLWs which need to be sutured, please we should sensitize them to call us so that we can do these very small blocks with very little concentrations of local anesthetics and it gives a lot of satisfaction to see smiling children getting their wounds sutured. Also scalp blocks in this way. Uh, CLWs in the scalp, we can do a local anesthetic infiltration may suffice, but if it is big or if there are multiple ones, scalp blocks are uh, very, very uh, comfortable to perform and also the patient is very happy, especially children. Then coming to hip fractures, fascia, iliac compartment block, peng block, four and one and uh, femoral block can also be given. The fascia iliaca compartment, supraanguinal or infraanguinal approach, depending on the fracture site and how, how you're comfortable. And the peng block as well. For the peng block, uh, I'd like to stress that there could be um, ureteric injury if you go a little bit medially. Also, if there is abdominal trauma, especially in pelvic trauma, then we can go for a fascia iliaca compartment block if you are not very comfortable with the peng block. We always have a block to save us. So, once we see all the, once we learn all the blocks and the regional anatomy associated with them, we can use any one which we are comfortable with. Then below knee, we can go for the popliteal sciatic block by conventional or the caps approach, which is very convenient where we don't have to turn the leg or the patient. Then the anterior approach to sciatic, which is a little difficult, or the high pack block where you can give a high adductor canal block and the drug very nicely seeps to the popliteal fossa and uh, the sciatic nervous also block. This is a very good block for knee and below knee um, fractures and easy to perform as well. And the foot is um, popliteal sciatic ankle block or a selective nerve blocks if a single digit is um, involved or even digital blocks or Mayo's block. This uh, digital block or a Mayo's block doesn't need ultrasound, even ankle block. So even if you do not have the ultrasound machine or it's used elsewhere, we can do it uh, blindly. For the Mayo's block, we just feel the first MTP joint and we put the uh, needle in the midline and we give a V-shaped uh, block following the joint line on both the sides, both uh, ventrally and on the plant, or both dorsally and on the plantar surface. And it's a very good block, especially for uh, people who stub, uh, children especially who uh, stub their toes and have an uh, evolution of the nail and other things. Now, drugs used, um, we can use like Logain, Bupivacaine, Ropivacaine, whatever is available in that area of the hospital. And or we can use, um, and we can use adjuvants, dexamethasone. It is seen that perineurally, uh, dexamethasone when give, given perineurally or IV, uh, perineural dexamethasone is non-superior uh, to IV dexamethasone, especially in the dose of 8 mg. And however, in 4 milligrams, perineural has seen to have a better benefit than intravenous dexamethasone. If you don't have it at the time of the block, we can give it uh, intravenously immediately after. And uh, clonidine also has been used. Uh, for this purpose in the emergency department. Then special mention, digital replantation, not only pain relief, but we can help the patient in other ways as well. So when we block 
the limb for a, which is needed which needs a digital reimplantation there is reduced afferent input now this reduces the stress response and there is less catecholamine surge this causes better vasodilation and better uptake of the digit when reimplanted also trauma is a chronic stress condition which causes hypercoagulability and uh, once there is uh, vasodilation there is uh, less uh, there is no hypercoagulability, especially due to pain relief and due to vasodilation. And there is there are lesser thrombotic events. Also, there is optimal blood supply to the implanted digit. It avoids vasus, pasum, and thrombosis and helps the surgeon a lot. Now, once we start doing it for these cases, the surgeon will also allow you to do it for other cases. This is a very important uh, point. Then burns. Uh, burns causes a chronic um, hyper uh, causes hyperalgesia there are undestroyed nociceptors which cause a lot of pain and especially when we use a split skin graft in the donor site also has pain there are episodic acute events on a background chronic pain all these things cross a chronic stress response there is catecholamine surge there's hypercoagulability and there's thrombosis graft failure and persistent both burns pains all these things can be reduced by a block or using a catheter as sir had mentioned then coming to special population children um an experienced motivated and passionate anesthetist should always go quickly whenever a child needs a block and um, it should be done at least under minimal sedation so that uh, we don't put the child into anxiety and we are able to perform the block comfortably then an elderly dose calculation is important and uh, we should use only 50 to 75 percent of the total uh, dose of local anesthetics. Uh, we can, uh, adjuvants are very helpful in this scenario. And we should always consider the comorbidities and the medications that they are using. Now, uh, coming to the medications that people are using, most of them, uh, many pa patients these days are on anticoagulants like Ecosprin or. Uh, newer uh, oral anticoagulants or low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin and or the P2Y12 inhibitors like clopidogrel, ticlopridin or uh, ticoglerol, canglerol, ticoglerol. Also, people are on chronic NSAIDs, especially if they have uh, inflammatory arthritis and other conditions and also SSRIs. Some of them also take uh, they see the Y medications, which uh, also can be anticoagulants like garlic or uh, curcumin and others. Now, uh, NSAIDs especially uh, also cause anticoagulation. We should be aware of this fact and also do SSRIs. Then when should I not do a block patient refusal? If a patient is on anticoagulants where the risk is much more than the benefit, if there is a bleeding diathesis, or uh, local site infection, unavailability of resuscitative equipment or intralipid is a very important uh, point. If we do not have intralipid or a resuscitation cart, we better not perform the block and defer it till we get some access to it. Then as peripheral nerve injury, if we suspect it, in some centers you can document and go ahead, whereas in some centers we don't. So coordination with the surgeon is very important. For this, we should also learn about the nerve injuries, look for a claw hand or look for any hyperesthesia or uh, loss of sensation and loss of motor function. And impending compartment syndrome, this is a bit controversial. Uh, usually our uh, orthopedicians reviews block in such cases. However, uh, literature has shown that in presence of regional anesthesia, when a patient has pain despite regional anesthesia, that would be a very good indicator of compartment syndrome. Then uh, the most common fact fractures that give rise to a compartment syndrome are proximal or mid one third debial diaphysis fractures, forearm fractures. And whenever pain is out of proportion to injury, we must uh, suspect compartment syndrome. The pa patient may have paresthesia due to ischemia of the nerves. And uh, RA, as I said, is controversial. And periodic assessment after giving a block is very important because even after a block, a patient can have compartment syndrome and fractures where we did not even expect them. So always, whenever uh, 
we do a pain management technique, we should always periodically reassess the patient. That is the most important step. Now, after the block, what should we do? Uh, we must monitor for the block effect, side effect, and complications. Train the on-site team, resuscitate on time, and inform as needed if there is a complication. Then reassess the patient every four hourly. Not only the patient needs not only regional anesthesia, but multimodal analgesia. So around the clock analgesia and filling the drug chart should be done by us. And we should take it on us to reassess and see if the other pain components, for example, in polydrama with blunt trauma injury, if a patient has other pain like visceral pain and also his psychological assessment and calming down and reassurance should also be done. And we should also treat breakthrough pain after the block for this follow-up of three days or till the patient is in the hospital is very much essential. What if I can't block? Then other things can always be done. We should learn to give analgesics around the clock. When an audit was done by us around for uh, up to six months to see the current pain man management situation before we started acute pain services, the most important deficiency was that all the analgesics were given in the drug chart at the same time, 6, 2, and 8 p.m., So, which was uh, very convenient for the sisters as per the shift, but it, it was not working for the patient. So a little tweak and uh, going for all round the clock analgesia made a big difference in all the patients. Then as patient-controlled analgesia, this is a very wonderful technique which the nurses learn very uh, immediately and train the patient so well. And the uh, patient is very comfortable. And sometimes if the if a block fails or there's inadequate effect, patient can be offered PCA, which is uh, an extremely useful option. Then lidocaine ketamine infusion, the desensitizing infusion is extremely good for patients with uh, amputated extremities. Once they started and there is uh, desensitization done, the phantom limb in incidence in these patients reduces a lot. And uh, also, and the chronic persistent pain also reduces a lot. And um, patients with CRPS or patients with acute diabetic peripheral neuropathy who come crying to the casualty, the, you can train the staff to start a lidocaine ketamine infusion before you come in, assist the patient and uh, decide for interventions. Also, patients who cannot afford interventions or uh, such things, they can also be given this infusion. It works out way cheaper. We have uh, calculated it to be one sixth the cost. Then, dexmedetomidine ketamine infusion. This also, since we have both the drugs uh, available in India, it is a wonderful combination. And a dexket infusion helps, uh, especially for mild sedation in pediatrics or in geriatric patients who are uh, slightly. Um, retarded or have some kind of cognitive dysfunction. Also, the psychological um, part of psychological part of pain after a polytrauma should be taken care of. And um, in this dexket infusion, it calms down the patient. And uh, as we know that pre op or anxiety or anxiety at presentation is a very important uh, factor, independent factor for chronic post-op pain development. Dexket infusion takes care of this as well. Thank you. If there are any questions. Also, my uh, videos were not working, so I had to take them out. Sorry for that. That was fine. Sign. That's okay. You can stop sharing and then we can take the questions. I think there are a few comments okay. and uh, questions. Sure. So I think we got uh, another 10 minutes or so. Um, Direct okay. questions to Sai. Yes. Uh, hi, sir. Dr. Anil here. Yes. Can I add one point uh, to yes, this? Uh, yes. uh, there is a lot of uh, use of tremadol, and I feel tremadol does one thing and one thing for sure that causes a lot of vomiting rather than <laughs> causing uh, yes. pain relief. Yes. So, one I would, thing uh, is, uh, yeah. one thing is tremadol and uh, causes vomiting. Second thing is tremadol causes addiction. Uh, we have we see a lot of uh, youngsters who are referred to us for a lot of pain, pain, pain. And then we come to know that he goes to every hospital. For, first, he's on ultraset and then he goes to a hospital with uh, pain again, maybe renal stone. And then he's given tramadol in the casualty. He finds out that this is better than the ultraset. And then they go on after every few days to the hospitals. This is common. This is not 
not as uncommon as we think because once you start working with the casualty people they start recognizing faces of people who are uh, admitted in uh, various points of time so uh, it is uh, not only vomiting also this and if we have if we genuinely need tramadol uh, giving uh, dexamethasone perinom or uh, droperidol along haloperidol or droperidol along with this or even a prepotent or first prepotent these are good solutions with tramadol even themisevo themiset um dolonocetra palonocetra i think uh, the reason push. for um, uh, nausea and vomiting in tramadol is the way it is actually administered uh, people give it neat it needs yeah. to be diluted given slowly and then uh, the dose they're using too big a dose. Yes, sir. Yes, so like sir. I've described, if you actually just put 50 milligrams of tramadol in uh, a gram of paracetamol, run it over 20 minutes, you don't see any nausea and vomiting. Our, our incidence of nausea and vomiting is all zero, zero percent. Yes, uh, the ship mix when we use PCM with tramadol, yeah. it works. You don't see also, nausea and vomiting. Also, a small fact is that 30 mg tramadol is equal to 10 mg oral morphine. So we should know how much we are giving, actually. Exactly. There's, I think, 100 milligrams is quite a big dose for dose. IV, actually. Yeah. Uh, and and if you have to give it, why not titrate rather than actually use it uh, the whole whole drug? Yes. Uh, why yeah, not coming the coming to your your lecture itself about honorable blocks, it's not true that India is the uh, thing. Yes, India. Some centers are doing it. Uh, if you actually if you look at the literature, the first block to be used uh, for on arrival was actually facial iliac block for hip fractures. And there is huge amount of literature about that uh, from UK. And uh, that also brings to an interesting fact about uh, use of uh, local anesthetic blocks in uh, the, uh, the ER or emergency room as and, and theaters. So we've had patients who actually had blocks, but it was not properly documented. Okay. And because it was not properly documented and patient came to theater within the you know, half-life of the local anesthetic uh, and people ended up actually giving, you know, okay. local anesthetic over their uh, advisable dose. Uh, luckily, uh, I think most of the times, even though the dose may exceed, uh, they don't usually cause problems, but they need to be monitored. So that need to be kept in mind that yes. when patient comes to the theater, especially um, straight or soon after they have received the blocks in the uh, a &E or the ER, uh, we need to actually have clear documentation you know, that the this time. is the amount of local anesthetic they have received. Um, there were actually a few questions. Um, uh, one of the questions were, um, do you just give these blocks without actually it's any reading. investigation? And, uh, I can tell you about the facial iliac blocks. Uh, one of the things which uh, the uh, emergency rooms and the orthopedic teams were reluctant for us to give the blocks is, is that unless the patient actually had an X-ray and there was a proven fracture, they wouldn't like. The reason being that if you actually give a block and they develop uh, muscle, obviously weakness, and they they walk and fall, then it becomes a medical legal issue and, and blame comes on to you. We give after radiology for this. Exactly. So it is usually that once that is confirmed, and some bloods usually when the patient arrives, they do have their bloods uh, done. And uh, uh, maybe I think uh, for superficial blocks, not a problem. For any deeper blocks, they might want yes. to know what the coagulation yes. status yes. of the patient is. And history. history, of course, will tell you most which you have very well covered that. Uh, I think there's one question from uh, Jamie and she wants to know is uh, I think about interscaling or supraclavical blocks if you're performing them on arrival I think you did say that you do okay we do, do uh, we've done uh, mostly we've changed to shoulder pain I have given a selective upper tongue block in a person but then I realized that uh, shoulder pain keeps you uh, more um, comfortable after you leave the place because uh, later on, if there is some kind of clinic palsy, the staff whom you're leaving behind should be able to recognize it and uh, handle it. Yeah, I think that that is, again, another thing is, is after a block in the emergency department for how much time 
is it recommended to stay by the patient for monitoring? So firstly, uh, we have an acute pain team. Our ours is interdisciplinary and anesthetist and a radiologist, a pain physician from a radiology background. We cover it. And uh, the thing is, we stay back. I, I stay back for two hours uh, after giving a block either in the ward or in the emergency. Though we have uh, trained the emergency team and we also teach the emergency medicine res residents, mm -hmm. but still we stay back because finally the responsibility is ours. Yeah, that that be, makes it uh, quite labor intensive, isn't it? Yes, it is because very. Because I think yeah, the, the cost uh, very satisfying. So it, it is satisfying, but again, if there are quite at a night, few cases, especially at night, most of the trauma calls are at night, and yes. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think one of the things where I think uh, some of the developing world has uh, you know stayed back uh, from oh, doing that constantly. because this becomes labor intensive. I like to think that this is a teething problem because we are just starting out outside the OT. Once we uh, give them results, they may start recruiting anesthetists or assistant anesthetists or something in the ED who can also take care of this. So remaining yeah. positive. Yeah. For facial iliac blocks, uh, what uh, was at least we had, we did was that we did train the uh, emergency department and a lot of other centers did that. Though, again, uh, it wasn't practiced as much as we would have loved them to do that. Uh, uh, the youngsters were like a lot more pro pro that. Uh, the other was that there was there are specialist nurses who were also trained uh, to actually do do those blocks and follow them up as well. So I think, um, you know, availability of the medical staffing to doing them block and, and monitoring, I think, will still remain a would be an issue. <laughs> we also faced a special problem recently where we uh, now for now temporarily stopped DD blocks for a few weeks because uh, our patient got good pain relief and by the time he could uh, he went away Lama to a cheaper place and uh, to get it fixed that is one thing which uh, did not yeah. go well with the surgeons these are uh, little practical things we do face uh, absolutely the patient mind that is that is why I said that uh, especially with lower limb blocks and even for that matter upper limb blocks if you actually give pain relief the patient might actually think that there is nothing wrong with them they don't have a fracture uh, and insensate limbs can lead to falls and to injuries as well so that is a known risk which so i think i would like to discuss we, explain, uh, we like, do explain and show the x-ray that you have a fracture that is why we're doing yeah, this with, yeah. with the pain relief and thanks yeah. and that is actually a very very important part that you actually do the block after it has been confirmed otherwise they might just you know walk away yeah you're right i think uh, the other thing you have already explained in i think that's in context with the uh, indian thing that where patient can actually go to another center or chief or a center where they might uh, perform so, the so the, for uh, there's a uh, three four four difference in bills from a corporate hospital and a smaller peripheral place so it really matters to some end. yeah uh, that's true that's true i think uh, thank you uh, sai um, thank you sir uh, som anil uh, th thank you sai uh, amazing presentation your passion for work outside the ot came up came out very aptly during your Thank you so much, sir. Thank uh, you. Sir. Just a quick question to you, sir. You know, you yes. did mention about lidocaine ketamine infusion as yes, well sir. as dex uh, ketamine infusion. You know, for the sake of the trainees, can you elaborate so that okay. they, they get an idea of what you're talking about? Yes, sir. Uh, for uh, xylocaine ketamine infusion, uh, this is a desensitizing infusion and it uh, works to prevent uh, central desensitization to pain. And uh, we have borrowed this concept from chronic pain and cancer pain and sympathetically mediated pains. So what we do is uh, in, we give xylocaine at uh, 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg plus uh, ketamine at 0.1 to 0.3 milligram per kg. And we put it in 100 ml saline or in an infusion pump depending on what you have at that place. And we run it for over 40, for over to uh, over 45 minutes this infusion is given over 45 minutes now this works very well in polytrauma patients the acute crying patient stops crying even because you cannot in a polytrauma patient who has pain everywhere you cannot block every place 
you can block the limbs but there'll be abdominal trauma there'll be um, there'll be a sense of psychological distress what we call a total pain psychological social mental and um, physical pain so this thing reduces by uh, quite a lot of score points and secondly uh, when a patient or like a child this is in the or in the er sorry now going to the radiology suite we again use it especially in patients who uh, need some who have are claustrophobic before an mri you can run this xylocaine ketamine infusion over 45 minutes and take them up for mri the patient is calm and uh, it gets done easily and uh, avoids the need for ga or any other uh, potent sedatives then uh, dexcat infusion is the same as what we run for ot for uh, in ot for conscious sedation or uh, dexmed we give without the bolus dose and we kind of uh, give like in a 100 ml uh, saline we give 10 mg ketamine uh, dexmed and 10 mg ketamine or 20 20 and such and we titrate it that uh, that's the trick thank you very much uh, dr sai uh, thanks sir fantastic presentation i'm sure it's very informative for all the trainees and for thank some you. of us here as well Thank you so much, uh, sir. Uh, I'll uh, we'll move on to the next lecture. I'll just briefly introduce uh, Dr. Divesh again. Uh, for those of you who joined us late, uh, as Dr. Shiv said, Dr. Divesh is the king from Haryana. Uh, he's the you know he's the director and head of department of OT services at Asian Hospital in Faridabad, past president of the Haryana ISA branch from 16 to 2017. He's an ABH assessor. He's a green OT assessor. His areas of interest include quality and safety in anesthesia, ultrasound guided regional anesthesia, fluid management strategies, intraoperative lung ventilation strategies. Today mm -hmm. uh, and now, he'll be talking to us on ideal blocks for the shoulder, forearms, and hand surgery. Over to you, Dr. Divesh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, are my slides visible? Yes, Dr. Dilish. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for the kind introduction once again. I bring uh, greetings from Asian Hospital, uh, the place I've been working for past twelve years in various capacities. So my lecture outline is three part. Uh, in part one, I like to cover the ideal block for shoulder surgery. That is what the topic has been allocated. then the ideal block for forearm surgery and in the last ideal block for hand surgery so my dear friends the key to understand any regional anesthesia technique for particular kind of surgery is a good knowledge of anatomy that is what i am going to talk about in great detail and then subsequently decide on the ra strategy so coming on to the shoulder and we need to understand the cutaneous inter uh, innovation then the innovation to the muscles and innovations to the bone and the joints and the capsule right if you actually closely look at this anterior portion of the shoulder uh, you will realize it's supplied by the supraclavicular nerves of the cervical plexus once we come to the posterior portion again supraclavicular we do have contribution from axillary and anteriorly it's all axillary but we have to realize that apart from nerves from brachial plexus we do have a nerve that is known as supraclavicular nerve of the cervical plexus which needs to be taken care of if we are thinking of providing cutaneous analgesia for shoulder surgeries coming on to the myotomes a majority of them if you look at them closely are the branches of brachial plexus and particularly important in context of arthroscopic shoulder surgery is the rotator cuff muscles supplied by the suprascapular subscapular and the axillary nerves we do have certain contribution to trapezius from the cervical nerves otherwise if you actually closely realize they are branches of brachial plexus like the pectoral nerves the axillary nerve through the deltoid muscle and the dorsal scapular and the levator scapular to rhomboid muscles the most important part which we need to understand is the innervation of the bony shoulder joint and this is a very recent article published in RAPM 2019 and if we actually look at it they divided the shoulder joint into four quadrants if you look at the posterior quadrant be it superior or inferior superior portion is supplied by the suprascapular nerve and the inferior portion is supplied by the axillary nerve 
the anterior superior quadrant is applied by the uh, subscapular nerve and to some extent in very minor proportion in bilateral pectoral nerve and the anterior inferior quadrant by axillary nerve. If we closely analyze, around 75% of the shoulder joint is supplied by suprascapular and axillary. And that is why the role of shoulder block became very important, which we'll be discussing in subsequent slides. So let's also have a look at the proximal humerus. How is it supplies? On the anterior portion, we have the axillary nerve. On the posterior portion, we have the contribution from suprascapular nerve. Again, these two nerves play a major chunk in defining the role of analgesia or anesthesia for shoulder joint. So another article published very recently in Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery in 2020, where they tried to analyze the sensory innovation of the human shoulder joint, and they defined it as three bridges to break. Again, they said what I had already cited, but they said suprascapular, axillary, and the lateral pectoral nerve are the three most important nerves which you should think of taking care of once you are planning any analgesia strategy for shoulder joint. And they also defined the density of the nociceptors, which are highestly located in subacromial bursa. So we do not forget about bursas and ligaments, which are also a part of shoulder joint, and majority of them are almost supplied by the same set of nerves. So what are the common surgeries which we encounter when we are discussing about shoulder? It's the arthroscopy surgery, uh, particularly the rotator cuff repairs, and then we can do them with the help of open surgery. And definitely there are fractures which might involve proximal humerus, middle or distal. So what are our regional anesthesia targets? I have already stated there are four important nerves. The suprascapular nerve, which is a branch of superior trunk. The axillary nerve, which is a branch of posterior cord. The subscapular nerve, which is a branch of posterior cord. And the lateral pectoral nerve, my dear friends, which is a branch of lateral, uh, lateral cord. If you actually closely look at them, majority of them receive nerve filaments from C5, C6 territory, except for lateral pectoral, which has got uh, filaments from C7. So this will help us in planning the analgesia or anesthesia for shoulder surgery. So what are the RA options which are available to us? The intrascalene brachial plexus, which is the so-called gold standard. We have supraclavicular, costoclavicular, infraclavicular, and then we have other blocks like superior trunk block, shoulder block, the SOS, which is nothing but the sub omohyde suprascapular block or the anterior approach to the suprascapular nerve. And then we have a pen block defined for shoulder also and definitely the universal block ESP. So are there certain guidelines which help us to guide which regional anesthesia to choose, particularly for rotator cuff repair? We have guidelines from Prospect where they recommend intrascalene brachial plexus block as the first choice and suprascapular nerve with or without axillary as the second choice if you are bothered about phrenic nerve. And we have to remember whether it be shoulder, forearm or hand surgery, regional anesthesia is one of the important component of multimodal analgesia. And we should not forget other uh, important components like NSH and the paracetamol and IV dexamethasone if it's not contraindicated. So as I said, my dear friends, the gold standard is the intrascalene brachial plexus blocks. And initially we were using it as a landmark guided technique, then uh, nerve stimulator, and now we have ultrasound guided technique. So in ultrasound, if we actually look at it, the minimum volume which is effective for 0.75% ropey vacane in literature has been reported to 5 ml. Gone are those days where we used to give 20 ml, now we have dropped anywhere between 6 to 10 ml. And the periplexus technique is the ideal one. That is the extrafacial injection. Because in this place, if you go intrafacial as a big nerve, you might injure the nerve because they are simply the nerve roots with very minimal connective tissue. And you as a big nerve can uh, actually enter and injure the nerve. So the gold standard for a shoulder surgery is intrascalene scaling brachial plexus block. But my dear friends, we have to remember that intrascalene brachial plexus block in traditional days when we used to do, use high volumes was, was almost always associated with 100% phrenic nerve palsy. So let's understand uh, the course of the phrenic nerve. At level of C5, as you can see, it lies very closely. 
So it has good number of chance that a drug, if you particularly use high volumes, can diffuse directly to the nerve. As we descend down the nerve uh, neck by one centimeter, the nerve moves three millimeters away. So in the supraclavicular fossa, although it is at a considerable distance away from where drug deposition takes, but because of the volume, drug does diffuse in some percent of the patients. So this is what we have to remember. So what is the consequence if we get a phrenic nerve palsy? It leads to reduction in the pulmonary function test by a value of around 20 to 25%. Whereas a young individual or a normal individual can easily tolerate but an individual who's already dependent on CPAP, OSA, or has got a bad chest may face difficulty in breathing. So this fact we have to remember that this is a side effect of the interscaling vehicle plexus block, which we have to deal with. So do we have other alternatives in case we want to avoid supraclavicular, uh, in, in case we want to avoid phrenic nerve palsy? Definitely. We now understand very uh, in a very good way, the regional anesthesia targets these four nerves. Can we block them with supraclavicular baker plexus? The answer is big yes, because we are performing this block at the level of trunk and the divisions, and it would certainly take care of all the targets which are necessary for shoulder. And it has got a very minimal chance in comparison as per this paper to interscaling. So in this paper, it was set it as 9%. So you are much more safer in high-risk patients once you do this block. And there are systematic review and meta analysis to support the use of supraclavicular vehicle plexus uh, block for post operative pain, taking care of post operative pain after shoulder surgery. What about infraclavicular block? Can we use it? The answer is yes, but it has to be combined with suprascapular nerve block. Let's analyze how it will be effective. We are performing infraclavicular blocks at the level of cord. So all these lateral pectoral, axillary, and subscapular nerve would be taken care of. What would be left would be the suprascapular. For that, you can do a posterior suprascapular nerve block in suprascapular fossa, or we can do an anterior approach to suprascapular nerve, which Emata in one of his articles in Canadian Journal in 2018 called as an isoblock, mean, thereby meaning infraclavicular plus a sub block. And the incidence uh, for this block for phrenic nerve dropped almost to 5.6%. So this is a good strategy in case you want to have phrenic nerve saved. Can we use uh, costoclavicular block for shoulder surgery? Yes, my dear friends, this is a cadaveric study where they actually found that the, all the RA targets for shoulder surgery are stained, be it suprascapular, be it axillary. So why not use it? And in the study, which I'm quoting, uh, very recently published in 2019, they found it was very effective. There was no difference in pain scores when we compare it to the gold standard and the incidence of hemidiaphragmatic paralysis in the study was 0%. But uh, in real practice, it is not actually 0% for costoclavicular vehicle plexus. It's anywhere between 2.5 to 11.4% depending on the type of study. So there are certain examples. Do not get to the feeling that CCB is associated with 0%. So it becomes your block of choice. But do remember, it can definitely be block your choice with the remembrance that it has a small incidence of phrenic nerve palsy. What about shoulder block? Uh, we understood that 75% of the joint is supplied by suprascapular and axillary. And this was described by uh, Dr. Price as early as 2007, my dear friends, and he named it as a shoulder block. And there are so many RCTs as well as systematic reviews which have been published, which show that it is almost as good as interscaling block for shoulder surgery. But you have to remember the fact because in the first three hours in the PACU, the patient will have a slightly higher pain scores as compared to interscaling plexus pre block because at that time, the fluid is actually, which has accumulated in the shoulder is being absorbed into the circulation. So that is a time which can be a little difficult for some of the patients. Otherwise, majority of the times it compares similar to the interscaling plexus pre block. Another approach to the suprascapular is the anterior approach. Classically, our chronic pain physicians were using a posterior approach, but posterior will definitely not provide as good as analgesia as the anterior approach. And this has been described very well in the literature that uh, after its formation on the suprascapular nerve, there is a SPA arrangement described in Journal of Neurosurgical uh, Anesthesia in 2016 by Hannah and colleagues. They called it the SPA arrangement from lateral to medial, uh, suprascapular nerve, posterior division, and anterior division of upper trunk are arranged. 
if we actually deposit the local anesthetic, then we are going to get almost equivalent to a superior trunk block because local anesthetic will also diffuse to posterior division and anterior division. So that is the rationale behind the subamohyte suprascapillum block. And it has been proven in RCTs and published in Anesthesiology 2020, where the author stated that the suprascapular block anterior approach consistently blocks the superior trunk and it qualifies as an effective interscalene block alternative with a reduced incidence of phrenic nerve pulse. And uh, what is the volume which spares the phrenic nerve? It's uh, in cadaveric study is the minimum volume is around 4.2 mL, which actually spares the phrenic nerve. So another block, which is just an extension of the SOS block is the actual place, the superior trunk formation where it takes place, you deposit the trunk. And this would certainly take care. As I started, uh, cited in initial uh, one of my slides, I stated that if you actually closely look at these root values, they are all from C5-6. So the nerve filaments will uh, take the uh, nociceptive and proprioceptive sen uh, sensation to the C5, C6 roots where actually superior trunk formation takes place. And if we deposit the local anesthetic here, it's going to be an effective block. And is there a literature supporting to that? Certainly, my dear friends, we have lot many RCTs and it has been stated to provide non-inferior analgesia when we compare it with the gold standard. Another block which I would like to draw your attention is the peripheral block, which is the subscapularis block. And if you actually look at it, all the nerves, once they have to reach the joint, they will actually pass through some kind of musculofacial planes. And this plane, if you actually look at on top surface of the suprascapular tendon, actually has the axillary nerve and the subscapular nerve. If you deposit the nerve, uh, local anesthetic here, we are going to get these two nerves and we can do the suprascapular nerve additional and the subomohyte plane. It was stated by Subandha Ganapati as early as 2016 in BJA at the subscapular plane block. And very recently, we have the Peng uh, shoulder block, which uh, if you actually closely look at it and compare with the previous article, which I stated, now the transducer is placed in the sagittal plane and then the previous article, it was placed in the transverse plane. Again, we are almost targeting the same structure. We are targeting the plane above the suprascapillary uh, subscapillary tendon so as to block these two nerves. And there has been a cadaveric study as well as a radiological studies to support the usage of pain shoulder and we have certain case reports also. And how can we forget the ESP, which I call a, as a universal block? It can be given for any location, be it cervical, thoracic, lumbar or sacral. And definitely you can do with the help of a landmark guided technique or ultrasound. And there are a couple of case reports where it has been cited as a phrenic nerve sparing option for shoulder surgery. So can we go a little selective, my dear friends? This is an era of procedure-specific, site-specific, diaphragm-sparing, motor-sparing nerve blocks. Can we do something specific for that? Yes. The answer is we can do a peng shoulder block, which will take care of subscapular and axillary nerve. We can do a SOS, that is anterior approach to suprascapular nerve. And we can do a PEX-1 to block the lateral pectoral nerve. Why can't we do that? We can have certain diathesis comparing this with the uh, interscalene block. So you must be a little confused. I have stated so many blocks, which is the ideal block. So how do you choose an ideal block for shoulder surgery? If you have a normal uh, pulmonary function test and uh, a normal individual, uh, uh, the answer is interscaling. It is the gold standard. You use less volumes, particularly for analgesia. And if you want anesthesia, definitely you will have to come to close to 12 to 15 average. And the concentration in that context would be around 0.75% rupee per cane. And I prefer a periplexis approach. And if by chance you have somebody like obese and who has OSA and you have a bad chest, a CPAP dependent patient, certainly avoid interscaling for the fear of causing phrenic nerve palsy and disturbing the chest mechanics. And you can definitely go for a shoulder block as stated by Dr. Price, or we can go for a pen shoulder block. So that brings me to an end of my part one of the presentation that is regarding shoulder. Now it's the part two of the presentation, which is the, what is the ideal block for forearm surgery? So again, we have to understand anatomy. Anatomy is the key. If you closely look at the forearm for cutaneous supply, this is the anterior portion. This is supplied by lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which is nothing but a branch of muscular cutaneous nerve. Medial is supplied by MACN, and this is the branch of the medial cord. If you look at the posterior surface, 
uh, we have an, a nerve coming, which is uh, the PACN, posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which is the branch of radial nerve. And on the medial and the lateral side, we have again the MACN and the LACN. So it's very simple, the cutaneous supply of the forearm. So what about myotomes and osteotomes? We have to pay attention to the myotomes on the anterior surface. Principally, we have the median nerve taking up the major chunk. And then on the medial side, flexor carpi ulnaris and the ulnar portion of FTP supplied by the ulnar nerve. Whereas if you look at the posterior surface, the major chunk is by the posterior interosseous nerve, which is nothing but a deep branch of the radial nerve. Now coming on to the osteotomes. Anteriorly, if you look at it, the major of, uh, portion of the both of the bones is supplied by the median nerve, top, head, uh, top portion of the radial head by the radial nerve. And posteriorly, the major chunk is supplied by the radial nerve and the topmost portion of the joint is supplied by the ulnar nerve. So uh, as we know, the forearm is sandwiched between two joints, the elbow and the wrist, and we need to understand their innervation also. If we uh, try to look at it, it's principally by four nerves, main four nerves, the median, radial, ulnar, and the musculocutaneous. What is surprising or will appear as a surprise to you, how come a cutaneous nerve is giving innervation to a joint? The posterior capsule on the medial portion is also supplied by the MACN, which is nothing but a branch of medial cord. So what are about the nociceptors and the mechanoreceptors? If you actually look at it, the red is the color for nociceptors. And if you actually see high uh, concentration of nociceptors are situated in the posterior capsule. What about innervation of the joint rest? This is an article very recently published. And there are many articles, but I'm citing this, this as the one of them. On the dorsal surface, uh, we have uh, innervation from the radial nerve, the superficial branch, the posterior uh, interosseous nerve, then we have the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve and again MACN supplies. On the palmar surface, if you look at closely, we have radial nerve superficial branch, the median nerve, the palmar branch, the anterior interosseous nerve, which is a branch of median nerve, the main trunk of the ulnar nerve, the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve, and again the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. So we cannot afford to ignore these two cutaneous nerves in the nutshell if we have to block some kind of bony innervation. So what are the RA targets, my dear friends, for the forearm surgeries? Again, if you look at them closely, they are principally the median ulnar radial nerves and definitely the three cutaneous nerves. And if you look at it, the median cutaneous nerve of the forearm itself is a branch of medial cord, whereas LACN is a branch of musculocutaneous, the terminal portion. The EACN is the branch of radial nerve, which originates almost 15 to 16 centimeters proximal to lateral epicondyle on the posterior aspect of the arm. So can we use uh, proximal brachial plexus blocks for forearm surgery? <clears throat> Let's understand one by one. Interscalene is a no. Why? Because you have to understand <clears throat> interscal <clears throat> interscalene would not block the lower Trunk. And from lower trunk arise the ulnar uh, nerve, no, which also gives uh, supply to the forearm as well as to the uh, uh, elbow joint as well as the wrist joint. So it's not a good option for forearm surgery. Whereas other three, the supraclavicular, infraclavicular, costoclavicular, and axillary brachial block, plexus block, are good options for forearm surgery. Can we plan some kind of distal blocks for forearm surgery? Certainly, yes. As I said, we are in the site specific era of site-specific analgesia where we do not want proximal uh, muscles uh, to be blocked. We have other options. We have options that we can do a mid-humeral block where we can block the median, ulnar, radial, MACN, and in the anticubital fossa, we can do a LACN nerve block. Or we can go for an anticubital fossa block where we can block the median and the radial. Ulnar, we do not uh, prefer to block uh, uh, behind the olecranon notch because uh, it's passing through a tunnel, it can lead to neuritis. Just one centimeter proximal to the tunnel, we can block. And uh, if we want, we can separately do a MACN, LACN, and PACN block. So these are x-rays from my own hospital where we actually uh, did distal blocks and we did them from analgesia. GA was the primary anesthetic. As you can see, this is a left-sided distal radial fracture and for distal radial fractures, they generally prefer a, a volar approach. And so we did a twin. 
a median radial nerve on LACN in anticubital costa. And this is for the right side. <clears throat> And I now come to the part three uh, of my talk, that is the ideal block for the hand surgery. So for that, we also need to understand the anatomy and the cutaneous nerve supply of hand is very important. Let's understand the Palmer aspect where three and a half digits are supplied by median nerve, its uh, branches. And one of the branches, uh, like the Palmer cutaneous branch, does not pass through the carpal tunnel. It passes beyond, uh, besides the carpal tunnel. The unknown nerve, which supplies one and a half digit, and it also supplies through uh, two branches, the digital branches, as well as the palmar cutaneous branch. And on coming on to the dorsal surface, uh, we have the radial nerve supplying the major chunk and the ulnar nerve. And the distal, uh, middle and distal phalanx is uh, supplied from the index, mid, middle and ringer by the uh, ring finger by the median nerve. So, uh, uh, we have myotomes, definitely. Uh, we have median, ulnar, and radial. Uh, radial taking care of the dorsal surface, ulnar on the medial side, and median on the uh, radial side. And this is an excellent article published in uh, CZ Tutorial of the Week very recently. And I would request you to go through this because it will give you a lot of technical details as regards hand surgery RA options. So coming on to the osteotomes, as we have already seen this slide, osteotomes again on the anterior aspect, uh, we have the median nerve in the three and a half fingers. And on the uh, me uh, medial side, we have the ulnar nerve. On the dorsal aspect, two and a half, two and a half roughly between radial and the ulnar. And the distal phalanx, obviously, on this side is supplied by the median nerve. So what are the common hand surgeries which we can think of? This is not an exhaustive list. This is just a suggestive list. Carpal tunnel, ganglions, and definitely small bone fractures, lacerations, foreign body removals, contracture releases, and trigger finger release. So uh, how do we actually decide which strategy for hand and wrist surgery, or for that matter, uh, yeah, for shoulder or forearm surgery? We have to decide whether bone is involved or not whether we are doing it for anesthesia or analgesia purpose, whether the patient is going to stay in-house or it's a daycare patient, whether tunique is going to be used regarding the duration of the surgery, definitely inquire from the surgeon and what is going to be the position of the patient during that surgery. So coming on to a little word about tunique tolerance, uh, we have options of forearm tunique, sorry, arm tunique, forearm tunique, wrist on uh, tunique's. And uh, if you actually look at it, uh, in comparison to arm tonique, forearm tonique scores better in terms of tolerance. Uh, arm tonique without any anesthesia or analgesia is generally tolerated between 20 to 30 minutes. That is our experience on the basis of literature as well as bias block, which we use. Uh, sometimes uh, we realize that it takes around 30 minutes before patient starts complaining. But with forearm tonique, as per the literature, it gives you an extra 15 minutes. So for uh, hand and wrist surgery, we can certainly think of a forearm to make it. And please remember, my dear friends, there are a lot of anatomical variations. If you have given a distal block and uh, you find in some area uh, the block is not working, it's not your block has failed. It's because there are certain anatomical variations, certain degree of overlaps. And let me tell you, classically, all your textbooks would show on the lateral side of the arm, if you look at the cutaneous nerve supply on anterior aspect, it would be by lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm or branch of muscular cutaneous. But in this study in 2017 published in RAPM, they actually showed that sensory mapping they did, the LACN extends up till the base of the thumb. So if, uh, if your surgery is happening on this area and previously, if you look at this schematic, you would not block LACN. Now anything reaching up to the base of the thumb on either side, would need an additional LACN block. So what are the RA options, my dear friends? There are many. You can start from proximal brachial plexus block. You can think of distal nerve blocks, the bias block, and you can certainly think of local anesthesia or the volant technique, which is known as the wide awake local anesthetic technique with no tonique, which is very popular amongst uh, hand surgeons. So let's look at uh, step by step. We should be using proximal blocks for hand surgery or not. Interscaling is a strict no, as I said, because it would not lead to blockage of uh, ulnar nerve. 
supraclavicular and infraclavicular, it would be plus minus. It's my own opinion. The reason being, uh, you would be blocking the proximal muscles and that would lead to particularly block of axillary nerve. Deltoid would be not be working. We might require a sling for in the post-operative period and patient would complain that he has had a surgery for a hand, uh, uh, hand surgery and why are you giving a sling, particularly in the outpatient surgery. And you have to remember one thing, that these are small procedures. A patient would like to go back home as early as possible. So axillary brachial plexus block definitely uh, is a, a thumbs up from my side for a proximal block. And it, the best thing would be use a lignocaine so that the effect wears off within five, six hours. And then you can do a distal blocks to take care of the uh, analgesia part. So distal blocks, my dear friends, definitely they can be used for analgesia as well as anesthesia if you properly plan them and take care of the anatomical variations. The biggest advantage is preserve the motor strength of the proximal muscles. But you have to remember that they would require multiple injections. And tunique pain could be an issue if you are having an arm tunique more than 30 minutes or forearm tunique more than around 45 to 50 minutes. So I would request you to kindly pay attention. Uh, let's look again at the uh, osteotomes. And uh, if you are planning a soft tissue surgery on the palmar surface of the hand, uh, then you can uh, yourself see a median alarmal would, would do. Whereas a dorsal surface of the hand, you would certainly require uh, LACN if you are close to the thumb base in addition to radial ulna. And uh, if you're doing a bony surgery on the thumb, you would require LACN in addition to medial and radial. Index finger, my dear friends, a medial and a radial should be okay. But middle and ringer, you will have to combine all three. And baby finger or the little finger, as you can see for yourself, unlevel too. So <clears throat> these are x-rays from my hospital where we actually did uh, some of the distal nerve blocks. And they were done in addition to general anesthesia, which was the primary anesthetic. And we did them for analgesia purpose. And this was the fourth and the fifth finger. We did all three. And this was exclusively external fixator placed on the baby finger or the fifth finger. So we did only a ulnar block. So is there any clinical evidence for the efficacy of distal nerve blocks for hand or wrist surgery? Certainly, yes. Uh, this article, and there are many, I'm quoting one of them, um, an RCT, which was a triple mass study. And they showed that distal nerve blocks preserve motor function without affecting the quality of anesthesia and they lead to increased patient satisfaction. So what about volant? Volant is very popular among hand surgeons. The surgeons inject at multiple points, dilute solutions of lignocaine with adrenaline, adrenaline being the tourniquet as they say, and they do not use actually the tourniquet. And there are so many RCTs and I'm quoting the systematic reviews and meta-analysis where they have found it quite effective for distal hand surgeries. So this brings me to almost uh, the tail end of my presentation uh, and the take home message as regards this lecture is you need to have a good solid understanding of the anatomy and you need to know the anatomical variations also, especially when uh, planning anesthesia because analgesia definitely since RA is a component of multimodal, it would be taken care of. But anesthesia, you might get into trouble and you might need to supplement with some deep sedation or general anesthetic. And before planning any block, discuss with the surgeon regarding the duration, the use of the tunique, what is the planned incision and the position of the patient. For example, shoulder arthroscopies are generally done in deep chair or lateral position, which at times can be a little un, uh, difficult for the patient to tolerate for three, four hours if you are planning to do under whole and sole region anesthesia. Please definitely know your skill because uh, if somebody is comfortable in one block, may not be comfortable with other. So do not jump on to doing some fancy block which has been described in literature very recently. Definitely trust your skills and do a block which you are already comfortable, especially in a patient whom you would not block, want that your block should fail. And please plan your block accordingly. Uh, thank you very much for your patient listening and any questions I'm more than happy to answer. Excellent presentation, uh, Devesh. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Um, uh, as I think uh, recently been discussed uh, on the uh, Twitter, social media, and whatnot, is the the number of blocks which have mushroomed. And 
uh, my take on that is is that uh, this is all because of ultrasound. So ultrasound might actually help you to be very precise with where you want to deposit local anesthetic. At the same time, it has actually caused a lot of confusion in the world of regional anesthesia. There are many, many of these blocks you wouldn't actually think of doing uh, with landmark technique or PNS guided techniques. And, and I think saying that uh, the this all kind of you know, superior trunk block, this individual list block, is there actually an evidence that uh, the usual blocks which were actually done before advent of ultrasound, that they cause problems? That again brings us to the same questions that what percentage of blocks are actually recorded or what data we actually have. If this was such a problem that oh, the interscaling block with 20 mLs, 30 mLs were going, causing severe uh, problem with phrenic nerve, uh, people would have stopped doing them long ago. So I think there is over-exaggeration of the uh, effect. And I think there is a bit of a show off by saying that I can actually do an interscaling block with uh, 0 0.003 mLs. Okay, I think um, very, very recently, this happened very recently to one of my anesthesia colleague uh, who does ultrasound guided blocks. <clears throat> and he is, I can say, reasonably skilled in them. And uh, he is uh, from the uh, old Russia kind of place. So he used to practice before he moved here to UK. And he came back to me, he said, Shiv, I uh, have used these blocks in a supraclavicular block landmark technique. You know, the usual what people actually say, mm -hmm. feel for the artery, go hit and give volume. And I used to do all my surgeries with this block with 100% success. And he said, after coming here and actually doing ultrasound carrier blocks using <clears throat> in a volumes of 15, 20 mLs, I still get, get, I won't say failures, there is always, you know, missed segments. Can I actually use larger volume? I say, yes, please go ahead and actually see, you know, this is a nice comparison you can actually do for yourself. This is self-audit. Go on and use volumes you are happy with. So he started actually using larger volumes. And he now says that he's got a better, you know, outcomes, better blocks. So I think this kind of, I think, fancy thing that I only use, uh, you know, 0 0.02 mLs uh, compared to 20 mLs is, I think, uh, is a lot of, <laughs> you know, blowing your own trumpet or trying to show off. And I think that is what has happened. So. I think in regional anesthesia, I was actually just writing uh, my some notes on that. <clears throat> so uh, for the developed world or for the advanced uh, practitioners, they can use uh, all kind of fancy blocks, and they can call them the people who want to name name them after their own names. <laughs> okay, and then there is this real world or the common man, the arm janta, okay, which comes from the developing countries. Okay, they actually prefer to use standard techniques. The classical blocks, whether it's interscaling, supraclavicular, infraclavicular, you know, uh, axillary blocks, and people actually are doing huge numbers using those blocks. And one of them I always like to mention because she tends to, uh, you know, post a lot of this on axillary blocks for hand surgeries. And she does it routinely without any sedation, without requiring any, you know, additional analgesia without fail. Okay, using a nose stimulation uh, techniques and and wonderful, uh, you know, results. And they're using tunicate, tunicate, and other things. But obviously, there is obviously the, uh, you know, surgeons involved. So if you got a good surgeon, quick surgeon you will actually have a good result as well. <laughs> because as long as patient will tolerate tunicate for 30 to 40 minutes, that I have seen. 
Yeah, okay. So I do actually do occasionally do the hand surgeries. And uh, recently, for the first time, I actually posted about this. This was about the doing a <clears throat> like an arthroplasty of the thumb. <laughs> they call it uh, thumb basal arthroplasty uh, surgeries. And um, mm -hmm. uh, of these uh, four uh, four cases, uh, one of them actually had it completely and she didn't even want any sedation and uh, with tunica. And uh, they were done done with just, uh, I, I just give distal blocks uh, at the elbow. And you actually learn uh, in that. And uh, uh, my, uh, you know, uh, kind of suggestion to people who actually do hand surgery said, I think trying to, uh, you know, uh, save a few ml of local anesthetic for one nerve is a waste of time. Wherever I would try to do that, I have always actually, you know, regretted. You're doing a hand surgery on any part of the hand, just block everything. Just give median radial unarm and do a cutaneous infiltration from one side to other. If you are not able to actually visualize nerves, just give uh, uh, infiltration, uh, you know, at the elbow crease from one end to the other and you will block the cutaneous nerves as well. And you will get absolutely excellent analgesia. And you can do it for, like I said, uh, for any surgery. So don't try to save on few mLs of uh, local anesthetic. <laughs> it's not much of a saving, but what it will do, if you, you do use the local, uh, the local anesthetic block all the nerves, uh, you will actually have a satisfied patient and you will have a grin on your face as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh I like to share, a, we have time, so I like to share a small yeah. story. Yeah. So I have been trained in Jamnagar where we used to do a lot of regional anesthesia work, but it was all landmark guided. Yeah. For upper limb, it used to be brachial plexus, supraclavicular interscaline, and the standard volumes we used to give was 20 ml, 0.5% bupivacaine and 10 ml xylocaine. And first we used to inject 10 ml separately and then 20 ml. So my dear friend, Dr. Vikrant, who is also part of this group, you know, once we mm -hmm. came back to Delhi, we did senior residency from different places. After that, I got into corporate practice and he was into freelancing. Very recently, I met him in a social gathering. He still says that I still use supraclavicular for all my upper limb surgeries and yeah. still he is using that 20 plus 10 ml yeah. without any sedations. Yeah. So this is just to highlight what you have already cited, that volume also makes a difference. Maybe with ultrasound, uh, for analgesia, definitely we can keep cutting down. But for anesthesia, at times, whenever I've seen, I try to cut down, the things can be problematic. So anesthesia for that, you have to be a little liberal. And adding to second point, for distal surgeries, uh, what my uh, feeling is that uh, think of osteotomes first. Forget about uh, cutaneous. Cutaneous, as you have very rightly cited, give a cutaneous infiltration here or there. It will take care of these MACN, LACN, EACN. So if you are, do not want to think much and do not want to do fancy things, block all three nerves. That is the key, median, ulnar, and radial. And without any problem, you will uh, uh, be able to do the case. But if you go very selective, I face the problems in terms of analgesia also. Slowly and slowly, I realize the importance of LACN covering this portion, which previously I was not aware that it used to come, uh, come up to thumb base. Yeah. So... Uh, we started blocking LACN and things what started working well for us. Um, another thing I would like to actually mention, I think, which was again very recently again uh, uh, pointed out by Suchitra, and I think it makes a lot of sense, is that when you're doing an axillary block, do not forget about muscular cutaneous, especially for tunicate, because your biceps, corogor brachialis. Yes. Because and they deal with the pressure of the tourniquets. Like, absolutely. Yeah, principal absolutely. muscles. Yes. Yeah. And then so they have to be blocked. No, lateral cutaneous nerve is actually muscular cutaneous. Yes. cutaneous. Okay. So uh, don't forget this wonderful nerve. And with ultrasound, it is so beautifully seen. Mm -hmm. But also remember that in certain cases, muscular cutaneous can be missing. Yes. I think uh, uh, this, is, this is almost, I think uh, they say around 11 to 13%, if I'm not wrong, is that patient may not actually have muscular cutaneous nerve at all. Yeah. But it's an art to find muscular cutaneous with PNS. Hats off to those people who are doing PNS guided axillary block. It's <laughs> not that with ultrasound, you can easily visualize, visualize that starfish appearance. 
but uh, penis people are hats off to them for absolutely, doing this. Absolutely, I think uh, it is the first nerve. I think uh, to uh, be blocked, and then you go for the other nerve. Sorry, Anil. Hi, sir. Uh, uh, excellent presentation, Dr. Devesh. Uh, sir, Thanks, I would want Thank to you. ask a question. What is your experience with uh, catheter insertion for shoulder arthroplasties? Do you routinely uh, use catheters or? No, no. Uh, I, I have very limited experience. Once or twice in a year, if we are requested by the surgeon that they would like catheter to be in place uh, for next two, three days physiotherapy. Otherwise, I have not used them. Okay. Um, one of my colleagues was like, he recently actually, uh, I mean, uh, he had started using catheters and uh, what they actually found, whatever technique they use for that, uh, the uh, dislodgement of uh, interscalene catheters is, catheters is very, high. very high. And um, coming to the complications uh, which uh, with interscalene catheters, there is actually, if you look at the literature, there is actually a case uh, where uh, interscalene catheter was uh, placed successfully. It was done even uh, Exactly. They, yes, and sir. while they were removing patient, actually complained of severe shock, and they had, the catheter has gone around the root, and the root was avulsed. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, I think people are a little bit, <laughs> I think those people who have read that, they must be really scared of putting uh, interscalene catheters. So we can put a catheter if you want. Costoclavicular space is a good place. It will cover yeah. uh, the shoulder as I told you. And then yeah. you were saying something. I was about to uh, add to that point, sir. And one more thing, I would uh, want to know the regional analgesia option for frozen shoulder. It's a frozen suprascapular. A supra classical yeah. suprascapular is most people use that, that I think. Uh, um, because I think, uh, like you say, it is, you're not going into the neck. You're not doing that. And uh, most of the uh, posterior capsule, I think that's a, uh, a safe generated, but I think um, people can use interscaling as well. Uh, I think uh, the diagrams by I mean, what the way should actually shown uh, where it uh, shows the, the various nerves involved in uh, the uh, nerve innervation of the shoulder joint. That's, that's very, very important. And no doubt that people who uh, you know, uh, give a good interscaling block get most of it. Because you are actually, you know, covering covering the all the most of the nerves which supply supplies shoulder joint. But if they are actually doing it for just analgesia for frozen shoulder, then um, you would uh, supra suprascapular classically can be given. I'm no, sure no, no. they can do sub um, But for I think uh, if you are doing a release of uh, the shoulder frozen shoulder, we prefer to actually do it uh, with GN blocks both. Uh, Dr. Devish, uh, there's a question for you. Uh, do you use additives like Dexmed or Clonidine for your blocks? Yeah, my personal favorite is Dexamethasone. Uh, I use four to eight milligrams in almost every block. And we have done a thesis also comparing uh, Dexamethasone with Dexmedutubidine for uh, brachial plexus block. So we found uh, Dexmedutine was uh, causing uh, bradycardia, hypotension and all. So dexamethasone, in my personal opinion, is a better alternative as compared to dexamethasone for these blocks. It's probably the one of the safest uh, steroids to be used um, near the nerves. Um, even though they say that uh, not, um, most of the dexamethasone which is available to us is uh, not preservative free, uh, but the amount of preservative which is there in the dexamethasone, four milligrams or eight milligrams, is too small to cause any nerve injuries. And literature has shown that this is probably one of the safest steroids you can ever use. Some people are hesitant to use uh, dexamethasone for pediatric age group. I don't know about that. I'm not experienced in that, so I don't know the answer to why it is there, but. They still, I think, use it IV. I think they give you equal amount. But if you, so the way I look at, at dexamethasone, um, because people have said that there is uh, no superiority over the other uh, way, but there is, if you want to do a uh, block uh, for, you know, surgery as a sole anesthesia technique, 
Then uh, local anesthetic with dexamethasone probably give you superior uh, kind of uh, motor blockade, uh, better relaxation, and uh, duration of analgesia, probably I would use it. But if I were to use it uh, block as a part of uh, GAR, a GAR technique as we call it, then I think IV dexamethasone is fine. You don't actually have to mix it. So you can uh, take it that way. Uh, but in pediatrics, I have no idea. Sorry, so yeah. So, uh, Dr. Divish, a question for you. How do you deal with your patients uh, when, uh, you know, you do a block and say 12 to 16 hours later when, say, the next morning the surgeon wants to discharge them and they've still got a limp hand or uh, okay. limp limp arm, right? Uh, or, or areas of uh, paresthesia or analgesia. You know, how, yeah. do you, how do you deal with that? Especially your See. surgeon and then the patient. Uh, once in a year, you will definitely encounter such kind of situation because all the blocks are not given by experts. They definitely, we have uh, consultants who are in various uh, years of practice, plus we have DNB residents. <laughs> so once in a twice in a year, we definitely encounter. Uh, you have to <laughs> keep your nerve, explain to the surgeon, uh, this will wear off. And uh, if the patient is on the side where... Uh, little uh, cheeky kind of a patient. So definitely we will uh, counsel ourselves personally and then we would not discharge them till the time block recovers. And if we like the patient is understanding cooperative, then we tell them that we'll do a telephonic call in the evening or so. So it will depend from patient to patient and all this like, but uh, definitely it, it is a troubling night that particular till the time you do not get sensations back. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dish. Yeah. So I uh, will likely be discussing a bit about that in my actual lecture tomorrow about safety uh, lecture on regional anesthesia because nerve injuries is uh, one of the things which people worry about. And again, uh, it comes to my point of actually uh, dexamethasone with LA, you will actually get a prolonged motor blockade with uh, dexamethasone mixed with LA, uh, whereas you won't do with if you're giving it with IV. So uh, with analgesia is prolonged uh, with giving IV to almost equal duration, maybe an hour or two here and there. Uh, so uh, use that one. Second thing is that if you are, uh, you know, your surgeon is planning to discharge the patient early, one thing you need to make sure that the arm is protected. And I actually, uh, whether it is for the vascular surgeries, uh, you know, for like brachial fistula formation for which they ask for blocks or it is for orthopedic surgery, I always ask the uh, staff to put a sling on them. And sling only comes, comes off once the patient actually has got full uh, power again. Insensate limb can lead to quite a few things. Uh, obviously injury, the hitting, you know, structures or... And then even burns, they will not feel pain from burns. Okay, they drop, their hand is by the radiator in, in, in the colder countries where the radiators, they're sitting by that or whatever it is, they will not. So burns is known thing, uh, injury is known thing. So protect the hand where you are given that. Also, I think it gives the, the patient some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, assurance that their limb is protected. I just like to share an incident. Uh, actually, one of my colleagues, his uh, or her daughter, uh, she had a fall. She had her arm in a cast, and uh, she'd gone shopping a uh, couple of days after, and she tripped on the carpet, hmm. and she hurt her eye. And she hmm. actually lost vision in that eye. So that's that's. This is some of the problems that you can have with an insensate arm or a, or a slightly. So, like I said, like you, you've been talking about the relationship. Uh, it, I think it's very, very important that we take care when we do send patients back uh, post uh, blocks and stuff like that. We have to doc. And again, uh, the documentation is very, very important. Uh, I, I think that's that's something that is is critical, and it's something that's not often done because you get a call from the surgeon, you just go and see, and then you just say, okay, everything's fine. This is doc a detailed documentation is, is something that probably goes a long way. Yeah. Uh, any, there aren't any, uh, any more questions as such, but lots of appreciation for your presentation, uh, Divesh.
uh, excellent presentation, wonderful Thank present, you. Thank super you. presentation. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a few comments, uh, obviously, uh, I think, uh, uh, now there are more, more about, about that, I think. Uh, Jamie says that she loves Albo blocks. Yes, sir, I block all three, even for close reduction risk. And that is true. I think, um, again, yes. uh, one of the things uh, which was discussed long back was, uh, you know, if you have uh, intraarticular fracture, uh, then, um, you know, for surgery, which is extraarticular uh, fractures, maybe you can get away with median and radial nerve, but intraarticular uh, do uh, block the ulnar nerve, which crosses over uh, to the thumb and can provide uh, innovation yes. to that. But that's why I said actually, I think no point just being, uh, you know, stingy with uh, that. Yeah. Um, uh, Saker has actually just asked a question. Do we need to block intercostal brachial nerve for tunicate? Okay. Do you want me to answer or you want to answer the wish? <laughs> So the, uh, the, when you talk about Tony K, there are two components to it. One is the pain related to the compression and one is related to the ischemia. Okay. So the principal brunt is borne by, as we have already discussed, is the uh, coracobrachialis and the biceps belly. If you do not block musculocutaneous, you'll have uh, the pain right from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So uh, the ischemic pain will happen at around 45 minutes to one hour, not in every case. That is also together a different ball game. So if you're doing a uh, perfect uh, wake surgery and all, definitely a little block might help. But under general anesthesia, I think uh, you don't need that. Yeah. <clears throat> so I actually studied uh, quite a lot about intercostal brachial nerve and uh, things like that because I was trying to actually find out, especially uh, when you do, uh, you know, second stage of uh, the uh, arteriovenous fistulas. And they go into that territory. And uh, what I actually uh, discovered uh, during this was that intercostal brachial nerve and uh, the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, these two nerves have inverse relation. And also intercostal brachial nerve can actually get uh, innovation not only from the T2 from or T3 as well, so you can miss out on that. So, in some cases, you would actually find that intercostal breaking nerve has got greater contribution than uh, medial cutaneous nerve form, uh, whereas in others where the medial cutaneous nerve is a predominant one, then intercostal brachial has a lesser component of that. So for surgery, it probably uh, doesn't matter. You can always do local infiltration for the skin. Uh, coming to the... Uh, you know, the tunica pain, which is the initial, which is the pinching kind of pain, which we actually call because of pressure pain, of the tunica pressure pain, which again, I have actually uh, put up a, you know, on the group, I have the poster for that and things like that. Uh, for that, again, there's a very small contribution to that. It doesn't, just giving intercostal break and nerve uh, block doesn't mean you will take away the tunica pain. Uh, main pain is actually what troubles the patient is the pain which comes in when the ischemia is set in. And uh, that's my experience that patients tend to tolerate the tunica for upper limb a little bit more than the one uh, uh, for the lower limb. Uh, and that's maybe just related to the muscle mass. The muscle mass is much less. And so the, for the same reason, if you have a patient who is uh, very muscular, athletic, and go, having upper limb, expect that they will develop tunic pain much more and earlier than a patient who is skinny and small. So this is this is this is a this is a fact. You can actually next time you observe it, you got a patient you're doing awake surgery, patient is very muscular, young patients, they tend to develop uh, tunic pain. The onset is a lot more uh, you know quicker yeah. earlier yeah. Uh, than in patients who are skinny, less mass or elderly patients, uh, you know, again, who don't have that much muscle, uh, it's much less than. But I would say 30 to 40, 45 minutes at the most, uh, it's okay. Otherwise, you'll end up giving them profile and whatnot. Uh, profile is known to prevent uh, injury from uh, the ischemia. So it is seen that with tunica pain, there is uh, injury to the muscle that actually start happening uh, quite early on, mitochondrial changes 
are seen pretty early. And if you give them propofol infusion, then this injury is supposed to be less. And for the same reason, they tend to tolerate tunicate for longer. It's not just sedation effect, but also the protective effect of propofol is also there. So both are equally good. But if your surgery is going to be more than 40, 45 minutes, better to just do it as a GRA technique. And that saves you all the trouble. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we do uh, bias block sometimes uh, yeah. for short procedures. So that's my observation that around 25 minutes, the patient starts complaining of pain. That is the time you have to change your tunicase. Yeah. So, but literature for forearm tunicase, it's like around 45 minutes. So it's a distal procedure. You can certainly use a forearm tunicase. You yeah. need not use a arm tunicase. That way you will be able to extend another 15 minutes to yourself. It's like say, yeah. if the surgery is around 40 minutes or so. Yeah. So again, <laughs> coming coming to this, this is the recent experience. Like I said, I just was doing this uh, list for the first time where they were uh, replacing. It's like uh, having a hip joint uh, to the thumb, thumb joint, proximal thumb joint. And so I told the surgeon, I said, okay, this patient is going to be awake, fully awake. She doesn't want any sedation, doesn't want anything. Can you please use a forearm tunicate? And uh, the thing is that it... They did agree to my suggestion, but they were have, struggling because it was interfering with their uh, use of instruments like okay. So there is always some positives and negatives of that. Mm -hmm. So for the other cases, I just use a different technique and they did use uh, forearm, forearm tunic, uh, sorry, they use the proper arm tunicate. Uh, but again, it's, it need to be with after discussion uh, with the surgeon if they're yeah. happy to actually have it in that area. Uh, but they, that's true. And then again, the reason is the same. The uh, the amount of ischemic area is reduced if you're using forearm tunicate. Mm -hmm. And the same is true that if you're doing an ankle surgery, if you have an ankle tunicate, they don't feel pain as much. Yes. You know, you can yes. go on for uh, 90 minutes without any problem. But if you go for thigh tunicate, 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, patient will start moving and wriggling mm -hmm. and uh, you know, they will make your life a hell. Uh, so that was Sikha. Rajesh Shah's excellent uh, presentation. Dr. Raghavendra is there. He's asked if PEC2 block helps to block the intercostal brachial nerve and can be utilized when operation involves in the medial part of the arm. Uh, yeah. You can, and any, actually, for that matter, actually, uh, in, uh, infraclavicular, that's been my observation. If you do infraclavicular block, which is actually in the same area as your PEC2 block uh, coming to that area, like I'm not saying PEC2 block in a sense that not at, at the at the uh, site, but in the same plane where local anesthetic might do. Well, say, saying that at the, uh, the intercostal breaking nerves do come out cutaneously uh, from the back. And uh, uh, rather than that, uh, we were actually, you did mention that the wish, uh, erector spinal block, okay. So erector spine, I have used that at T2, T3 level, uh, just T2 level. Uh, go hit the transverse process, inject 10 mLs, you got it. Okay, so that can also be actually used. In yes. Yeah. And there, Rajesh has already mentioned that here. Usually do T2, erector spine for sure, short T2, T3 block. I always want successful. Yeah. yeah he's That's a big it. fan of ESP and he calls yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. After like said. <laughs> I have actually done done it in patients uh, which they are still on, uh, you know, the uh, beach chair things and all. Went uh, felt the C seven transverse where it come down on the side, go hit the transverse process, inject, done. Yeah, okay. not even use of ultrasound. <laughs> Just take it on yeah. and do it. And I call it a good. universal block. Any yeah. location without yeah. ultrasound, it can be. You can you like can this. do yeah, as long as you can hit the transverse process, come out and yeah. Get it. Easy injection and you you got it. We still likely have time, uh, Anil and Som, uh, because this was going to be, I think, uh, tea time, but also question answers on anything. Till now, if anybody actually has got any questions or any contributions, uh, staff, sorry, the faculty, uh, anybody wants to come in and uh, give, I think Kala had said that she's got a beautiful video on uh, muscular cutaneous. Muscular cutaneous, yes, I read that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
you can actually share it if you want to. Uh, any questions on uh, the, uh, this session is mostly about the upper limb and uh, ultrasound guided blogs in general, uh, use of ultrasound. So any questions related to upper limb uh, is most welcome. So we've already got 675 views. Uh, that doesn't mean that all the people are there all the times, but they are from time to time, people are actually uh, joining and leaving. Uh, but at any, any times, uh, the numbers has been around 70 to 80 people uh, who have been constantly there. Uh, question to you, Divesh, uh, from Rajesh Da. Uh, have you done bilateral shoulder under soul block ever? And if you yes, saw it's done, <laughs> probably <Yeah>. nobody <laughs> would want to do. Yeah. You don't have no. both uh, limb completely no. paralyzed or no. useless. I think that's not never a good idea. Uh, but so uh, recently I did uh, one side humerus and other side was clavicle. For humerus, I gave interscaline. It was all under general anesthesia. Yeah. For clavicle, we gave clavipectoral fascia block. Yeah. Yeah. So I will never dare to combine interscaling both. It's like... yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Doctor Naija, can it be done under epidural, <laughs> cervical epidural? <laughs> there, where you actually get bilateral, uh, I think block. Uh, there are people who are using, um, you know, cervical epidural for epidural. breast surgeries. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the question actually comes from there whether you would actually dare to actually do. Uh, shoulder surgery, uh, but you would require a pretty high, uh, uh, you know, uh, block, uh, high cervical block epidural <coughs> surgery, which uh, uh, probably I think uh, anybody would ever dare to do that. <laughs> we'll have to keep intubation things ready any moment you would require. Exactly. Yeah, so if you're yeah. going to do that, why not do just intubate and things like that? <laughs> I think uh, rather than bilateral surgeries uh, for the hand, there have been cases where. Uh, patient have, have fractured both bones on the both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, so they've had radial fractures or both bone fractures, both sides. And that question is common. That can be done. Yeah. That so, can be done under bilateral axillary you can give without any problem. Absolutely. So I think that that is the, uh, been that. Um, <laughs> Rajesh says that he has done bilateral clavicular fracture under cervical epidural. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He should have joined through the Zoom link. Yeah, uh, then we would have heard this experience on that. Yeah. yeah. Again, like the bilateral clavicular fractures, uh, they can be actually done with local well, uh, infiltration. And, uh, uh, In giving fact, I was uh, reviewing the literature for volant. Volant yeah. is for hand surgeries, clavicle. Yeah. Uh, this ankle also volant has been used. Extended. Even clavicle yeah. volant they have used in. Well, the, so, what, what is, uh, you know, abdominal, like liposuction, what is it? It's volant, it's, uh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Volant, so yes. you flood the area with very low concentration. High volume. Local anesthetic and, uh, and, yeah, and it will work. Yeah. It is, yeah. it is. Uh, and no adrenaline in that solution acts as a tunique, basically. Tunique, absolutely. Right. That's, that's, uh, basically, that constricts uh, yeah. the arteries as well as the as veins. And that's why you don't uh, see that. I think the other thing they have recently talked about is the, what, what do they call it? Uh, where they have put uh, local anesthetic with adrenaline and near the knee joint and hip joints. And that is PVI, peripheral. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, perivascular, PVI. Perivascular, perivascular infiltration. Infiltration, yeah. PVI. So uh, Dr. Again, Vincent similar, Rocks from, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, he has yeah. So, so again, again, similar, uh, similar kind of thing. And then again, uh, pank block is nothing but uh, what the surgeons actually have been doing for uh, their joint pains, the injection yes. under Inside the do joint it. capsule. Absolutely. They, they've been doing it uh, with radiological, uh, with x-rays. Mm -hmm. And here we're doing with ultrasound. So I think the concept is similar again, uh, mm -hmm. uh, putting local anesthetic around. I think they use steroids, which obviously cause uh, anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, with a little bit of local anesthetic. Here we're using local anesthetic for analgesia purposes. So it is similar. Thank you. <laughs> of late doing liposuction of segmental and patients are very happy, but I said, don't use Jimmy scent. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think uh, the advantage of uh, uh, the using Jimmy scent was again the same thing. Even though it's a fat, they can still bleed and have. Uh, 
you know, pr uh, problems with that. They they then, but then they give a very tight kind of bandaging of the abdomen, things like that. Uh, uh, this is Pratik Makwana who say, how to manage hypotensive anesthesia and shoulder arthroscopy on a sole region as there for a awake patient. Okay. Um, I think this is more related to the positioning rather than actually the, uh, the region anesthesia technique itself. Do you want to answer that, uh, Divish? See, if we are uh, like uh, he said, he mentioned sole anesthetic, no? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, see, there is no painful stimulus moving, uh, coming from the uh, site of surgery, but uh, the patient in beach chair or a lateral position definitely will be a little jittery for to be in that position for three, four hours. That would certainly lead to a certain kind of catecholamines in the body. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, if uh, uh, good sedation and uh, uh, labetalol, which is easily available, can, I think, solve the purpose. No, no, he's talking about hypotension, not hyper, hypo. Okay, okay. So, yeah. but a good regional anesthesia would definitely take care of it. And in you want, you can use labetalol to get it down to 90s. That is what their requirement is generally, surgeons and all. I don't know whether he was talking about uh, how to uh, go for hypotensive anesthesia or he's talking about uh, whether the hypotension which actually happens uh, from pushing. So I'm not very clear about it. Uh, he might be talking about uh, what you're saying that uh, you, uh, because- Only surgeons want, want hypotensive want anesthesia. Low, lower, well. lower blood, blood pressure. But uh, one of the things with the, um, the uh, yes, he's talking about the same. He just mentioned that it's about the bloodless, bloodless field. So talking about uh, creating hypotensive anesthesia in awake, awake patient. Yes, level But you have to be careful uh, because in beach chair, uh, your uh, uh, cuff of the uh, blood pressure monitoring device is at the arm. So your levels would not reflect the true levels at the base. At times, if it's seventy here, it would be sixty there. So one has to be very careful uh, to get down the BP in such cases. Even in lateral, if it's on the downside. Yeah. Uh, I think there was, again, a recent discussion about what where to put it. So, uh, again, when if you're going on lateral side, uh, forearm uh, blood pressure cuffs will give you more. Because if the patient, the cuff is actually compressed, he will give you falsely high reading mm. uh, next to surgery. So, that need to be careful. Uh, but that that's true. I think um, what I think Dr. Naresh Paliwala said, the use of dexmedomidine is actually a good idea as well. Yeah, yes. Uh, gives you both. And that sedation. will give you dual purpose: sedation and, and hypotension. Sedation bring, yeah, brings yeah. your heart rate down, gives you that. But uh, you're very right. When um, so uh, I don't know from. I mean, I've seen that a lot of places are doing uh, shoulder surgeries in lateral position, but our surgeries, all all surgeries, are actually done in beach chair, and they have patient almost upright, and you can see how quickly the blood pressure drops in these patients if the patient has been fasting and they've not had. So my, this to uh, teaching to all my trainees is that get a, get at least a, a 18 G uh, when flown in, uh, start that, <coughs> give them at least, I mean, I have a little bag on, um, at least 500 to 750 ml should have actually gone in um, before the surgeon uh, tries to uh, put the patient into beach chair. Uh, previously, when older times, when uh, the patient were fasted for six hours, eight hours, maybe longer, uh, there have been uh, cases of cardiac arrest following uh, beach chair positioning. And that's because the patient is so dehydrated, there's no venous return and the, uh, the heart just collapses on itself. And that's it, basal reflex, uh, severe bradycardia followed by uh, cardiac arrest is known. So uh, be careful when you are actually, uh, you know, getting patient to beach chair position. You can always put the patient down, like, you know, um, let just have the head, leg up and head down if this situation happened, uh, but have fluids. And with the recent um, you know, guidelines where patients are allowed to drink uh, clear fluids up to one to two hours before surgery, uh, that reduces the risk as well. So they, are, they maintain their hydration. Yeah, so dex, uh, dexmedone in uh, sedation and with infusion, uh, that is again Rajesh and uh, uh, Dr. Naresh Paliwal for uh, maintaining a bloodless field for surgeons. Yep. How Shib, are we? Shiv, shall we take a 15 minute break for lunch? Uh, people can take, uh, we, we can continue. People who want to eat uh, can actually uh, have their lunch. Uh, uh, and uh, those who wants to discuss or ask any questions, uh, we're here. Uh, whoever is there.
I actually put the put the thing in there because it was going to be lunch time uh, for people. Uh, but if uh, any faculty wants to take take break, they can do it during the lecture or during. It's it's not a problem if you want to continue. We can actually continue uh, with discussion followed by my lecture. Anybody else uh, from the uh, faculty who is here? He wants, he to, wants to continue. Hmm? Shiv, I understand you want, from what you just said, I, I understand you are happy to continue, right? I'm, I'm happy to continue if, if there is uh, no, because like I said, the, most people are actually on uh, watching on the YouTube. It's just the faculty uh, who are here. Okay. So the faculty is actually happy. Uh, it's uh, better to actually finish early than finish late. Uh, uh, can I interrupt? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Dr. Vasanta has just written in a chat that uh, oh, I'm not they have that. done a humorous uh, they have done a humorous fracture and shoulder replacement under cervical epidural. Can uh, uh, she is shared with us? Vasanta, you can come in. Yeah, I am Vasanta Rupert. <laughs> My name sounds hello, like hello, hello. hello. <laughs> He'd see, not she. Sorry, <laughs> I was. Uh, can you share? Uh, can you share your uh, technique with us regarding yeah. cervical epidural? So, uh, at least two or three patients uh, deemed unfit outside hospital. One humerus fracture, one was shoulder replacement, and uh, two some uh, uh, distal humerus fracture. Okay. So, they came. I can clearly remember one patient who had EF of around 30-35% was on some clopidogrel, aspirin and all. Uh, none of them had any chest issues, lung issues. Okay. So we evaluated the patients except for cardiac dysfunction and everything else was fine. So we thought uh, we will try block, under block. Okay. So we gave interscaline block, ropivacaine, 0.25%, 10, 10 ml for that side. And for, for the first patient, I had put a cervical epidural at C67, but I didn't uh, activate it. It was just as a backup. So this surgery went on well. It was under uh, sedation. So I used uh, a combination of Dexem and uh, Propofol, minimal, like 25 mics per kg per uh, hour of Propofol and uh, Dexem, a, a touch of Dexem. And I, for safety reasons, I always uh, explained the patient that it is this IRIC surgery and all the surgeries were sitting, mind you, sitting posture. Okay, so that head head uh, headrest everything was there. So I, we had in detail had a uh, discussion before itself with the patient and attenders that patient will be partially awake, aware of the situation, and we may put a nasal airway, and there will be a nasal prongs or oxygen mask. So for the for the all these patients, I had put a nasal airway. They cooperated well under mild sedation. First patient was purely under interscaling block with the uh, cervical backup. Next, next patient, the other patient, shoulder replacement, I had given cervical epidural bolus with interscaline as a backup. Okay, for that, I had used only lignocaine, 2% lignocaine with adrenaline, just 8 ml. The beauty of the cervical epidural is with cervical epidural, patient themselves, you know, due to the, uh, I don't know, probably blockage of RS uh, uh, system, they sleep immediately after activating cervical epidural. They don't need any additional uh, sedation at all. If at all, you can give some half, one mg metazolam, that's all. So the other patient, which I did under cervical epidural, uh, uh, with a, 8 ml of uh, lignocaine with adrenaline, he slept off immediately. And I had given some 1 mg metazolam. The surgery went on for half an hour. After 45 minutes, since uh, uh, the sur surgery was prolonging, I gave ropivacaine, 0.2%, 8 ml. Surgery went on well, uh, and we had no issues. Hypotension was like transient. Fluid, I use, fluid, I titrate and give. Okay, so uh, everything was fine, just under sedation. So at least three or four cases I have done. Uh, I have a question. Is like hmm. uh, for cervical epidural, uh, don't you think around uh, one ml per segment should be enough? And if you are aiming from C5 till T1, T2, 5, 5 ml should be yeah. enough. Or That's why do we need 8 ml? Patient has to sit for like three, 3 hours at least there. Only blocking the surgical area won't be sufficient. You have to block okay. the thorax also. That's why I had given extra. That is for a purposeful reason. So that till thorax, they feel, feel little numb. Okay, that helps in their comfort level for lying in that position, sitting position. And it works beautifully. And uh, 
and were you able to map the sensory area of loss or like from which <laughs> place till which place it was there <laughs> no I, okay. i i don't do that because I, we, we do a lot of other surgeries i also think thanks for sharing i we also do a lot of other surgeries also under blocks tkr yeah somebody has uh, ah sir so much sir tell me yeah dr vasanta this question uh, when you do these blocks do you post operatively monitor their diaphragmatic function since you already have an ultrasound this yeah yeah one of the common problems you are expecting is a bilateral phrenic block no i haven't monitored with ultrasound but definitely uh, definitely i presume that there there is some paralysis because they require oxygen supplementation for a longer period than the other patients definitely there is one side palsy when the when the patient has interscaling definitely no, and but we don't mind that because uh, they come for surgery and it uh, the, uh, with the without the surgery for, uh, most of them like right hand patients who need that hand movement for and uh, uh, you know they are active patients not like very elderly patients who are not going to use their hands so they tolerate it well and a uh, little bit of oxygen for post of 3 or 4 hours is fine no but even when you are doing a cervical epidural are you not concerned with bilateral phrenic block again the beauty with that is diaphragm is very resistant to paralysis 2 percent lignin can you give 8 ml they are wonderfully yeah that to in sitting position no you don't find any uh, like uh, uh, textbook theoretical thing of uh, decrease in frc those things they breathe well uh, sit well sleep well without any much sedation that ascending reticular activity system no completely blocks they immediately sleep off after giving some people start snoring also luckily we have airway there nasal airway thank you very much dr Yeah, welcome. Uh, Shiv, sorry, should stop. Yeah, hi. Yeah, um, I think uh, I agree uh, with Basant about the uh, cervical. The you know the pain have been resistant to the local anesthetic, and uh, this uh, this probably has been proven with uh, what the chronic pain guys actually do when they do their cervical epidurals. they don't don't get they do use local anesthetic along with that though that amount is very small and uh, there are lots of uh, people who do uh, breast surgeries with cervical epidural and they also don't see a uh, print no uh, involvement as much as we would expect uh, by theoretical that it's probably a lot more common with interscaling uh, with overspill to directly to the uh, uh, print no but at the central level and i don't know what the mechanism is but there seems to be a lot more resistance to the effect on that not that we want people to do the left and right but i think it's again about about the uh, uh, you know expertise uh, of people who are doing it any any other um... i think there's a There's a comment on cervical epidural on to Vasanta's uh, presentation on uh, cervical epidural with on a patient with floppy dog rub. Vasanta, you yeah. muted, yeah. Yeah. So uh, nowadays we stop only for three days if they are on a uh, floppy dog rub. We don't uh, uh, stop for the uh, ideal seven days or some cardiologist recommend for five days. but in our practice we have seen like last 15 years I, we haven't stopped more than 3 days for any neuroaxial procedures and our hospital has accepted that uh, protocol so only 3 mm-hmm. days we stop okay i don't know maybe uh, drug is not working in india the bioavailability is bad here or people are more resistant definitely but 3 days is enough even for ct myelogram we do frequently for our spine surgeons ct myelogram mm-hmm. with a 23 mm-hmm. gauge needle we inject uh, dye for their uh, cord uh, compression for spine surgeries only 3 days we stop it is known clopidogrel resistance is a known known thing so uh, because it's not a measured in the activity is not measured uh, we don't uh, actually know what is the level of resistance uh, with clopidogrel uh, but in the in the west i think uh, we have seen the patient actually been very Uzi, if they are actually stop less than a week, so we recommend patients at least seven, five to seven days is standard. <clears throat> um, but saying that, uh, uh, some of our patients, so if we are doing uh, surgeries like uh, you know carotids, 
this patient continued continue to be on clopidogrel. They do are they do seem to be a bit oozy. They apply pressure, but then here we're talking about you know development of uh, epidural hematoma, which can be disastrous in situations. So I don't know whether uh, you can give that kind of a leeway for you know uh, epidurals, whether it's cervical or thoracic or uh, lumbar. Now, because of the trainees being here at, you know, yes, your hospital, the medical legal consequences of so this is something that we have to worry about. You know, if things do go wrong, you know, 90% of the time you'll probably get away, maybe even more. But uh, it's just from the trainees' perspective, uh, you do, we don't want them to be doing it, you know, your level of expertise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Definitely different. agree. <laughs> right. Uh, coming, coming back to, again, to Divesh, um, there's two questions from the same person, Pratik has again asked, they said, in shoulder arthroscopic capsule relief, capsular release, uh, surgeon wants to check axillary nerve function immediately after the surgery. What are the analgesic block options can be used apart from multimodal analgesia? And how much lower concentration of rapivacant can be used, which provides only sensory blockade? And modus function is preserved. So two, I think, questions no. which are almost. Uh, if you want, that. yeah, gone. Yeah. See, uh, <clears throat> if you're using for analgesia, we use only 0.2 percent propivacaine or 0.125 percent dupivacaine. Mm -hmm. So that should not affect the motor function. And in case if you want, you are using for uh, the like if you want to assess into entire complete uh, completion, then I think a pen shoulder uh, would be a better option because this would disrupt only the articular branches and the motor branches are given off much more proximally to the deltoid by the axillary nerve in comparison to the articular branches. But uh, sometimes uh, we are given uh, just 10 ml, 6 to 10 ml, 0.2% rupivacaine intrascalene and we sometimes do get weakness in the shoulders. So, uh, if you want to test immediately postoperatively, the best option would be a pain shoulder. That's what I feel. Yeah. Have uh, you tried a continuous catheter, sir, interscaling for shoulder surgeries? No, we had just actually discussed, discussed that uh, previously, uh, the issues with uh, the catheters, but uh, I think. So there are there are issues. I think it's for if you want to use for intraoperatively, fine, that's okay. But I think uh, leaving them for post op, uh, especially if it is in the and it's attached to a continuous infusion, even slight movement can dislodge it. That's one thing. And there's uh, talked about a case uh, from US where the you know catheter had you know, gone around the root and it got a worse when they were taking out. So those kind of things you have to keep in mind. But people, I think, still use it for some of the surgeries. <clears throat> uh, coming, coming to, I think, the arthroscopic procedures, uh, the combination of uh, doing a, a, the classical uh, suprascapular nerve block for posterior, because that's where you get quite a lot of pain from, and intraarticular injection of a local anesthetic uh, can also be used uh, yes. as a combination uh, without actually having to give... I think that question comes from the your thing about when you want to avoid uh, interscaling. Uh, so, what is described in literature is using uh, suprascapular and uh, axillary uh, block for these surgeries, uh, shoulder surgeries. Um, well, I I don't know. I mean, why why the um, axillary nerve function? Yes. When you when the other nerves are there, you're looking at the spine. I don't know what specifically, why axillary? Is it is it that it is uh, injured? No, that arthroscopic surgery unknown now is nowhere. Sorry, axillary nerve is nowhere to be doing. But I can understand if they're doing something around the uh, replacement and stuff like that. that's okay. But arthroscopic yeah. surgeries, you hardly get any nerve injuries uh, unless they have been <laughs> pulling and pushing, which they don't do much. So I don't don't think that is much of an issue. Sir, uh, sorry for the interruption. Apologies. We will start the next session, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you.
the next presentation is uh, by dr shiv and i dr shiv doesn't need any introduction in this uh, forum uh, but from the thing he's presently consultant in anesthesia in the university hospital liverpool is chairman of theaters and anesthesia he's also specialty audit and improvement lead and he's mm -hmm. also the regional anesthesia lead his main special interests include regional anesthesia trauma and vascular anesthesia education and training audit and improvement uh, today shiv will be talking to us about incision and approaches to abdominal surgeries use of regional anesthesia as part of uh, mma <clears throat> over to you shiv Uh, thank you, Som and Anil, for organizing uh, this workshop. Uh, so as already <clears throat> mentioned that I'm talking about incision and approaches, it's uh, quite a large area, but what I'm going to do is uh, give more of a principles uh, used uh, rather than actually talk about in individually about each incision and each approach of abdominal surgeries. So uh, uh, this is the outline of the lecture. <clears throat> this is about uh, how you classify abdominal surgeries. And when you talk about abdominal and thoracic surgeries, you need to talk about somatic and visceral pain. And uh, for that reason, we will talk about a bit about multimodal analgesia, uh, which is part of the lecture, and uh, management of somatic pain, because that is the most important pain which you need to control. So if you look at the abdominal surgeries, they can be classified into open surgeries, which are basically laparotomies of some extent with various incisions. And then it's a minimally invasive surgery, laparoscopic, and more recently, robotic surgeries. Now the ports for most of these surgeries, uh, that is laparoscopic robotic, are similar. So if you know the port sites, which areas uh, they are put in, uh, you can then uh, provide appropriate blocks. So when <clears throat> we talk about abdominal surgery, uh, the pain uh, is visceral and somatic both. Now, visceral pain is, is usually uh, you know, poorly localized. It is a uh, vague kind of pain. And it is uh, more related to uh, where the embryological origin of the organ is. So if you look at the foregut, it is more in the epigastric area, mid-gut is mostly around the umbilicus, and hindgut is usually on the lower part of the abdomen. Whereas if you look at the abdominal surgery, somatic pain can arise from two things. One is which is very obvious to us, which is because of the cutting of the muscles, uh, which is the surgical incision. But later on, it can also be from the inflamed viscera, which is in contact with the parietal pure, uh, peritoneum. And when we look at the uh, visceral pain, it arises. You can actually take out the gut uh, from an incision, cut it in front of the patient, he's not going to feel pain. So cutting is not going to cause pain. One second, guys. Uh, okay, sorry about that. So it, the pain occurs from distension, which is again, very common uh, after abdominal surgery, ileus. It can happen from ischemia, which can be because of the, uh, you know, the gut uh, not being properly positioned, or it could be from any of the ischemic events uh, because of the, uh, you know, uh, mesenteric embolization or thrombus formation. But the commonest thing is inflammation, which will happen uh, because the patient has undergone a surgery. So inflammation, taking care of the inflammation is a very, very important part of multimodal analgesia uh, for prevention pain. And these are not, uh, this is not that the somatic pain and visceral pain, there is integration of the somatic uh, and visceral pain. Uh, so this happens uh, at the spinal level. So there is integration, somatic visceral um, integration happens. And the um, visceral uh, C fiber uh, are involved in visceral pain and these are polymodal, uh, they are chemoreceptors, that's why they are affected by the inflammation and they're low threshold. And that's why they're vague and uh, they cannot be localized. Whereas the somatic are A delta and C fibers. So visceral pain, you need to take care of with the multimodal analgesia. <clears throat> so simple things like 
giving IV paracetamol, which is uh, common, uh, using uh, the uh, you know anti uh, non steroidals uh, anti inflammatories uh, and dexamethasone, which is also useful for preventing nausea and vomiting, uh, prolongs the duration of analgesia. Excellent thing. So use it at the beginning of the surgery itself. Diclofenac, uh, ketorolac, or other non steroidals, you need to be careful, uh, especially in the elderly and in patients who have uh, you know deranged renal function. Uh, be careful with that, but they can also be used uh, if there are no issues uh, with those functions. If you're not using blocks and uh, not using much, uh, lidocaine uh, itself as infusion not, not only gives pain relief, uh, but it is also considered to be anti-inflammatory. And it's very common for a lot of surgeries where they have people use a bolus dose followed by infusion over 24 to 48 hours, um, and uh, it's useful. Uh, magnesium sulfate is also another common uh, part of multimodal analgesia and uh, can be used. Also provides stability at the uh, cellular membrane. So it's, it's got a cell stabilizing uh, function. Uh, so very important part of the uh, multimodal analgesia. But the commonest one are opioids. Okay, You cannot avoid opioids uh, if you want to provide visceral pain at uh, the you know, you want to treat the visceral pain. So opioids still remain the uh, cornerstone for uh, managing this pain. So coming to the somatic pain, this is something which we can deal with. Uh, and uh, if you look at the uh, pain, it again, like I said, will depend on the kind of surgery, open surgeries, uh, or whether it's robotic and laparoscopic surgeries. These surgeries uh, like laparoscopic robotic are considered to be minimally invasive because these are got small port incisions. They're not much of uh, tissue trauma. And they are considered for early recovery after surgery. So ERAS, as part of ERAS, uh, these surgeries actually do better than uh, patients who have open surgeries. But still, you can still use, use the, uh, you know, your nerve blocks. And... Uh, in patients who are having open surgeries, you need to know what the incision is. So you need to speak to the surgeon and uh, find out how the incision, is it going to be a full laparotomy from uh, the zippy to the pubic symphysis, or is it going to be upper midline extended, lower uh, paramedian, um, is it uh, for you know, Rutherford, whatever kind of you need to uh, know what the incision is, what are the dermatomes, uh, what are the myotomes involved here. Coming to the pain management in, in patients' uh, abdominal surgery, I think uh, the epidural still remain the gold standard, which will take care of not only the uh, somatic pain, but also they take care of the visceral pain. So if uh, you can get epidural going, uh, there's nothing like it. A good working epidural provides the best analgesia for abdominal surgery, or we can say it's thoracic abdominal surgeries. Uh, a combination of local anesthetic with the opioids is the commonest uh, solutions used. Uh, it's usually 0.1 to 5% uh, bupivacaine along with 2 microgram per ml of fentanyl is the commonest uh, solution used for the epidural infusions. The second commonest, uh, at least in UK, is use of the uh, you know, spinal opioids. So even if you're not able to give epidural, sometimes patients are more than happy to uh, have a single shot spinal anesthesia. And for that, I'm not talking about segmental spinal, I'm talking about just use of uh, spinal opiates. And in our setup, diamorphine, around 400 to 500 micrograms of diamorphine is a commonly used adjunct. So we use a single shot of diamorphine. This is uh, prepared by our pharmacy. Uh, we mix it with two, one to two mLs of the uh, your heavy uh, bupivacaine or uh, liver bupivacaine, plain liver bupivacaine, and uh, use that intrathecal injection. It provides you analgesia for approximately 12 hours. Yeah, it's pretty in intense analgesia, so that's the commonest one. But in certain cases, um, the patient might refuse to have epidural or spinal, and in those cases, then we can actually like, look at nerve blocks. Uh, and these are specific to the incision and to the port site. 
Now, those who are actually on Medicis Gas app, there is uh, the book and that is loss of resistance uh, or no blocks for the masses. Uh, that booklet has got a specific blocks um, for various incisions, but we can discuss that uh, along with that. And <clears throat> as we were discussing this morning, there is huge amount of, you know, everybody giving a name to a block. And uh, they, people are getting a bit uh, concerned. <laughs> There's so many names and where do you block and what do you kind of block? So the, uh, initially, uh, if you look at it, all started with tab blocks and rectus sheet blocks. More so the classical uh, tab block and the, uh, uh, you know, um, the classical just loss of rate was loss of resistance block, which is uh, described and it had a good spread. Uh, and then came ultrasound and everybody started doing uh, tab blocks using ultrasound. And then they found there were a lot of sparing uh, because using the classical uh, area where that is the uh, you know triangle of petit uh, which was used uh, using local anesthetic there usually ended blocking the lower segments we were missing out on the upper segments like the area t6 t10 and then they said oh no we can actually do uh, 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 sort of uh, bi level so we do injection at the lower end, the classical end, and one do under the uh, costal margin. So this is called BD tap, uh, or four quadrant tap, as some uh, describe it. And then there was posterior tap. Um, <laughs> you know, all kind of tap blocks at all levels have actually been described. And then people started moving a little bit back. They started talking about cordatus lumbarum block. Then there is also a block where, uh, which is described by Peter Hebert called subcostal tap, where you start from the ziffy, follow the costal margin, keep injecting local anesthetic uh, under the rectus sheath. And then as the uh, transverse abdominis come, you inject local anesthetic in the transverse abdominis plane. So that is uh, so many ways. And then more recently, uh, there have been uh, blocks uh, where it's given at the thoracic level in the anterior axillary line between sixth and seventh rib under the external oblique uh, muscle, okay, which I'll talk about a little bit because that's a very recent uh, kind of discussions on them. And I'm not going to talk too much about the deeper blocks like cordatus lumbar block, which probably will be discussed later on uh, uh, during the uh, other sessions. And there is again, so many different kind of uh, cordatus lumbar, anterior, uh, posterior uh, cordatus lumbar, and transmuscular cordatus lumbar. And the extent of the local anesthetic spread uh, differs uh, uh, depending on uh, who's described it and uh, which group has described it. And then there is universal block, which we talked about, um, uh, which can also be used um, because uh, you can give it at thoracic level and T6 to T10, uh, even T12 and L1 can be covered uh, by the uh, erector spina block. So looking at the common incision, the abdominal incision, midline incisions, um, whether if it is a upper midline or it's a uh, lower paramedian or it's a full incision, laparotomy incision from the uh, zip sternum to the pubis, you're looking at segments from T6 to L1. The upper part of the incision uh, can be blocked using uh, rectus sheath, erector spinal block, uh, block under the subcostal margin, Whereas the lower part, uh, that is T12, L1, uh, can be blocked uh, by a posterior tap or cordatus lumbarum block. Okay. So those uh, can be used uh, for treatment of the somatic pain arising from the surgical incisions. Then there are some specialized uh, uh, incisions, like for example, you have the right subcostal or cocker's incision, uh, which is used in open uh, cholestectomies. So if you have patients who are going to open cholestectomy, you can use subcostal tap where you go as described by Peter Hubbard uh, from the ziffy sternum uh, onwards, follow the costal margin, uh, keep injecting. So you will end up, basically it is nothing but a combination of uh, a rectus sheath block and a uh, tap block under the costal margin. So you can do it separately or you can continue with that. It requires greater skill if you're doing as what Peter Hubbard has described. But if you're looking at like the incisions for the appendectomies, uh, like uh, Gridion or Lance incisions or Rutherford Morris incisions, 
you can use posterior tap. Okay, so you don't even have to get patient on the side. Uh, you can just follow the internal oblique muscle uh, posteriorly and uh, uh, inject local anesthetic where it tapers down. Uh, so that's posterior tap, or if you are fond of cordatus lumbarum block, you can use uh, cordatus lumbar block. For patients who are having, uh, uh, you know, cesarean section like fennel tail incisions, uh, which is normally L1, L2 uh, area, you can use bilateral tap, but then it's important that you do the tap and very close to the iliac crest on both sides. Or you can do specifically do iliunguinal iliohepigastric nerve blocks on both sides. Those gives a better analgesia than that. Now, some surgeries, like when you are doing upper GI surgeries, might have a thoracic abdominal incision, uh, which involves uh, going through the uh, ribs. They might even resect the ribs, and incision extends into the upper abdomen. In those cases, you can use, uh, you know, thoracic parietal block. You can use erector spinal block depending on uh, you know what segments are involved, and then that is the other block which was I'm going to talk about, which is very useful for the uh, you know the uh, rooftop incision or gables incision or Mercedes Benz incision, uh, which is just a combination of the gable or the rooftop incision going up to the zip sternum, uh, mostly used for uh, pancreatectomy surgeries. Uh, so these, these blocks um, have recently been uh, uh, described. As I'll come to that in a minute. And before that, uh, when you're looking at the um, robotic surgeries or uh, laparoscopic surgeries, you're only looking at uh, you know, areas uh, which, where the uh, ports are going to go into. So if you look at uh, the, um, your uh, common, uh, you know, like uh, lap cholestectomy, you have a port which is more near to the umbilicus, so giving a paraumbilical rectus sheath block, and um, you know block. Then we have a port near the zip sternum and two ports which are more lateral uh, on the right side. So uh, doing a rectus sheath block in the zip sternum, uh, zip sternal area, and putting a tap block on the right side just below the costal margin. Most of the times, uh, do that. Other people do the four quadrant, so they don't distinguish, so they just go and put a tab block uh, above the iliacs in the mid axillary line and uh, just below the costal margin on either side, uh, below the costal margin in the mid axillary line. Whereas if you're doing a lower GI surgery where the ports are, actually they are coming above the umbilicus, so they are in the umbilicus and above the umbilicus because they need to look down into the pelvis. Uh, in those cases, again, paraumbilical blocks and uh, looking at the uh, ports, uh, uh, you need to uh, give tap block just below the uh, your subcostal margin. So superior tap blocks and uh, paraumbilical blocks can actually help. Uh, so look at the ports, speak to the surgeon, know where they are going to put the ports, and mark them down, look at their uh, you know dermatomal levels and and do the blocks accordingly. So they're very specific block. Same thing holds for the, whether it's a robotic surgery, again, <clears throat> where the main ports are going to be. Uh, most of the times they are at the umbilical level and above the umbilicus. So most of the ports in the robotic surgery are from this area. So some of the new blocks which we were talking about, the understanding of how the nerves actually uh, you know, traverse uh, these various planes is actually changing. And there's a lot more, uh, you know, understanding of that. And this is something which is uh, very new. And this also explains why sometimes when we do a proximal block, and then we still need to uh, do infiltration on the medial side. So I'm not talking about a thoracic area. I'm talking about abdominal area, but if you look at it classically, we describe the nerve coming out <clears throat> below the uh, your transversalis fascia, pierces the transversalis fascia, then the nerve follow the your transverse abdominus plane, and that's how we actually have been thinking about that. But recently, it has been seen that that may not be true. That the nerve uh, comes out, and there are branches which are 
going uh, between the internal oblique and transverse abdominis, external oblique and uh, the internal oblique uh, from early on, and there's a cutaneous nerves as well, uh, which supplies a little part of that. So if you're going to go and deposit local anesthetic, say for example, an anterior axillary or mid-axillary line in between the internal oblique, external oblique, you may not get complete analgesia, anything that you actually have, have failed. So this is much you know, recent advances in looking at how the nerves more travel. So there are a lot of variation, and this is what the more you know, alternative view to how the nerve travel in this plane. So same is true for the, uh, your, uh, the thoracic area. And that's why you might uh, give a erector spinal block uh, in the thoracic area uh, for the breast surgery and still get uh, pain from the anterior, uh, from the midline, okay, on the medial side. And that's why people have been injecting local anesthetic under that as well. And that explains it all. You say, why are we having pain when we have already injected local anesthetic proximally? So better understanding of that. So this is, this is uh, what um, uh, we were talking uh, about. This is the classical approach. And uh, the block I'm talking about, which is uh, slightly new, uh, though it was described in 2019, is called the external oblique intercostal plane block, and has been discussed in our uh, in a meeting and in on our group. So this block will actually cover your. You have to go into the anterior axillary line uh, from the top. You start looking at the external oblique muscle uh, between the sixth and seventh rib and inject local anesthetic there. And that is the area on the blue, which is, is in the point D, uh, which is described, that covers it quite a lot. So T6 to T10, that area is well uh, covered. So if you want to do it for upper abdominal surgeries, uh, for uh, Mercedes Benz incision or rooftop incision, uh, this might be a good block to actually give. Also, you can put in catheters. You can put catheters in here, and this will allow you to have catheters away from the surgical site. And this is the dye studies in the uh, in a cadavers. And you've seen that so the, the local anesthetic is injected at T6, T7 levels, but it tends to go and uh, you know uh, bathe the T6, T7, and till T10. So up to T6 to T10. So anything above the umbilicus, it's a good. Uh, area to be blocked. The other things which have been used quite recently, I won't say recently, but this has been going for a while, which is becoming a lot more topical, at least in our uh, center, is, is rectus sheath catheters by the surgeons. So the surgeons will put these catheters on both sides. It's got special connectors, then you can connect them together and put them on infusion of six to eight mLs per hour. In some cases where the incision is upper abdominal, it works, but most patients will require a PCA. Like I said, you cannot take away the visceral pain with blocks. So patients are now on two infusions. So they are on an infusion for the rectus sheath, as well as actually got the PCA attached to them. So the patient is actually now, you know, tied down to the bed with this infusion pumps. <clears throat> so we will, any questions, I will take it, but. I would like to summarize that uh, for any abdominal, thoracic abdominal surgery, you have to really think of visceral pain. So your blocks are only taking care of the somatic pain. But if you want to have both somatic and visceral pain relief, then epidural and spinal opiates do work well. Uh, whereas the facial pain blocks will only take care of your somatic pain. Visceral pain, you need to use multimodal analgesia from the very beginning. And when looking at blocks, somatic uh, blocks, you need to look at the, uh, you know, what is the site of incision or the port site where you need to give blocks. So you need to actually be specific for uh, your area of the block. And don't forget to prescribe multimodal analgesia for post-op, um, which should include not only the usual simple analgesics, but also rescue op opioids or, or uh, PCA uh, or morphine or Oxynorm or whatever you use. Thank you. Yeah. I'll take the questions, I think. Yeah. I think it would be better off discussing rather than actually me going into very, very specific thing area, but I've tried uh, to cover it overall. 
Yes. Uh, 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 we have used external oblique intercostal facial pain block. It's a new block as you described. Yeah. And for subcostal incisions, we are getting pretty good results. Yeah. And in one case, we have inserted a catheter also. Yeah. So it is working pretty well. And as you showed the cadaveric dissection, it will yes. certainly take care of the lateral cutaneous branches. Yes. So I wanted to know your view, uh, whether it will take care of the anterior cutaneous branches also, so that it obviates the need of a rectus sheath in case of a midline, or it is exclusively a subcostal incision block. It's like, what is your thought on it? No, it should, because if you look at, at the, uh, the way the nerve travels, it's the same nerves, which are actually then uh, you know, piercing and becoming the anticutaneous nerves as well. Okay. So they should actually not require. So that was, I think, the greatest advantage of the EOI block was that it will cover the uh, T6 to T10 very well. And I think the greatest advantage is that there is only one muscle to pierce through. Yes. And it just on the right. I think that's it. It's not like your tap block where you have three muscles and <clears throat> you try. And having the rib as a background I think prevents you to go anywhere else. Yes. So I think that that's I think the greatest advantage of the yeah, EOI block uh, for the uh, upper abdominal. Uh, great, in, uh, great for uh, the um, you know Mercedes Mercedes Benz incision or Benz, yes. incision, uh, mm -hmm. for that. So I think it'd be better than the uh, the tap uh, sorry uh, rectal sheath catheters. Uh, so we have used for uh, people surgery where Mercedes Benz is given. And yeah. coagulation was not good, so we decided to go for this bilateral external oblique intercostal. Easy to give, and we had good results, so it's yeah. quite satisfying. Yeah, yeah. I think that's you... one block which actually I think uh, will make a lot of di difference. And also, I must say that <clears throat> if you got obese patients, that area. In even in very big patient is very easily seen and very it's superficial <laughs> like it's only one muscle there uh, easily seen uh, and easily felt so even in obese patients you can actually use these catheters or or blocks uh, or a single shot uh, blocks yes, sir. and uh, may I add sir Anil yep. here yeah, yeah. Uh, we have seen a uh, few of the surgeons uh, uh, hesitant uh, to allows to uh, give blocks for the, especially for the plastic surgeries, hernioplasties and all. So we have started utilizing uh, intrathecal morphine for them and uh, the results are quite excellent. And uh, only, uh, probably the only issue is the urinary retention, but with a dose of 100 microgram intrathecal, we haven't seen much of uh, urinary retention and uh, patients are quite comfortable. I didn't want to actually go into details of the complications with intrathecal morphine, but that is a complex, com uh, the commonest complication or side effect of intrathecal morphine is urinary retention. This is this is very true, and it is one thing which will trouble the patient. So if you have patient who suddenly start showing tachycardia <laughs> and hypertension uh, in the recovery, they have got no sensation of the bladder that is filling up. Uh, just scan the bladder or or tap the bladder at classical. If you put your ultrasound, you will just see it is huge. And just put a single thing and drain it. <clears throat> the effect of the uh, dimorphin uh, and morphine. Morphine is probably a lot more, slightly longer effect than dimorphin. Yeah, but the analgesia is intense. Uh, so excellent analgesia with uh, either of them. So what you can do in, in uh, these cases, uh, the, are the surgeons using infiltration with uh, local anesthetic in the end? Uh, yes, sir. They use infiltration at the port side. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. So you can, you can actually then uh, you know, ask them to use, uh, instead of using uh, low concentration or lignocaine with adrenaline, uh, to use... Uh, a 0.5 rope. Yeah, rope can be the user. And... Uh, uh, about the UI block, yeah. uh, can it be done as a landmark uh, based as well? Just you hit can, the rib band. You can, you can, you can absolutely. Uh, like I said, even in the even in the obese patient, uh, you can. So your nipple area is uh, the fourth rib. Just follow it. Uh, count down two. Go to the uh, TC, the sixth rib, uh, and the anterior axillary line. Go through the uh, tissues. You'll hit the rib. 
you can feel it. Like I said, even in obese patient, you can feel the rib go in, come out, hit the rib, uh, inject around 20, 30 mLs of local anesthetic on either side, it'll work. So questions, yeah. I have a question, Shit. Yes. Now, uh, you know, you did mention about the somatic and the visceral component of the pain. Right? Yes. Now, when you use any of these nerve blocks for say extensive incisions, say for example, the, the Mercedes Benz or, you know, how do you manage, uh, you know, you would expect the blocks to last for maybe 12, maybe 24 hours. Yeah. How do you manage the post-operative pain for the day two, day three, day four, you know, especially you want to mobilize these patients and, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, like, like you mentioned, we, we need to get the patients up and about uh, yeah. mobilizing as early as possible. So what do you do on day two, day three, day four for these patients? Yeah, <clears throat> so um, the, the absolutely it depends on what kind of uh, or the way the intraoperative analgesia has been provided. Right. So if you're using uh, the uh, spinal opioid and along with uh, blocks, what we have seen that even if you give PCA to the patient, the requirement is actually pretty low and you can manage with simple analgesics very easily. But if you're doing abdominal surgeries, the surgeons may not allow the patients to take orally. So that becomes a restriction. Yeah, for at least for the first 24 hours, they may not allow, though that's been changing. But they can, patients can actually have regular IV paracetamol. Uh, and we tend to use, once they come over the PCA, uh, they tend to go on oral opioids. Where the oral opioids like uh, oral morphine or oxycodone are not available, you can uh, use oral tramadol can be used equally with paracetamol, IV paracetamol or that. So our cases, most of these patients, ir irrespective of whether they have got catheters or got uh, uh, you know, intrathecal diamorphine, they actually have PCA morphine uh, prescribed for them. And then there's acute pain team, which will look after them. So that is the advantage of having patients on uh, the uh, PCA or any kind of infusion. They automatically get followed up by the uh, pain team, acute pain team. So they, they look at the transition from the IV opioids to oral opioids. So they look at it, they, you know, are we going to talk about how setting up of the acute pain team in that. They are very, very important part of, uh, you know, management of pain in these cases. You, uh, you know, just going down the line again for abdominal surgeries. Yeah. Say, say for example, do you have policies for when you, when you give patients intrathecal morphine or diamorphine, do you send them back to the ward? How do you monitor them? Uh, what Have you yeah. had any complications? <clears throat> so with, uh, uh, I think if you compare the diamorphine with the morphine, diamorphine is a lot more uh, lipophilic, tend to have earlier onset and uh, tend to uh, stay at the level where you have injected. Unlike morphine, which is slightly less lipophilic, which are supposed to actually have the uh, second peak where they can have <laughs> respiratory depression. The respiratory depression with diamorphine is very, very less. But still, any patient who has spinal opiates need to go to a, a kind of a, uh, you know, monitored area. So we have, so this is in between the HDU and the ward. We, we call them one and a half units. Okay. So these are, these are where the post-surgical patients are kept. So it's like a, uh, you know, the surgical HDU, uh, where there's not as extensive uh, monitoring as in HDU. So these are one and a half, these are called one and a half units. And the patients need to go to that specific unit. So if you don't have beds on them, we don't send them to the ward. We need to actually have them space. And since these are patients are major surgeries, uh, quite a few of them will likely end up on the HDU or uh, will, if they're not on HDU, then they go to this one and a half uh, unit. I think there are a few questions for yeah. you uh, yeah. in, in the group. Yeah. Uh, I'm from uh, Dr. Mehta. What will be your combination in spinal for laparoscopic surgery? Say combination for uh, what? Mehta. What will your combination is spinal for laparoscopic surgeries? I don't do 
uh, laparoscopic surgeries under spinal anesthesia. So I'm not the right person to answer. I think that. we'll just wait for Naresh to uh, yeah, respond to that. Dr. Paliwal will be answering that question in the afternoon, later on in the afternoon. This another another yeah. question from Dr. Chalwal. Do we perform bilateral UI block for supra blicolate surgeries? Absolutely. You have to do the bilateral. One side is not going to cover uh, the abdomen. You need to, it's a bilateral uh, blocks for abdominal. But for example, if you have a subcostal incision for say, uh, you know, open cholestectomy, then yes, unilateral. But if the incision is extending to both sides and you need to block both sides, so it's very logical uh, kind of <laughs> explanation. You can't just expect the local anesthetic to go to the other side. The they're, not next, nice. they're not jumping. <laughs> the next is a request for you to post a video of this block on this. Yeah, YouTube. we will do that. I'll do that. Uh, the other question is, does EOI block cover both visceral and somatic components of pain? I've already explained this is just a somatic block. Mm -hmm. None of the abdominal blocks are visceral, will cover visceral pain. Maybe, maybe, maybe in the erector spinal block because it does uh, diffuse uh, through the costal transverse foramen to the parietal area. Maybe there might be some amount of erectors. So, if you are proximal near to the uh, spine, yes. But as you move away from spine, you're not going to get any visceral, uh, you know, pain relief from these blocks. These are just somatic blocks. You need to cover with multimodal analgesia, and that was the whole idea of this lecture. There's another question, I think, from Jamie. Yes, there's another very interesting question. I wonder how he came up with this, or he's just made it up just to, to complicate things. So, oh, tell me. Uh, we... A patient who's having abdominoplasty and a long midline insertion up to the ZP sternum for laparotomy, both these insertions for the same patient, and GA is contraindicated. Yeah, so what do they want to do? <laughs> they can give spinal or epidural, isn't it? That would be the answer to it. But if you're talking, if you're talking about, if you're talking about actually giving uh, the abdominal blocks for them, then like I said, these are only um, uh, somatic blocks. And uh, in abdominal plasty, um, you are actually looking at, uh, you know, mobilizing the abdomen, taking out fat. So these are actually more extensive blocks. If you need to actually go for, then you are actually going to go for four quadrant blocks. But they're not going to give you. Unless your, your surgeon is, is super quick, one thing. Other thing is that you will be restricted by the volume. So even if I wanted to give, say, four quadrant blocks, I would be restricted by using 0.25% uh, bipurcan, liver bipurcan. You're not going to get that kind of uh, thing. So in, those, in these kind of cases, the best option for you is either your, what uh, Dr. Naresh Paliwal is going to talk about, the uh, segmental spinal, or better even is, is a combined spinal and epidural. That would be the answer to them. You cannot do these kind of blocks uh, just with, uh, you know, uh, facial pain blocks or abdominal blocks. It's, it's going to be impossible to do them. Is she logged in? No. So I think Dr. Kala is having some challenges with logging in. Yeah. Uh, so if any of the faculty have any questions for Dr. Shiv, we just try to do it. And uh, the other thing, maybe she's not here yet. Uh, I think uh, Kala on the. Uh... No, she's not. So yeah. she's having some issues with logging in. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think if Dr. Kala is not able to join, can Dr. Thiru and. Dr. Yeah, Anil absolutely. Can... I think that that's what let's let's move on and get, um, I think, Thiru and uh, Anil to do their uh, lecture on the lower limb blocks. So I think we have covered the upper limb, uh, we covered the abdominal, and then I'm moving on to the lower limb. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Shiv. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tirnavakarsu, for uh, volunteering to participate in the FARA. So Dr. Thiru is a senior consultant in anesthesia and pain management in uh, our neighboring hospital, Sparshupa Specialty Hospital in Bangalore. His areas of interest include regional anesthesia, cardiac anesthesia, chronic and cancer pain. Today, he, uh, along with Dr. Anil, will be talking about RA for lower limb surgeries and arthroplasties. Uh, 
briefly introduce Dr. Anil as well. Dr. Anil is my colleague. He's our consultant in anesthesia and critical care at Prakriya Hospitals. Again, areas of interest, regional anesthesia, orthopedic anesthesia. He does critical care ultrasound and difficult airway. So along with Dr. Thiru, they will be covering the, the bigger topic of regional anesthesia for low limb below the knee surgeries. Uh, Dr. Thiru, I'll hand over to you, please. Thiru, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. And um, thank you, Farah, for the opportunity uh, for the presentation. Thanks, Anil. Uh, Stay. we'll move on to the... So. Can you get my screen, sir? Anil, are you? Are, yes, yes, we are. Yes. Yes. Uh, lower limb blocks and the and analgesia for the arthroplasties. Uh, that is what the topic. And uh, I'm Dr. Thiru. Um, I'm doing uh, analgesia for more than two decades. And when we started, we started without the uh, ultrasounds and um, uh, even the nerve stimulators. So most of the time, lower limb blocks, we will be more concerned, uh, we will be uh, do with the popliteal and uh, ankle blocks. And because uh, one of the uh, thing is that uh, our spinal and epidurals, they are giving an excellent uh, relief and it's doing good. So the nerve blocks in the lower limbs are uh, not that uh, in those days. And the anesthesia for lower limb surgeries, you can GA regional and uh, GA plus regionals. And we can now there is a, we are adding on to that uh, local infiltration anesthesia by the surgeons and the nerve blocks. Anyway, is, these are all the things we already discussed in the morning. They told the advantages of the uh, regional anesthesia, the opiate sparing, early mobility, and uh, reduce the complications, all these things. And ultrasound dead blocks, this is also already spoken in the morning, proper uh, probe and ergonomics, anatomy knowledge, uh, which told uh, Divesh uh, told that uh, how good an anatomy knowledge, how it helps in the our uh, uh, blocks. And principles of ultrasound, one thing that is the uh, one new to us, uh, uh, <clears throat> as a, um, too much uh, time in there. And uh, now the ultrasound, getting used to the ultrasound is a little bit of, uh, challenge for us uh, because when we are anatomy based and we are uh, gone with the peripheral nerve blocks, uh, sorry, uh, nerve stimulated techniques, when we are coming to the ultrasound, it's using the ultrasound and it's it's not that uh, easy. It's, uh, it's a literally a challenging what I faced uh, in the past uh, when, when I started doing the ultrasounds. And lower limb blocks, uh, lumbar plexus, and sacral plexus, which are the two important plexus are there in the uh, for, uh, supplying the lower limb, and with the femoral nerve operator and lateral uh, femoral cutaneous and the sciatic are the four important nerves coming out and entirely taking over the lower limb. The lower limb blocks <coughs> uh, here. There is a lumbar plexus and sacral plexus. Uh, there are, uh, I think, Dr. Shukmar. Uh, then the previous presentations here, they presented uh, quite a good about lumbar plexus and sacral plexus blocks. And um, I, I personally don't have much experience in the lumbar plexus and uh, sacral plexus because there is a whenever we have to go with the plexus blocks, uh, the spine, uh, intrathecal and spinal and epidural are very close. So we just can. Yeah. And there is a lower limb blocks. We are more, uh, in this talk, I may mainly concerned about the sciatic, femoral nerve, and lateral cutaneous nerve only. Operator also uh, not covering in this particular talk because the, uh, for the lower limb arthroplasty surgeries, the operator work is little minimal. And uh, yes, sir. For uh, before going into the talk, there is a little bit about the anatomy and <coughs> anatomy of the. Oh, what we are taking a uh, care it's a lumbar sacral plexus which is innervating the lower extremity it divides into four femoral lateral cutaneous and uh, operator and sciatic and uh, lumbar plexus which is um, yeah uh, 
this is ileo hypogastric ileo inguinal uh, genito femoral which are less important to our uh, concern lateral femoral cutaneous now which is a uh, uh, one of the important which is taking care of the lateral part of the thigh and the if there is any hip surgery is the entry point which is covered by the uh, lateral femoral cutaneous now and femoral now which is covering the medial part of the thigh and the operate uh, sorry it's a anterior part of the thigh and the obturator which is covering the medial part of the thigh sacral plexus it's a from l4 to s4 uh, mainly the sciatic which is from the l4 to s3 which is coming into the uh, two divisions of uh, sciatic which is joining it's uh, even in the up, upper part it's uh, it's there as a two parts only the tibial and the common peroneal in the cut section of the uh, in the cut section uh, of the pelvis we can see that this is a femoral head and ischial tuberosity and this is a sartorius rectus femoris muscle and just lateral to the sartorius we are seeing the lateral femoral cutaneous this is the cut section below the inguinal uh, inguinal ligament and we can see here it's a this one this this type of un, uh, understanding about the anatomy which will help for us when we are uh, doing the blocks even the ultrasound guided or the uh, nose stimulator guided this will give a very good idea about that <coughs> and uh, in this side we can see that uh, it's a femoral head in the femoral head these three red things are all the now roots which are covering there this uh, anterior medial which is uh, covered by the obturator and there is an anterior is by the uh, femoral nerve and posterior is by the sciatic nerve. And this is a femoral nerve, this is a femoral vessels, this is the obturator, two branches of obturators are coming. This is the adductors, ischial tuberosity, and the grass, ischial tuberosity and greater trochanter in between. We are seeing the sciatic nerve underneath the gluteus maximus. So for, first, I'll talk about the no blocks, uh, so sciatic no block. I'll tell we are uh, sciatic no, which we'll be very rarely using it for the um, uh, hip arthroplasties. Uh, still, so analgesia is sciatic now, which is giving analgesia of the posterior thigh, and begin. And this is an uh, in the posterior approach. If you are seeing. Uh, Sciatic, sciatic now if there is a gluteus maximus here where we how we can approach that this is a nerve and when ultrasound guided the ultrasound probe which is uh, this is an ultrasound probe we are keeping it in the posterior this is in the posterior approach and the posterior the sciatic now which we can see between the ischial tuberosity and greater trochanter and we can um, block it in the in plane technique there is the only thing is we have to use a curvilinear probe, uh, low frequency curvilinear probe is required because of that depth is quite good and it's five centimeters more, five centimeters, six centimeters more, more and linear probe uh, will find it's difficult with that. This is a small video of um, sciatic nerve block. This is in the subgluteal area. This is the gluteus maximus and this is a sciatic now. Once the, uh, uh, yeah. This is the epineurium. Uh, epineurium, it's uh, outside the sheath. We are uh, given the block, and we can see the donating of the shading now very nicely. And which was flat, flat uh, in the previous slide, this picture. And now we can see that it's a rounded one. And the when it's we are seeing it's rounded. That's that means the drug is covered all around, and that is in the given in the subcluteal region. When we are doing it, we can just spread it. Uh, we just move it. Uh, move the probe above and this is a gluteal area uh, we can see that this is a greater trochanter and this is a ischial tuberosity gluteus maximus this is a gluteus maximus and this is a sciatic nerve uh, uh, 
and chiatic nerve which can approach to anteriorly also when there is a when most of the time the hip fractures uh, fracture neck of femurs the patient cannot be uh, turned to the sides lateral for giving the chiatic nerve blocks and then we can use it for a anterior approach uh, this is a chiatic nerve femur and we can come from the lateral towards here this is a uh, femoral vessels we have to come lateral from there and here again we have to use a um, curvilinear probe we have to use it and there is the one problem is that uh, because it's crossing many structures and uh, vessels so single shot is okay and using a catheter is probably difficult one so from here i'll just move on to the anesthesia for thr uh, hip arthroplasties hip, hip arthroplasties subarachnoid blockade and the epidural are the golden standards uh, when we started when we started uh, when i started uh, when i started in uh, 2000 uh, anesthesia for the hip arthroplasties sub, uh, is that is the one and if there is post operative pain epidural is a mainstay but now the um, uh, once we are adding uh, additives into the uh, sub uh, intrathecal uh, local anesthetics, the epidural is almost fade away from the THR, uh, unless there is a very particular concern about the patient's requirement or something like that, only the epidural is coming, otherwise the epidural is uh, uh, really uh, phased out in that. And there is a, when we cannot use a neuroaxial blockade, then we will go with a GA. This is what the Thing. and uh, anyway it's a regional is a better one than ga in all the studies so far now recently the what are the things added is the uh, nerve blocks nerve blocks um, where they are uh, giving uh, importance now is the uh, one is a post operative pain relief we, we all know that post operative pain after the, the spinal wearing out the nerve blocks will give you help but this, uh, in the hip surgeries, most of the time, the hips, the, uh, THRs and uh, uh, hemiarthroplasties, the patients will be coming with a fractured neck of femur. When the patient is with a fractured neck of femur, positioning the patient for a spinal or uh, epidural, the regional uh, neuroaxial blockade, that is a big challenge. They will be with tremendous pain. And uh, uh, when, when I started, there, we used to give uh, ketamines and uh, even sometimes we had to give GA for because the patients cannot position themselves. So, uh, portion uh, for our uh, axial blockades. So, but now uh, the recent times are when we are using the nerve blocks on arrival, blo uh, I think morning uh, Dr. Sai, uh, Sai Janani, she told that uh, on arrival blocks, she's doing it for the uh, fracture neck of femur, uh, facial neck of blocks and all. Uh, these are the things which are really a boon. And, uh, they are on arrivals and uh, when the patients are coming, uh, we are not doing it on arrival. Uh, once the orthopedician see the patient and uh, patient is admitted, before patient is going to the ward, we are uh, giving the blocks. Uh, because the patient will be there in the same bed. Uh, we will not mobilize the patient from one bed to the uh, uh, not from uh, mobilized from bed to bed uh, from after admission because uh, morning there was a discussion there that uh, after uh, given the block patients are uh, going uh, against medical advice to the some other hospital uh, for the these things uh, the next proceedings the surgeons are complaining because we also gone through all these things then we decided that okay fine once the patient is decided and they their plan for an admission when they got admitted from the ER to the ward between intervening the patient to the OT pre-op area and we'll give the blocks and, and the other is uh, uh, good for everybody. Uh, all the concerns are covered there. Uh, maybe, may not be, uh, we are uh, right in the way that we are not leaving the pain in the first end, but still, uh, it's that's one. And what we are doing here is a, a facial air cup block or the femoral plus la lateral femoral cutaneous nerve block below the inguinal level, we are doing it. And the new addition is the PENG block. Uh, PENG block, uh, I personally, I don't have uh, experience on the PENG block, uh, but that's a recent ad uh, addition into that. And we, we, in the over the uh, other few years, we will be getting uh, more and more experiences and papers on the PENG block and we will find uh, how good it is. And this is a facial iliac block. <coughs> uh, 
this is a uh, as dr shiv kumar said this is a first block on arrival is because it's a very very easy one and the very standard anatomy and there is not much of a change in there you just palpate the anterior superior iliac spine uh, medial and caudal uh, one inch medial one inch caudal you just put the needle straight straight you will be i think yeah you put the needle straight you will be uh, on the second pop this is what we uh, traditional teaching you just go uh, perpendicular to the skin you just go in and after the second loss of resistance you will be reaching the uh, fascia you will be reaching this place fascia iliaca so once you are reaching in this place the drug what you are depositing is 20 30 ml what will happens it's spreading into the femoral nerve here and it will be coming to the lateral cutaneous nerve here so both the nerves are all covered here and it will be giving a very good um, very good analysis of the hip fractures and now the present uh, pink block is um, nothing much so we are seeing the same structures here and uh, instead of anterior superior iliac spine you just make it as anterior iliac uh, uh, sorry anterior inferior iliac spine anterior inferior iliac spine and this is a psoas tendon and you had to come to this place and you had to uh, press on the drag you just come from here to this area and deposit the drag which covers the um both the uh, which covers the, all the peripheral uh, uh, sorry all the nose nose groups for the hip joint capsules and everything is covered and and your facial iliac block if you are seeing that um, in the in the sagittal cuction uh, cut this is an anterior superior iliac spine the psoas muscle uh, i don't i will see you can see and anterior superior iliac spine medial and caudal this is a needle entry and go and deposit the drug the drug will be spreading here and here and and this area so femoral uh, femoral nerve will be femoral nerve will be coming here and it will be covered and the anterior oh, sorry so lateral femoral cutaneous nerve will be covered the same point of entry we come up to here we, this is the pain block you can see here that's uh, femoral uh, lateral femoral uh, cutaneous nerve femoral nerve and the obturator is coming medial to this that also can be covered most of the time and femoral now uh, femoral block which is a uh, below uh, inguinal also can spread but there is a one b one concern here is femoral uh, the lateral femoral cutaneous now which is coming here which cannot be covered here so if you are giving a below inguinal femoral nerve block or uh, uh, in the facial iliac sheet we have to cover the lateral femoral cutaneous now here and the just lateral to the sartorius that will give a good analgesic effect and, and most of the time is the uh, neck of femur patients will be coming out of our working area uh, working hours so uh, the next uh, probable day uh, it's in the next uh, uh, the morning we will be operating these patients so the nights will be covered very good with these two uh, these two blocks and the patients are very comfortable and most of the time if uh, late evenings uh, uh, we are giving the blocks next year morning they will be coming to the operation theater without much of pain and they will they are very comfortable with giving the position by chance if if the our blocks wear out on uh, in 10 to 12 hours time and then we repeat the block in our pre op area before taking the patient inside and then uh, by the time we take the patient in and position everything that 10 15 minutes they are giving a, it's giving very good analysis here for them for the fracture neck and they will give very good uh, they will be comfortable on the positioning for the spinals and we don't do uh, sole uh, nerve blocks for uh, arthroplasties by chance we have to uh, we the neuroaxial blockade is not in the plan and it's a general anesthesia is the plan then these are these nerve blocks will be giving it on before uh, after induction and they will be giving a post operative pain relief very good pain relief for uh, next 24 hours and femoral nerve block it's a uh, anterior aspect of a thigh knee medial aspect of the foot and ultra ultrasound probe below inguinal crease and look at femoral artery vein move laterally and look at now approach in the in plane technique so if you uh, there's a needle entry and it's uh, 
drug spread. Uh, drug spread, it's it's not necessarily it's going up. It can be down also. So down will be there. So the amount of drug which makes the sense. It's a matter. And let uh, femoral cutaneous now block sensory innervation to the lateral thigh. It's uh, for the femoral uh, femoral neck surgeries and myalgia say, paresthesia. It's more con uh, more. Uh, this is used more in the myalgia paresthesia with the pain pain concerns. And it's a pure nice sensory no, no motor block, uh, motor supply, and which is coming in the just later to the sartorius, and it will be sitting. It's uh, sometimes it's uh, with the ultrasound probe, it's identifying it's very difficult. We, once you give the hydro dissection, then we can see them uh, popping out very bright and nice. So, I uh, saw so these things. There's a high frequency linear probe will be used. Uh, Again, and, and this video it covers lateral femoral cutaneous now and femoral nerve block. So uh, first is the uh, femoral vein, femoral artery. Sorry, the femoral vein and artery, and so femoral nerve. This is femoral nerve. Yeah, this is the one. Then move the probe lateral from here, uh, the end of the sartorius, and this is a fatty uh, area next to the sartorius, and this more probably the lateral uh, femoral cutaneous now. And from there we move in, move in into the femoral. Yeah. One of the main concerns in the ultrasound guided nerve blocks is that we'll be seeing the nerve and we'll, our needle will be there. Uh, but the, the very important person is our assistant who is injecting. He is the one guide for us. Is the resistance is there or not? So that is giving a biggest clue for us. Are we intraneural or uh, we are in the outside then, uh, this thing, uh, within the sheath and outside the nerve roots? So, so that is a uh, one of the important catch and that is what uh, that i feel it's a important factor in avoiding the nerve injuries in the and uh, the post operative uh, complications for nerve injuries very much So the no supply of the hip joint is, uh, I'll told it's uh, anterior medial is with the operator and anterior is with the femoral nerve and posterior is with the uh, sciatic nerve. And uh, most of the time, these this uh, femoral and lateral cutaneous nerve blocks they are covering its good. And if you are giving a facial layer like block, there is some amount of operator also will cover this kind of uh, this amount of pain uh, area is covered. The sciatic uh, is a one record. We can position them for. Uh, Neuraxial blockade and give the uh, neuraxial blockade, and they'll be, the surgery will be good and can go ahead. And this is a pain block, this is a recent addition to our uh, lower limb blocks and uh, fracture uh, hip surgeries and hip arthroplasty surgeries, uh, which is common. Uh, this is an anti inferior leg spine, and uh, so this is a femoral artery. And, So, so there's a needle entry is anti uh, anti explained anti uh, uh, we are seeing that from here we just come into that and there is a below the psoas muscle there's the only thing concerned is the psoas tendon we are not supposed to injure this is again a curvilinear probe is required for this uh, this is a, it's a little more deeper than our uh, facial aircraft block I think from this point, the hip arthroplasties uh, we have done. So I think we will move on to the knee arthroplasty and surgeries and uh, no supply of uh, knee. It is a no supply of the knee. It's a, uh, this is a medial. 
this is medial and this is the lateral this is a left leg we can say and medial so superior medial uh, quadrant is supplied by the um, the nose to the vast medial is intermedius and uh, the genital branches which is covering and sorry it's a uh, and uh, lateral lateral superior lateral quadrant which uh, vast lateral is intermediate and genicular branches which is covering here and this is an anterior part which is covered by the uh, branches from the uh, femoral now and an inframedial quadrant from the uh, genicular branch from the infrapetalar branch from saphenous now which is a uh, saphenous which is a part of continuation of a femoral now and intralateral quadrant with is uh, from the um like a fibular now or common peroneal it's going that analysis of a tkr this is also it's a subarachnoid blockade is and the epidurals are the mainstay and they rule for most of the time and when they we cannot do them uh neuroaxial blockade then we will be go ahead with the, going with general analysis now the additions is a uh, now blocks um so the still now it's a even now it's a bilateral tkrs if both knees are uh, need to be operated we'll be going with the epidural and if there is a one knee or one leg operations then we will add on to add one nerve root uh, nerve block along with the subarachnoid block and which can avoid the opioid usage or um, additive in the into the subarachnoid blockade it, um, what normally we use for the subarachnoid blockade is the local anesthetic with morphine uh, which is giving a very good pain relief for nearly uh, 16 to 24 hours it's giving a very good pain relief but the problem is uh, itching number one itching number two vomiting and number three is the uh, urinary retention uh, we are using only 100 mics uh, morphine along with a 0.5 percent booby we can uh, 3 ml uh, uh, 3 ml or 3.5 ml but still they are giving a uh, they are giving a some as they can troublesome vomiting and troublesome um, uh, uh, concern about the urinary retention it was very uh, severe and sometimes sometimes so from there we moved on to the peripheral nerve blocks uh, and and then uh, so we started with the femoral but the femoral the problem what happens is the femoral which is giving a uh, blocking the uh, cord muscles which are on the uh, knee um, uh, flexions of the uh, flexions of the knee and the patients are very comfortable uh, they are comfortable but the uh, when they are doing a physio and when they are uh, uh, walking on the same day they are finding it a little bit there knee is giving way and they need a little more support for that so we just get down to the, from femoral to the adductor canal adductor canal the just below the sartorius when where there is a femoral artery it's dipping over that is a good landmark for us to uh, take care of the uh, 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 femoral the adductor canal block uh, you can go a little more below uh, which can cover the uh, obturator also but the concern is the surgical incision will be coming uh, in our uh, indian patients with a uh, uh, sharp thighs uh, the incision will be coming very close so we will be in, uh, sitting just below the sartorius and we will be uh, taking care of that and along with that uh, we uh, usually do with a local infiltration on the gcf for uh, the surgeons usually infiltrate on the uh, joint posterior capsules because these are all the now supply the what we are covered is uh, from the anterior part the posterior part the sciatic which is covering and which is giving supplying the uh, femoral condyle and uh, giving a branches genicular branches to the tibial condyles which we cannot cover it uh, with this ones so uh, what happens is our uh, we uh, started with our surgeons infiltrating and in the local infiltration on this year to the uh, posterior capsule which is giving a very good uh, effect on that but the concern is uh, what happens is the comfortability of the surgeon to give this infiltration number one and and his confidence of uh, giving it uh, what happens is that some surgeons they are not comfortable in giving uh, very close to the vessel uh, their concern is uh, 
if by chance by mistake they can be they're doing it blindly uh, so they are worried about puncturing on the vessel there is a hematoma complications so they will be a little bit away from there and it's it's not giving a good analgesic effect on that so what happens is uh, uh, we use ipac for um, i i have for the knee uh, surgeries in the pre op uh, time only will pre op will be giving ipac and uh, so the uh, last year we did a study on um, ipac versus uh, lia in the total knee replacement surgeries um, uh, along with the along with femoral and acb uh, post operative analgesics with the acb catheter uh, what we found is the first 24 hours the ipac is giving a um, better pain relief uh, marginally marginally better pain relief than the lia uh, after 20, uh, 24 hours it's uh, the outcome of uh, after 24 hours pain score and the uh, mo- uh, this immobilization and the discharge criteria the nothing is changing because anyway the ipac or lia whatever we are uh, infiltrating it's a local anesthetic which will be working for the maximum of 24 hours uh, beyond that we cannot expect any much of a work and genicular uh, nerve blocks which, which we can give it uh, very close to the uh, bone uh, with a genicular branch of vessels we can identify with ultrasound uh, guided and we can uh, give this there is a only uh, one concern is if there is anybody is trying with the genicular block for the uh, knee surgeries uh, give it supralateral supramedial intramedial it's good when you are going to the intralateral be careful careful there is a your uh, common peroneal now and uh, will be coming there you just make sure that you are not hurting this this is a adductor uh, adductor canal anatomy there is a this is a femur bone this is a, the adductors of the thigh gracilis and this is a femoral vessels femoral vessels this is a uh, sufiness no and from here we can address the sciatic also if required and but there is only concern is we have to use a curvilinear probe and it will be in deep this is an ipac ipac uh, ipac we are giving means we will be giving uh, in the beginning of the surgery after the spinal uh, we will position the patient uh, uh, before the tunicae we will be uh, with the ultrasound Uh, we will be seeing uh, the thigh is uh, abducted and laterally rotated and we will be putting the ultrasound probe in the from medially we will put the ultrasound probe and we can see that where we can see both the condyles uh, middle condyle uh, sorry lateral condyle and medial condyle will be at, uh, from here will be needle will be coming from medial so middle condyle and lateral condyle and vessels and we will be putting the uh, we will be uh, sending the needle of uh, uh 10 cm spinal needle or the uh stimuplex needle from here and go up up to the vessel or little uh over there and we'll infiltrating on the posterior capsule this is a adductor canal block this is a femoral artery this is arterius the vessel is dipping uh Yeah, dipping from there this is a saphenous nerve uh, no we can see that better yeah this is a, this is a drug spread and this is a very good place for putting the adductor catheter also the catheter will uh, very rarely it will be moving away or uh, moving away fairly stained place and doing a good work there the same sorry and the recent evidence review uh, for anesthesia for thr and uh, thr and Co- cochrane review anesthesia for thr what they say is uh, Uh, 90 day uh, ga versus regional anesthesia 90 day mortality it's a very low evidence to the 
resonance is it resonance better on the uh, mortality pneumonia perioperative mi cva acute infection state and dvt and return to their home and cost effectiveness cost effectiveness this is a big question mark here this is all these things are the very low evidence uh, comparing with the ga or ra and that's so it's uh, done with the multiple uh, methods of uh, ga plus uh, uh, ga plus local infiltration ga plus no blocks ga plain ga and regional anesthesia uh, plus no blocks or uh, plus uh, lia like that they consider the cost effectiveness yes we all think that it's a cost effectiveness is the regional is uh, much less than the ga because of the uh, polypharmacy and uh, drugs intubation gas and everything but there is a what they uh, the present study is if you where you are giving the block that makes sense because if you are giving the block in the perioperative area where there is a ot uh, hours is a uh, time for the cost for the uh, ot time is not calculated then it is uh, cost effective otherwise this is not much effective on the cost effective if you are considering the ot hours including into that and uh, ga versus uh, regional for tkr definitely it's a regional is a good one and so and there is a this also it's a very low evidence on this there is uh, evidence review on this about tkr uh, it's taken from that and uh, anyway contraindication these are all the things in already discussed in the morning and the equipment uh, equipment this will be uh, as we are giving for any ultrasound guided nerve blocks the same thing for the equipment wise and complications the same for any other nerve blocks and thank you all for the patient listening thank you til sir uh, that's a elaborate lecture you had uh, so i'll be continuing the uh, belloni surgeries so i'm going to share my presentation hope it is visible yeah so i'm going to continue part 2 of the lower limb uh, surgeries so i'm i'll be talking mainly about the popliteal sciatic and the ankle block so i'll be dealing the popliteal sciatic under the following headings so very important to know that uh, anatomy of the popliteal, popliteal nerve, uh, sciatic nerve at the popliteal area is quite variable the sciatic nerve is a combination of two nerves above the popliteal crease uh, that is the tibial and a common peroneal nerve so, uh, the common peroneal nerve runs inferior laterally uh, and uh, 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 tibial nerve will continue inferior medially. Uh, there is no interconnection between these two nerves, so both of these nerves are individual nerves within a common sheet. So division of the sciatic nerve takes place anywhere with, between 7 to 15 centimeter above the popliteal crease. So uh, to, for a successful block, LA has to be given just before it divides into tibial and the common peroneal nerve. So this is the block distribution. As you can see, except for a thin rim on the medial aspect of the leg below the knee, most of the uh, leg can be anesthetized using a popliteal sciatic nerve block. A uh, word about the paraneural sheath. I would encourage everyone to go through this wonderful article uh, by Dr. Karma Karital, which stresses a point about the paraneural sheath. So what exactly is the paraneural sheath? So as you come from uh, outside to inside, there is a common uh, sheet which encloses both the components of the sciatic nerve. The, uh, this sheet is called as the common paraneural sheet. And uh, for a successful block, we need to deposit the local anesthetic in the subparaneural compartment. Uh, mind you, if we <clears throat> do deposit the block, uh, the LA in the sub uh, in the perineural compartment, the block can still be effective, but the duration on the onset of the block will be delayed. So for an effective and a quick and a long lasting uh, block, we have to deposit the LA in the subparaneural compartment. These are the various commonly used approaches for uh, giving the popliteal sciatic block, the lateral approach, the prone approach, anterior lateral, as well as the anterior medial approach. The needling can be done in either of these ways. The in-plane lateral approach is what I usually prefer. There, we can also use out-of-plane approach. This is useful in uh, uh, for catheter insertion, and we can also uh, utilize the in-plane medial approach for giving this block. 
So uh, ergonomics is very important. So what I usually practice is an in-plane lateral approach. I keep my patient in the lateral uh, position with the side to be blocked uh, on the upper side. Uh, the ultrasound machine is facing the operator and it is quite a uh, uh, easy block to give. Before proceeding uh, the block, the pre-block scan is a must. We first need to uh, keep the linear transducer probe in the popliteal crease. And this is uh, the structure what we get on the ultrasound. Uh, let's uh, uh, label all these structures. Um, uh, here at this uh, area, the sciatic nerve is already divided into two components, the common peroneal, the common para, uh, <coughs> sorry, the common fibular nerve, which is lying laterally, and the tibial nerve, which is lying medially. There are uh, deep vessels, which are uh, uh, important to note, the pulsating, uh, uh, the popliteal artery, and one or multiple, uh, sorry, uh, the popliteal veins can be visible. Biceps lies laterally and the membranous, membranous and the semitendinosus lies medially. So this is the pre-block scan. When we start at the popliteal crease, we can see both these nerves. And when I go proximally, they, do, uh, they form a single sciatic nerve. This is an ideal place to give a block, all right? And most importantly, we should have a note. Uh, we should note that there are deeper vessels here See, this is uh, compressible. So obviously this is the popliteal vein and this is the popliteal artery, right? So this is the block ergonomics as described previously. Uh, I use the in-plane uh, needling. My uh, insertion point is around three to four centimeters away from the probe. After skin disinfection, uh, this is my insertion point. I go perpendicular to the probe uh, and uh, once you go perpendicular to the probe, uh, we can see that the needle is directly going towards the sciatic nerve. So you can see that the needle is going directly towards the sciatic nerve. Once I get a small pop-off, that is the puncture of the common paraneural sheet on aspiration and uh, after uh, making sure there is not uh, uh, enough resistance on giving the LA, I give around 10 to 12 cent, uh, cc of LA above and below the uh, nerve. So I was referring to this structure as the common perineural sheath. So what is important, also important is the patient will not have pain while giving the injection. Uh, if there is a pain while giving the injection, you may be in the intraneural compartment, and that is when you should be careful and we should withdraw the needle. So after the block is given, we need to uh, do a scan to make sure that the drug has spread uh, adequately. So you can see that the LA is in the subparaneural compartment. And uh, I, when I scan distally, uh, the sciatic nerve divides in the common peroneal and the tibial nerve, and some amount of LA can still be appreciated around the individual nerves. Okay. So LA of choice for analgesia, I use around 20 to 30 mils of 0.25% ropiacin with additive. So for surgical anesthesia, we can utilize 0.375 concentration of propiacin with additive. Tips, as I told you, the puncture point has to be according to the depth of the sciatic nerve on the ultrasound screen. For example, here we can see that the sciatic nerve lies around three to three and a half centimeter away uh, in, in, at the depth of three to three and a half centimeter. That is why my needle entry point is around three to three and a half centimeter away from the probe and in the perpendicular direction. Uh, there are a few disadvantages because of the involvement of the common peroneal nerve, there is a foot drop and that is why the patient has uh, difficulty in mobilizing. And because of uh, extensive block, there, uh, if the heel is not protected, there is a risk of pressure injury. That is why we should make sure there is enough padding and the patient has to be notified about the possible injury if he's uh, not been uh, well informed. So next is the ankle block. 
uh, ankle block, we have to block these five nerves. I'll be talking about them individually. The advantage of an ankle block is uh, we can use it for foot and ankle surgeries below the malleoli. Obviously, there will be no foot drop and thus the patient can ambulate. Uh, there, it is relatively quick to perform. It is suitable for bilateral surgery and it can be utilized for uh, DK surgeries. The only limitation being the tunicate application. Uh, though we can actually apply a tunicate just above the ankle, and the, as uh, Dr. Shiv mentioned uh, in the morning, the patient can withstand up to 60 minutes of tunicate application. So this is the preparation of the block. As you can see, this uh, uh, the uh, ultrasound machine is facing the operator. The operator has to be sitting on the foot and side of the patient, and the link, uh, the ultrasound has to be on the same side where we are giving the block. Suppose. Uh, for example, here we are giving the right side block. So the ultrasound machine has to be on the right side of the patient. I use a small pillow or a small bolster under the cap so that it is easier for me to allow some needling for uh, giving the block. First is always the tibial nerve because this is the biggest of all the nerves. Uh, each of the ankle block uh, nerves has a landmark. So we should uh, make sure we follow these important landmarks. The tibial nerve has uh, multiple branches uh, at the ankle and uh, it, uh, it supplies most of the sole of the foot. The uh, important landmark for the tibial nerve is the medial malleolus. Behind the medial malleolus, malleolus there are posterior tibial vessels and the tibial nerve is just as adjacent to these vessels. When we keep an ultrasound probe just behind, uh, above and uh, behind the medial malleolus, this is the ultrasound picture which we get. Let us label each of the structures. The superficial structure is the medial retinaculum, and uh, there are uh, vascular pulsating structures here. These are the posterior tibial vessels. Uh, we can see a triangular structure just beside these vessels. Usually the tibial nerve is enclosed within this uh, triangular structure. And this is obviously the medial malleolus. For giving uh, this block, I usually prefer an out of plane uh, technique. Uh, we can uh, also use uh, in plane technique, but it is very difficult uh, because to get the needle from behind, we may need to turn the patient slightly uh, uh, laterally. So I most of the times utilize the uh, out of plane approach and my needle entry point is uh, uh, targeting this triangular plane. Uh, next comes the saphenous nerve. Saphenous nerve, as I said, uh, covers most of the uh, thin medial aspect of the leg uh, be below and uh, an important landmark for identifying the saphenous nerve is the great saphenous vein, which lies above the medial malleolus. Uh, sometimes it is very difficult to identify the saphenous, uh, I mean the saphenous nerve. Uh, so when we keep an ultrasound probe just over the medial malleolus, we can easily identify the greater saphenous vein, which is a compressible uh, structure. We have to apply a very gentle pressure on the probe. Uh, the anatomy of the saphenous nerve uh, varies uh, high. Uh, has a variable anatomy, it can lie on either side of the great saphenous vein. So to give, uh, to give a successful saphenous nerve block, uh, what I usually do is uh, after identify, identifying the great saphenous vein, I do an in-plane needling and I give a local anesthetic around two to three mils on either side of the great saphenous vein. So this is to make sure you don't miss uh, the uh, saphenous nerve variable <clears throat> variations. So deposit the LA on either side of the GSV. Next, coming to the deep peroneal nerve, uh, it supplies the first, inter, uh, first web space and the most important landmark being the anterior tibial artery in front of the tibia. So we place the probe above the ankle uh, just uh, uh, above the uh, uh, pulsation of the dorsal spidus artery. And uh, we, uh, this is the structure which we see on the ultrasound. Uh, as we can see on the ultrasound, there is a pulsating artery here. We have to make sure uh, the tibia uh, lands on uh, in our picture because this will help in minimizing uh, the depth. And uh, in Almost 90 to 95 percent of the patients, the deep peroneal nerve will lie lateral to the 
lateral to the uh, anterior tibial artery. You can see here also that there is a small vein here. So we should uh, make sure we don't apply a lot of pressure by uh, giving this block. You can uh, give out of plane as well as in plane. What I usually do is an in plane technique. Next is the sural nerve. Sural nerve has a small strip uh, uh, supplying the lateral aspect of the ankle and uh, little, uh, the small toe. The important landmark for sural nerve is the small saponous vein, which lies uh, in front of the Achilles tendon and behind the lateral malleolus. We have to place this probe, place the probe behind the lateral malleolus. And we, this is the ultrasound picture what we get. Uh, we can obviously identify the small saponous vein, which is easily compressible. And uh, we will identify other structures here. This is the Achilles tendon. And uh, what is important is the sural nerve will lie within this hemoclic structure. And this is classically called as a hammock sign. So uh, we can give the block on either side of the uh, small saponous vein. Uh, I, as long as we deposit the LA within this hammock, the sural nerve will be blocked. We can utilize both the outer plane as well as an in plane needling. Then coming to the last nerve, the superficial peroneal nerve, which has uh, quite an extensive dorsal uh, aspect of uh, uh, the foot is uh, cutaneous nerve supply. Most important landmark to identify for the superficial peroneal nerve is the intramuscular septum, and it, it lies within the investing fascia, also called as the choral fascia. We keep the probe uh, above where we gave the sural nerve, slightly above, and uh, we can identify this kind of uh, ultrasound picture. Let's label each of the structure. Uh, we can see this is the fibula and there are two important uh, uh, compartments here. This is the lateral compartment. This is the anterior compartment. There is an intramuscular septum lying between these two compartments and there is a thin fascia. The superficial peroneal nerve lies within this thin fascia. Okay, this is a small scanning video. The fibula looks like a shark fin line appearance and this is the intramuscular septum. This small, uh, uh, the superficial peroneal nerve lies within this crural fascia. So for uh, needling, we can do, uh, it is easier to use uh, in-plane needling. Out of plane will be difficult because it is quite a superficial structure. You may actually end up uh, injuring the nerve. LA of choice, I use around, uh, we, uh, we can utilize 0.5% ropiacin or ropiacin. We have to give around 4 to 5 ml for tibial nerve. And for the smaller nerves, we can give around 2 to 3 ml. Troubleshooting, uh, this is common for all the blocks. Uh, if there is a vascular puncture, we should uh, readjust the needle. We should not, we should aspirate before giving the local anesthesia for any kind of blood. Obviously, if there is a symptom of LH toxicity, we should stop and follow the last protocol. Next is if there is a resistance, we draw until the resistance reduces. If there is a swelling or if there is a pain on injection, we should, the needle may be intramural. If there is a failed block, we should consider the alternatives. These are my references. Thank you. So if there are uh, any questions, Yeah, um, I think I'll start with Anil itself. I think, um, yes, Anil, you were talking about um, the ankle block. Yes. You know, posterior tibial, yes, you're very right. That's the one of the commonest, uh, no, or the most important now. And when we're doing ultrasound, you can do something called figure of four. Yes. So if you want to come from beyond, you can actually do that. So you just take the leg and fold it over the other leg, and then you can yeah. come from behind. So you can yes. use that if you're uh, finding it. Uh, but you can actually come. It's not that difficult to even come from the, yes, you will actually, or hit the bone, you can you can still do it from the, uh, you know, anteriorly as well. Yes. Uh, it's a bit tricky, but you can do it. Yes, sir. Thank you. And saphenous nerve is actually, you have to uh, deposit local anesthetic because it's a smaller branches. It's not like a single branch there. It starts divide into number of branches so better to deposit local anesthetic around it all around it yeah yeah i think the lecture by thiru there are too too many things in that and i can't see any any question being asked but 
if other faculty have got anything to say, Divesh, Som, or anybody has to mm. say. Yeah. I have, I have a question for Dr. Thiru. Uh, yeah. Like you said for knee replacements, adductor canal, LIA, IPAC. So uh, do we actually need a IPAC if uh, adductor canal we are giving around 20 mLs? The drug will, through the adductor hiatus, automatically reach the popliteal plexus. So is it required? Uh, actually, it's an adductor canal we are not giving in the pre-op. We are giving in the post-operatively for the uh, this thing. Infusions only we are keeping. We will not keep uh, 20 ml uh, like that. Um, so immediately after uh, uh, the surgery, once they, uh, by the time the surgery is over, they will be coming out of the spinal effect. We are not adding uh, additives into the intrathecal. Plain spinal only we will be using. So. Most of the time when they are coming out, either the LIA or the IPAC, if it is not there, the patients are coming, uh, coming out with the posterior pain and the, uh, the lateral uh, tibial pain. Uh, it's, a, it's a very common and last one patient, uh, the, that, that's, that's where the surgeon's help is uh, very much. So if the surgeon is very good in giving the LIA, we are not having this problem. Uh, the last time, uh, once the surgeon is a little bit hesitant to go there, then uh, the po yes yes to uh, show yeah. no, no, it's fine you continue I was just I'll yeah it once you're done yeah yeah the then last uh, one patient we we have to go ahead and give a uh, uh, give an epidural in the patient in the next next day um, for the, because of this pain is not controllable with uh, ACB so I think the first one for us if we are not giving the adequate relief with the uh, the posterior capsule. Uh, they'll be hit you in the next day. Yes, sir. It's for you. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, so there are two things. Uh, yeah, please. One thing yeah. is that uh, what Devesh asking about the, uh, you know, IPAC, he obviously can't give IPAC uh, post-surgery because it's already chopped up. Yeah, chopped up. The second thing is that the, uh, just let me, yeah, and yeah. the adductor canal block, uh, it, 20 ml, no, very small amount actually would seep through. Um, I mean, the studies which have shown, yes, there is, but there isn't a great amount of uh, the local anesthetic, which is consistently uh, seen to actually reach that area. So adductor canal works uh, in situations where you have already, you know, uh, the patient is, uh, the case is done under spinal anesthesia. Uh, you use adductor canal. And you ask the surgeon to concentrate on posterior capsule when they do the infiltration. That works really well. But in the GA cases, you will see that adductor canal on its own is not going to work. Yeah, people have actually looked at blocking. I mean, I do multiple blocks. When I have to have a GA patient, I will get them comfortable without any opiates, but I use multiple blocks. It's not a single block which will have work. Divesh. In, in my practice, so uh, adductor canal, we give 20 ml and then we put in a catheter. So we never had a complaint of posterior pain. And 50% of the surgeons inject LIA, 50% do not do. Yeah. So, and I reviewed the literature. I found an article in British Journal of Anesthesia around 2013 or 14, where they stated that the ED95 volume to completely fill the adductor canal is around 20 ml. So I am of the belief that certain amount will definitely must yeah. be seeping in my case to popliteal plexus. I am not faced this issue, but majority of the people I interact, they definitely tell me like Dr. Thiru is telling me, they definitely face this issue. Maybe I'm using a good volume at that too in the middle of the adductor canal. That is why it is working well for me. And if I use less than like 10 mLs and more in the proximal part, then definitely I think I'll also have to need IPAC. Uh, that is my uh, thought process on this. Yeah, uh, that is what the same thing during the presentation also I told that uh, because our Indian population the thigh is uh, not that long so the uh, adductor canal where we are attempting maybe a little higher for uh, us to give uh, the, that may be one of the reason our volume is not adequate uh, adequate one and second thing is that I will not uh, we don't pray, uh, give this twenty ml single bolus we will give five ml of local and keep the infusions. So that may be a concern uh, 
for that my is working for me i just fill yeah, the fine. canal first 20 ml then start around 4 to 6 ml immediately in the post operative period mm-hmm. i think yeah. that is working for me maybe and yeah, that, what is yeah. your take on uh, do we need a genicular block uh, uh, like these days people are doing adapters no. with uh, ipac and geniculars all single shot they do not place any catheters do we actually need geniculars geniculars they are using it for the uh, in our hospital also one unit they are u- using it for the uh, same day mobilization see you do the surgery and the patient needs to be walk in the same day then they are using it and uh, it's giving a help otherwise we are uh, not that aggressive on the mobilization on the first day uh, we don't practice that one uh, dr shiv yeah so um, with the adductor canal when you're talking about that uh, divesh uh, i actually told about this long term you can go back to i think 2012 or 13 uh, when i discussed about about the adductor canal block because that's when we had done some work on acls and we found it useful. So it does actually seep into uh, the, uh, you know, near the tibial. Um, so that is known. And I think uh, it's a group from um, Toronto, I think, uh, the Kari. Uh, they actually done work on that, injecting with dye. And they saw dye around the, uh, you know, tibial uh, when they did an adductor canal block. So there is evidence of that. Uh, you know, so volume, uh, we'll do it. Yeah, uh, so there's different things the way you do it. If you are actually look, you're talking about like whether you give genicular nerve blocks, um, uh, adductor canal blocks, and things. So there is two things. One thing is that you then have to say that okay, fine. Uh, we tell the surgeon, don't worry about Leah. Let me sort it out. I'll do everything for you. Okay, in that case, you need to be, you know, very specific what you do. I actually end up actually doing like five or six blocks for the patients. Uh, with smaller volumes and it works excellent but if you are going to use combination of that you have to be mindful of the local anesthetic so if you use 20 mls and more for adductor canal then how much you'll allow the surgeons to use uh, for the uh, local infiltration so you need to be mindful because they in, they're injecting local anesthetic into a very raw area absorption can be actually pretty high in that so just be mindful of that also, uh, if I may add, the surgeons use all kind of uh, cocktails while giving it. Well, we we yeah. moved to completely like I've just recently, I think I put it on Twitter as well. When Jeff Gerson was talking about it, I said, we have just moved to completely just, uh, you know, liver bipic and nothing else. So 1.25%, the 0.125% is that's all we use uh, uh, for, for that. And uh, like I said, it will work if you have given anesthesia with uh, spinal epidural, but it won't work if you're using GA. Yeah. Share my experience. Anything else? Yeah, sorry. Yes, for Sandra. Yeah. Sandra, you wanted to say something? Oh, I'm, I am, I, I have to publish. Yeah. yeah. So for the past seven years, can you hear me? Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. 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 So, so I am sitting on some huge, huge amount of data. Hmm. Seven years. I have, with your connection, uh... I have been doing knee replacement surgeries only under some problem with the audio. Yeah. Can you hear me now? What you do, switch off your video just and then you probably will hear you. Just just uh, switch okay. off your video. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. So I am sitting on some huge amount of data. For the past seven years, I have been doing knee replacements totally under block, only under block with some sedation, IV sedation. Okay. It all started with a patient, a very obese patient who had undergone pituitary adenoma surgery. Uh, long back, she had chronic recurrent CSF leak for which she had multiple spine surgeries, lumbar uh, shunts, placements so, and she also had OSA hmm. obstructive sleep apnea. So she came for knee replacement surgery. So she didn't want GA first thing because she was afraid of OSA and she was uh, she absolutely refused for GA. 
Next thing is spinal epidural was ruled out because she had some shunt catheter in the spinal canal for recurrent CSF leak. Okay. So we thought of other options. We thought, why can't we do under block? So we gave femoral block at the time. I was not much experienced in ultrasound guided block. So we did that under PNS, nerve stimulator guided block. Femoral nerve block I gave 0.25% BPV gain with uh, around 10 ml. Then sciatic nerve block. Sciatic nerve, I didn't turn the patient. I usually put uh, in a lithotomy position, Raj's technique. So ipsilateral knee uh, bent in a lithotomy position, subgluteal approach, I put sciatic block. We look for only twitch, hamstring twitch. When foot twitch comes, we avoid giving drug there. Only when there is hamstring twitch without any foot uh, twitch, we give block there. Again, I gave 10 ml of 0.25% BP again. Then we did the surgery. Surgery was totally successful. Patient, I gave just a little bit of fentanyl and midazolam, and we, we didn't give any much of sedation. The only problem that the time we had was prolonged uh, motor blockade of the foot. Okay, but since this patient was uh, exclusively uh, requesting for uh, this kind of uh, surgery, we accepted that. Then surgeon asked me, this worked out very well. Why can't we try? My surgeon is a very nice surgeon. Why can't we try few more surgeries per block? and see how it works. Can you modify the drug and uh, show me you know, so that patient can move the foot immediately after surgery. So we started experimenting with so initially Bupivacaine. Ropivacaine was not available at that time, seven, eight years back in our hospital. Then Ropivacaine came. So finally we started putting, frequently we are doing only the femoral block catheter and sciatic nerve block catheter. And in between, when ultrasound came, I tried using ultrasound, but the problem we had is with pure ultrasound, you always get motor blockade of the foot. Sometimes knee sparing occurs, foot, foot area becomes analgesic, but knee sparing occurs. So I combined the nerve stimulator along with ultrasound, only hamstring twitch you have to get. At that area, if you deposit drug, you require only small volume of drug, not more than 7 ml. If you give more than 7 ml, then there will be some motor block. Okay, so nowadays what we use is drug combination for surgery. First, I uh, we explain the patient pre-op itself, uh, what we are going to do that the uh, operated limb only will be uh, numb and heavy during the surgery. Okay, so we give 100 mics of fentanyl, uh, maximum one to uh, two mics of fentanyl per kg IV, start it with for sedation and uh, some one, M, one mg of midazolam. Then we start doing the ultrasound, uh, nerve stimulator guided block, femoral block, uh, we do, we ask, we see for the petalar twitch, petalar tap, deposit 0.125% bupivacaine mixed with 1% lignocaine. A combination like 5 ml of 0.25% uh, bupivacaine and 5 ml of 2% lignocaine mixed, which becomes half of concentration. You understand? So 10 ml we give of this solution for uh, uh, femoral block and place the catheter. For sciatic, same way, lithotomy position. Uh, give 10 ml of this solution, insert the catheter and leave it. Patient whole intraop will be on propofol infusion, mild propofol infusion with oxygen mask. We, we monitor the, uh, some for some patients we may put nasal airway, for some don't require nasal airway and we uh, monitor with uh, nasal yeast ETCO2 monitoring. Okay, so most of the time, like I won't say 100%, nine, at least 95 to 98% of the patients didn't require no more uh, than this 100 mics of fentanyl and midazolam and all had undergone the surgery pretty very well. Sometimes posterior capsule, when they are manipulating, so, uh, briefly some patients will have pain. They will slightly move or uh, uh, show a wince in their face. At the time, we give another 50 mics of fentanyl extra bolus. That's it. Nothing much. At, and uh, from my experience, I have seen at least this kind of block provides 80 to 90 percent complete block of the knee for, for knee replacement surgery. And immediately after stopping sedation, while they are just closing, closing the skin, we stop the propofol infusion. The patient full, is fully awake. Just after when they are doing the bandage for the knee, we ask the patient to move the foot. They show the movement of the foot. Surgeon is very happy. We are also very happy. And post op, we continue the uh, block infusions. The, and this infusion uh, drug also, uh, concentration also, we have titrated and found out that femoral 
0.15% of rupee again, just four, four to six ml, not more than six ml. If you are requiring more than six ml, then your block is away from the nerve site. Okay, just four to six ml per hour is sufficient enough for the patient. And they can do straight leg raising test with this amount of concentration, means their quadriceps power will be intact with this concentration. And for sciatic, even less concentration is required. They are requiring only 0.09% of rupee again, only two to four ml per hour. The four is maximum, only few patients I have used four ml per hour. 95% of the patients require just two ml of 0.09% rupee again, and they are absolutely pain-free. You will be surprised, like pain score is zero. This is Sisters, when they, we have a proper documentation in Apollo Hospital, so sisters, all their pain scoring will be 90, 95% will be zero post-op. And the additional, only additional drug we use for post-operative pain is only paracetamol because my surgeon doesn't like opioids post-op patient because most of them are elderly. No folies whatsoever. Even if it's bilateral, now he's asking for four catheters to be placed. He, patient are on portable, that, uh, portable infusion pumps. So it's like a small pouch. So they put it in their packet and walk. Okay. The only problem we have is even now, which I'm trying to, I don't know, I can't, I, I don't think I, I will be able to find the answer. That uh, position sense is not there. So for, my surgeon always uh, ambulates the patient immediately after surgery, like uh, four or five hours after surgery during the evening rounds. So what they do is, uh, just, due to this uh, loss of position sense, they put that uh, brace, knee brace knee brace and make them walk. So on the first day itself, evening by four o'clock, morning surgery usually starts at 5.30 a.m. here. All replacement starts at 5.30 a.m. So by 8, 8.30 a.m., patient surgery will be over. By 10 o'clock, they will be in the ward eating food. Evening four o'clock, they will physiotherapist along with physiotherapist, they come, they walk with the knee brace. Okay, even if it's bilateral, they put the knee brace and walk. This continuous infusion catheters stay in place for 48 hours and only paracetamol. Only few patients I have used uh, additional opioid in the uh, like uh, buprenorphine patch, five microgram uh, per hour patch. Otherwise, okay. most of them, even okay. if they're that's, that's fine, things. that's okay. Yeah, that's that's okay. We uh, heard your maximum uh, require uh, only a, a single shot bolus of five ml of the same nerve block solution. So I uh, at, at least three hundred to three fifty cases I have done till now. That's and that's a, a very very good degrees now. Yeah, that's a very good number. I think uh, you should publish it. For mm -hmm. how long do you wait before you actually allow I, the surgeon surgeon to at least uh, give the incision? So the surgeons take at least uh, half an hour to forty-five minutes for painting and draping. Okay, so, so you have got enough time. Get, I, yeah, the, I, I so I get adequate time. So if it's bilateral surgery, at least half an hour to forty-five minutes before they start the incision, I give on the other side. Start the uh, drug on the other side. Okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, Anil, I think uh, we carry on with the next lecture. Anil, you will have to unmute yourself. Sorry, am I audible now? Sorry. Okay, the next lecture is by Dr. Kala Ishwaran, one of the crowd favorites in the anesthetist group. She's a freelance anesthetist practicing in Mumbai. Her area of interest is airway, nerve blocks, and private practice. Our topic is surgeries of the perineum, regional anesthesia, and pain management. Over to you, ma'am. First of all, I will apologize for the delay. There was some technical problem with my laptop. Thanks, uh, Anil, for managing that. Uh, I thank uh, your team and uh, Global Anesthesia Society and Dr. Shiv for having me here on a FARA workshop showing landmark guided and PNS guided blocks. Thank you so much. Perianal blocks have been uh, my favorite. Uh, disclosures, none. Image and video credit goes to Google, Internet, Nysera, and also a few uh, videos from Dr. Dilip Singh Parmar. This is a photo and video consent form. In this era of many new blocks, USG-guided blocks, uh, 
gets neglected. I mean, in the era of USG guided blocks, the perianal blocks are neglected, and most cases are done under spinal and GA, and they are day care uh, surgeries. And believe me, the patient suffers so much post-op, and these blocks go a long way to help them, and they will thank you from the bottom of your heart. So let's get on to the anatomy. Anal canal innervation, the up to the sphincter and above, it's from the inferior hypogastric plexus. And the lower down, the somatic sensation is from the inferior rectal nerve, which arises from your pudendal nerve. Okay. So pudendal nerve arises from S234 and carries the sensation to the external genitalia, the lower rectum and the perineum. It courses through the ischiorectal fossa and the Alcox canal or the pudendal canal. Branches gives off the inferior rectal nerve, then the perineal nerve, the superficial and the deep branches, the posterior scrotal nerves and the dorsal nerve of the penis and to the clitoris, sharing close proximity to the ischial tuberosity here. It goes into the ischiorectal fossa here. Okay. So the sensory innervations include by the perineal nerve is the perineum, the lower buttocks here, the anus, and the genitalia anterior. You have to note that the very much anterior part is supplied to the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve. Medially, it is the obturator nerve and the outermost buttocks are from the inferior clunial nerves. So knowing the innervation, the indications include inorectal surgeries, that is hemorrhoids, most common surgeries, fissure, fistula, anterior perineal resections and anterior resections, the obstetric procedures like vaginal repairs, episiotomies, transrectal USG guided prostate biopsies, transurethral prostatectomies and catheter related discomfort. Contraindications include overlying skin infection, allergy to LA, uncooperative patient, patient refusal, and high fistula in ANO. Equipment. Actually, it's the right attitude to think with a needle and syringe filled with LA. That's all that is required for this block. But a 20cc syringe and a needle, that one and a half needle that comes along with it is enough. I use point. 75% ropivacaine. You can use 0.5% bupivacaine also, along with adjuvant dexamethasone. Position can be lithotomy or jackknife. Procedure includes two procedures, the two-point uh, two injection technique. This is mainly for post-op analgesia and four-point injection technique, which can, uh, the uh, can be used as a sole anesthetic agent also. Per vaginal or per rectal technique, this is an age-old technique. Pudendal nerve was, block was given by second stage of labor. The finger is inserted in the rectum or vagina and palpate the ischial spine. Okay. The needle entry point is just an inch or 2.5 centimeters posterior medial to your ischial tuberosity here. So the landmark is your ischial tuberosity. The needle is advanced lateral to the ischial tuberosity with a slight lateral tilt and it hits adds the ischial spine. You can feel the sacrospinous ligament near its insertion at this ischial spine. Advance around one centimeter medial and inferior to the ischial spine, you get a loss of resistance as the needle penetrates this ligament. Inject around three to five ml of LA here. Two point injection, this is mainly only for analgesia. Knowing that the ischial tuberosity is your landmark, okay, palpate the ischial tuberosity on either sides and at nine o'clock and three o'clock position, in line with the anus, around 1.52 centimeters lateral to it is your point of needle entry. Okay? Just medial to the ischial tuberosity, enter bank perpendicular, 
and you enter the ischial rectal fossa you need not hit the ischial to, uh, spine even if you deposit the drug in the ischial rectal fossa it gives adequate action though the volume required is more this is a small video of two point injection technique landmark guided that's the ischial tuberosity being palpated on either side and just as the ischial tuberosity dips in on the medial side in line with the anus I don't even blunt the needle because that causes more pain. Go bang perpendicular around 2.5 centimeters from the anus. So you can get the small give way. Aspirate and inject around 10 ml of the LA drug, 0.75% ropivacaine along with dexamethasone. This is for postoperative pain analgesia. This is ischial tuberosity. You can see the medial most margin around 2.5 centimeters lateral. Again, aspirate and inject. That's it. Just hardly takes around 30 seconds. Coming to the four point technique okay. used for anesthesia also, but the injection is quite gives quite discomfort. So you need to do it under deep sedation. Or also you can do it under spinal or general anesthesia. Draw a circle around the anus of around 2.5 centimeter radius. Mark the points at 2, 4, 8 and 10 o'clock positions using 1.5 inch needle, hypodermic needle that comes along with the 20 cc syringe. That's enough or you can use a thinner needle 23 or 24 gauge needle. Insert at two o'clock position to begin with. I'll show the video. I usually bend the needle. First, I I will I'll, I'll give the drug circumferential. I'll keep around four ml. Make a rhomboid shape uh, like uh, in, infiltration along one one centimeter each. That will be four centimeters. 4, M, uh, 4 ml, 4 ml at 2 o'clock position, 4 ml at 4 o'clock position, 4 ml at 8, and 4 ml at 10. Okay. So this patient is in jackknife position. Just 1 ml of infiltration along this line. I'll make a kite shape in infiltration along the anus. Each time I'm using only one ml. Then at two o'clock position, the needle is tilted literally in the lateral direction. Full length of the needle is inject uh, gone in. And at every one one centimeter of withdrawal, I'm injecting one ml of the LA mixture. That is four stops. See, 1 ml, withdraw 1 centimeter, then 1 ml, withdraw 1 centimeter and 1 ml, and then withdraw 1. So, 4 ml totally. So, the total comes to around 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4, that is 16. And infiltration, 4 ml, that is 20 ml of the total drug. This is at the 8 o'clock position. Okay. This gives adequate, adequate anesthesia for... Uh, any perianal surgeries and also gives long acting pain relief post operative. This video I borrowed from Dr. Dilip Singh Parmar. This is a using a PNS guided needle, 10 centimeter needle, 22 gauge, just medial to the ischiorectal spine. He's gone bang perpendicular. So you can see the perineal contractions. Current is lower to 0.4. Yes, still very good contractions. Excellent. And 10 ml of drug has been deposited here. Again, same. The finger is on the ischial tuberosity and just medial to it. Go bang perpendicular, hit the ischial spine, 
and you get very good contractions here. Okay, excellently appreciated. Current is reduced to 0.2. The current, the contractions disappear. And on increasing to 0.4, you can see the contractions again. And the drug is deposited here. This PNS guided pudendal block video. Again, medial to the ischial tuberosity, bank perpendicular. You enter the ischial rectal fossa, tilt laterally, it will hit the ischial spine and you will get contractions. This time, this is an episiotomy suturing and you get contractions around the vaginal area. See, much appreciated. And LA deposited after the contractions and works very well. Advantages include it's very easy, effective, prolonged post-operative analgesia, early ambulation, no post-operative nausea and vomiting, and no urinary retention. The post-op analgesia is so good that uh, I have had patients who, uh, who have to travel to Ireland and US after the abscess drainage and whom I have given this block and they have mailed me after traveling for 17 hours sitting on the plane that they are pain-free. Uh, it's so simple and mostly people do, do not uh, do neglect to give this block. Pearls include that successful pudendal nerve block will not affect the sensations in the anterior perineum, ineffective for cervical, upper vaginal vault and pain from uterine manipulations, sensations of clitoris and scrotum and penile base is lost. So patient has to be informed that they cannot... Uh, copulate or uh, uh, they will have problems with the sensations there. To conclude, compared to general anesthesia, neuroaxial anesthesia methods, perianal block gives high level of pain control with patients requiring low and or almost nil systemic analgesia. It's so simple that my staff give it on their own uh, when I am in a rush or I forget to give it. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Such a wonderful topic. Uh, I'm sure uh, the persons who have had uh, patient, the uh, anesthetists who have had uh, uh, patients uh, with the hemorrhoids, they'll have a lot of pain. So these kind of blocks will help uh, have a good analgesia for them. Uh, the patient uh, cannot convey for they get embarrassed to talk about this pain and they bear with this pain. So, uh, you know, uh, and it remains, uh, it can go into the chronic uh, persistent pain also. And exactly. the next time when they come, it's dreadful for them. They uh, easily, after this block, they easily allow uh, abscess uh, dressings postoperatively for three days also packs and all removed very uh, the patient is very hot and one question uh, i have seen a few instances where there is a stapler hemorrhoidectomy done whenever the pay, uh, surgeon applies the stapler right there is some degree of uh, uh, vasovagal maneuver happening uh, what uh, what are the few uh, things which uh, will help avoid this See, kind of things i think his uh, equipment that uh, head of the instrument goes beyond the dentate line. Yes. Yes. And uh, so the vasovagal comes from there, you know, the inferior hypogastric is not. So he has to use lots and lots of jelly uh, okay. when he is, uh, you know, uh, the recent colonoscopic resections of uh, CA, the you know, first stage CA, people do it under colonoscopy. Even during that, they get these vasovagal. So, uh, my surgeons, uh, they are done by the DM gastroenterol. So, they use copious amount of jelly and leave it for some time. 
there and then they do the perform the procedures sure sir you want to add uh, any more uh, dr divesh has five points yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but dr kala you said the uh, two point technique as well as a four point technique uh, if we are using general anesthesia and uh, for analgesia purpose two point technique two point technique is enough actually i do not use uh, only sole an, uh, an, an anesthesia technique i give it always along with uh, low dose spinal or uh, low uh, g in the sense with an sgd but uh, two point technique is the one which i frequently use even for perianal abscess two point anything, technique should anything. be okay yes yes unless the abscess is in the ischiorectal fossa so we drain initially nicely and then okay. we give the block so ultimately whether it be a two point technique or four point technique the needle is going into ischiorectal fossa yes am i correct or yeah not? in four point it may not enter the uh, issue means it goes into the ischiorectal fossa but it is more of okay. the circumferential infiltration okay so two point definitely it will, definitely. It will go into it gives wonderful i mean i have had more than 500 to 800 cases like this okay. so it, but in two point technique uh, it will block the uh, whole pudendal also no not exactly in, yes and if you want uh, exactly inferior rectal uh, then circumferential technique is oh, the drug takes care i give good volume no? 10 to 12 15 ml okay. the drug takes care of that okay thank you very much very nice presentation shiv sir you have any points to add or any questions uh, no i think it's a wonderful technique i think we also need to add to that that uh, if you're using perianal technique you can also use caudal block as well even in adults Uh, some people are still afraid to use caudal block in adults, but I think you can. And this this technique, I think, uh, uh, is one of the earliest uh, kind of uh, you know uh, or or landmark technique which we have described on the on the group. So it, uh, I think, way back in two thousand eleven or two thousand twelve, where this uh, technique of perianal block was described on the group, and it's it's a great technique. I think. still not much in the literature about it <clears throat> you can use uh, ultrasound guided epidural blocks it's known but for that the patient has to be positioned but this is simple again so that was very important a uh, very well presented color yeah so we we'll move on to the next lecture yeah uh, dr kala is going to continue okay that's that's fine yeah uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next lecture Uh, Dr. Kala is going to continue. Her uh, topic uh, will be neck surgeries, role of uh, regional anesthesia. Over to you, ma'am. And we have already crossed thousand thousand views. Thousand views on. Uh, YouTube, one K views. Well, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, just just a second. Share. Yeah, no problem. Yes. Once again, regional anesthesia for neck surgeries. Uh, thank you again for giving me uh, this topic. In between the USG guided blocks, this is again one of my very very favorite topic. And for this, I should thank my patients and my surgeons for placing so much of immense trust and faith on me. no disclosures image and video credit goes to google internet and nicerum photo and video consent form which we take from each patient
Now, surgeries like thyroid. This patient had severe COPD and a huge thyroid and was deferred by many centers and she went back home. Okay. So, this was and surgical uh, uh, radical neck dissections, parotid surgeries, and cancer tongue lesions. All these surgeries, ideal anesthesia technique was general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation with or without muscle relaxants. But certain patients we may need to do under sole regional block as anesthesia. So what are the blocks of head, face, and neck? For the neck, we have the cervical plexus block, deep cervical plexus, and the superficial cervical plexus, face blocks, trigeminal and its branches, and scalp blocks. Today, we are dealing with the blocks of the neck for neck surgeries. So we come to the cervical plexus. Cervical plexus is defined as a network or a conglomeration of nerves formed by the anterior rami of spinal nerves from C1 to C5 that gives off both deep muscular branches and superficial branches. The superficial sensory branches coming out of the lateral border of the stenocleidomastoid muscle behind its midpoint, just near about the external jugular vein, you can see, and gives out the superficial branches. It's mnemonic being glassed, that is G-L-A-S-T, greater auricular, lesser occipital, okay. the accessory nerve, the supraclavicular nerve, and the transverse cervical nerve along the thyroid region. Innervating area from behind the and above the external pinna, the mastoid, below the lower jaw, up to the clavicle till the midline, and the upper shoulder area, that is the anterior lateral part of the neck. In the transverse section, you can see that the superficial cervical plexus block is just been behind the belly of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And if you pierce the investing fascia of the neck behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle, you, it is the intermediate cervical plexus block. Both blocks the same peripheral branches from the cervical plexus. For the deep cervical plexus block, you have to go so much deeper to pierce the deep cervical fascia to reach the spine, cervical nerve roots. Okay. Now coming to the superficial cervical plexus block. Okay. After uh, the, the terminal branches emerge from the midpoint of the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid belly. This is the needle point of needle entry. Okay? And here you inject in all the directions in fan-shaped directions. The landmark is draw a line along the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle from the mastoid to the clavicular head of the muscle. Take the midpoint. This is the point of needle entry. You can see that the external jugular vein crossing the sternocleidomastoid muscle, take the needle entry point just above it. This block is very superficial. Again, I feel for the belly of the sternocleidomastoid. Hold it because this patient is some 92 year old and very fragile skin. So my needle can slip, inadvertent vascular puncture can occur. It's so superficial, you can see just few millimeters behind the belly of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, a nice wheel is being raised and a injection is given in fan-shaped direction in all the directions. You saw that I had bent the needle. That is because I can walk along the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. Okay. This is the intermediate cervical plexus. You can see the give way nicely when the needle penetrates the investing layer of the fascia. Now you have to keep in mind that if the transverse cervical is along this side, so if you're doing a thyroid, inject more here. And if you have a supraclavicular lymph node, injection towards the clavicle. Okay, downwards. 
the deep cervical plexus block, the needle has to go deeper to uh, the deep cervical fascia to get, deposit the drug at the root level. So the landmark includes mastoid process, Schasner's tubercle, posterior border of the sternocleidal mastoid. Okay. The C6 is at the, or the Schasner's tubercle is at, uh, at the transverse process, it's at the level of the cricoid cartilage. Okay. It is easily palpated behind the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Okay. Then label, draw a line up from the mastoid process to the C6. Okay. And at two centimeter interval, you make markings for C2, C3, C4 on the line drawn from the mastoid to the C6. Just at C C3 also, one injection here is enough to give you a reliable block. You insert the needle between the palpating fingers, okay? And uh, the needle has to be attached to a flexible tubing, just like a PNS needle. And go perpendicular slowly to hit the transverse process. Then the needle is withdrawn few millimeters, one to two millimeters, stabilize the needle, aspirate, and inject four ml of LA after negative aspiration. This process procedure is repeated at the consecutive levels. The transverse process has to be contacted at one to two centimeters almost at, uh, for all patients. Never go beyond 2.5 centimeters to uh, avoid the risk of spinal cord injury. The paresthesia may be elicited, but it's unreliable. This is mainly indicated for carotid end arthrectomy and is performed only on one side for the fear of bilateral phrenic nerve pulse. The contraindications include significant pulmonary diseases, contralateral phrenic nerve palsy, and high risk deep lock with potential complications. So you have to be careful and in good setups you have to give this. This is my article which was published in GSCCR thyroid surgeries under bilateral superficial cervical plexus block with the uh, uh, peripheral branches, that is the end branches, superficial branches of both the bilateral uh, deep and the superficial cervical plexus remaining the same. I used bilateral superficial cervical plexus for thyroid surgeries. So the same way superficial cervical plexus block was given, the needle was bent because to avoid inadvertent deeper punctures and you can walk along the posterior belly of the sternocleidomastoid. After that, 5 ml of drug was given there and then 5 ml at the intermediate cervical plexus after negative aspiration. The same was repeated on the opposite side. The EJV serves a very good marker. A nice wheel is raised along the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And then the intermediate cervical plexus block. You can see the giveaway of the investing fascia. And then along the sternal notch, the block was given. This uh, thyroid surgery was performed under sole an, uh, anesthesia, RA as a sole anesthesia technique. This is an intraoperative video. After the thyroid was removed, the patient was asked to swallow and uh, tell her name, which she could do very well. So the recurrent laryngeal nerve damage was also ruled out. Postoperatively, the patient could easily answer to our questions immediately on the table. An 88-year-old severe COPD for uh, bilateral radical neck dissection. This patient had had respiratory arrest when she was induced by another anesthetist and then was referred to me. This was successfully done under bilateral superficial cervical plexus. You can see the huge lymph nodes. And patient was very comfortable with minimal sedation, keeping the sedation score uh, under 1 to 2. This was a post-operative video. 
where while the la final sutures were being taken, the patient was very much comfortable. And she could answer me. So coming to parotid parotidectomy in a patient with cardiac disease, knowing this, that superficial cervical plexus, you have this greater auricular nerve area is covered and the lesser occipital area is also covered. What about the parotid area? This is the auricular, auricular temporal nerve region and the fascia over the parotid area is covered by the greater auricular that is by the uh, blocked by the superficial cervical plexus. The parotid gland is supplied by the auricular temporal nerve. Okay, this patient had global hypokinesia. So we gave, did this case under plain blocks. So one injection was given to cover the auricular temporal nerve block just anterior to the tragus, 5 ml there. Greater auricular nerve uh, was covered and the lesser occipital was covered by the superficial cervical plexus block, which also allowed the uh, radical uh, neck dissection. There we used 5 ml of LA. The incision, thinking that it might extend. Okay, so I added mandibular nerve block of around 3 to 5 ml. The LA mixture used was 2% of adrenaline xylocaine along with 0.75% ropivit. On after giving the block, I thought ki, if it turns out to be malignant, I may need to have a uh, cephalide extension of the incision. So 3 ml was added at the zygomatico temporal nerve. Okay. So coming to the mandibular nerve block, what are the nerves blocked? Ipsilateral mandibular teeth, the buccal and the lingual hard and the soft palate, anterior two thirds of the tongue and the floor of the mouth. What is the landmark here is the coronoid process and the coronoid notch, which can be easily palpated in front of your tragus just around one to two centimeters. If you ask the patient to open his mouth and close, you can feel a dip that is the coronoid process. Okay? You can also feel the anterior and the posterior border of the mandible. Here, the depth, you can use a simple hypodermic needle, 23 or 24 gauge, and the depth is around just two to 2.5 centimeters. Okay? A PNS guided mandibular nerve block is uh, video I had brought it, borrowed from Genil. You can see very well mandibular area contractions. This is a 5 centimeter needle, just around 1 to 1.5 centimeter is enough to give you very good blockade. Post operative video of the parotid. I, you know, she was asked to clench her teeth, rule out facial injuries. The surgeon is still closing the skin. Okay. You can see how cooperative the patient is, absolutely no pain. Now see a tongue with radical neck dissection. The 92-year-old mother of a doctor, she was hypertensive, diabetes, and age-related ECG changes. The, this was the tongue lesion, okay. the radical neck dissection. This was done under glossopharyngeal nerve block, the tonsillar pillar, 3 ml of LA solution was given. Midline of the tongue, 3 ml. I could have done with a mandibular nerve block also because it covers the anterior uh, two-thirds of the tongue. A superficial cervical plexus block was given, 6 ml of the LA solution. Intermediate cervical plexus block, 5 ml of the solution. The LA mixture used was 2% adrenaline xylocaine along with 0.75% ropivacaine. Sedation used was 1 milligram of midazolam and 1 gram of paracetamol. Just why, you will ask me why I have given a glossopharyngeal nerve block when the uh, lesion was in the anterior tongue. They are using tongue depressors and they may use suction. So uh, a glossopharyngeal nerve block was given just to avoid bucking of the patient you know, when they are using instruments and only one side was blocked, not bilateral or uh, the deglutition is also lost. Okay. So glossopharyngeal nerve block, this is a tongue depressor at the anterior tonsillar pillar after this is the needle entry point after aspiration 3 ml of the LH mixture was used. This is the intraoperative video. 
the CO2 laser was being used for excision of the tongue lesion. You can see how well they, uh, they are uh, using the suction, not allowing even one single drop to enter the oral cavity. The patient was very well cooperative and could be discharged from the HDU on the same day. This is the post-operative video where the patient is responding to my commands and the patient had no complaints whatsoever. This is the same thing which was published in uh, RIA Journal of Research and Innovations. And uh, I have done around six to 10 cases such uh, under plain uh, CA tongue lesions with under sole regional anesthesia as a sole anesthetic technique. The superficial cervical plexus block can also be used to uh, perform a tracheostomy for lar uh, laryngectomy, after which the GA was uh, induced. Now, a patient came with thyroid with cranial metastasis. This was huge. This patient had metastatic thyroid cancer, convulsions with cranial meds, lung meds, spinal meds, radiotherapy was on. Coagulation profile was normal. The superficial cervical plexus with the scalp block, 10 ml of 2% adrenaline xylocaine with 10 ml of 0.75% ropivacaine was used. No sedation was given. Just 1 gram of paracetamol with 20 mics of dextamid was used here. This was the lesion, thyroid lesion, which was removed. And uh, this patient, but later on, succumbed to the disease after a month. To conclude, you have to have all resuscitative equipments with the monitors attached, proper informed consent, vigilant monitoring and communication. GA is always the first choice and should be ready always. Not an, blocks are not an alternative to for a difficult intubation. Surgeon should contend with minimal movements, minimal muscle twitches, should lift up the, to dissect rather than push over the neck. They use these peanuts which causes discomfort for the uh, patient, uh, separate and powerful suction machine should be kept at the head end. Claustrophobic patients can cause problems. The sedation score should be kept only up to one or two. It's contraindicated in heavy bleeding, difficult airway and prolonged duration. Last but not the least, intralipid should always be in the vicinity. Thank you so much. Another fantastic lecture, ma'am. And Shiv, sir, you have any points to add? No. <laughs> she, I think Kala has covered covered both lectures so so well. <clears throat> I think cervical plexus uh, block has been my favorite. I've written a review article as well long ago on uh, the anatomy and uh, both ultrasound as well as the landmark guided techniques for them, and that large number of uh, discussions on the group about uh, the cervical plexus block. Uh, <clears throat> I think with the uh, loss of resistance block, I would at least probably uh, use uh, more of uh, intermediate plexus block, uh, where you just feel for the pop through the investing fascia of the neck. And even for the trainees, I actually teach them because it's such a nice block. If you got time, you don't need to give any other block uh, and you can use them bilaterally. So it's, it's, a, it's a great block to learn. But uh, superficial blocks, just uh, you don't actually have to go fine shape. You just need to go uh, just, uh, you know, cranially and caudally along from the midpoint of the uh, sternocleidomastoid. mastoid. Uh, but I, I need to tell you one thing about uh, the uh, intermediate cervical plexus block. If your landmark is not right, you can end up actually giving, giving a brachial plexus block, interscalene block. And it happened in one of our cases where they thought, oh, what has happened to the patient? Because the patient had carotid surgery on that side and then couldn't move the arm. And I was thinking they were perplexed. They said, and the worst thing was it was not recorded in the anesthesia chart. Uh, so the consultant on call was, you know, was perplexed. He said, I've never seen, you know, same side <laughs> stroke with, with, 
till till I went and said no, this is just from the block. This patient has had uh, the cervical plexus block, so their landmark was much lower. They ended up actually giving a interscalene block. So be careful with your landmarks that it is it is higher up, and you feel for the mastoid and the your your uh, you know posterior border properly uh, when you do this block. And and again, like I said, you don't actually have to the way a cervical plexus block is described in different way, you know, fan shape, they don't need to. They are all originating at the midpoint, just go above, below, um, at the same point, go and feel the pop through the investing fascia, 5 ms there, 5. 15 ms, less than 20 ms, you've done the whole block. So it's a, it's a wonderful block. And I think the other blocks which uh, Kala has mentioned, like mandible block, we demonstrated this since 214, uh, in in Rajkot workshop, <clears throat> uh, it was the first time I myself had never actually seen. It was a dentist. No, no, it was anesthetist who worked with a dentist who used to give this block. And I said, why can't we just use uh, nerve stimulation? So we demonstrated those videos are all still there in 2014 videos on uh, PNS guided mandibular nerve block. Uh, that's a great great block. Um, I think all the all the uh, publications you have done, Kala, is I think commendable. The amount of work you've done is commendable. And these two lectures were specifically, uh, you know, given to you because you need to actually tell people ultrasound is not the only answer to everything. There's a lot you can do with just a needle, okay, and a syringe filled with local anesthetic. Thank you so much for that. And I think you've got lots of, I think, uh, comments from the members. It's a amazing presentation. Um, and uh, one of the analysis recent is uh, excellent color, ma'am. I just realized how underutilized this effective block is at our place. I think he was talking about- In fact, about in uh, uh, conferences, I meet people. They come forward and tell me ki, yeah. uh, how the entire department has started giving perianal block and the surgeons yeah. uh, yeah. complain if it yeah. is not given. Because yeah, they lose the patients. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because the patients are your best uh, uh, advocates. Uh, yeah. They will go out and they will say, well, that surgeon I went and they did the surgery and I had no pain. Whereas they would find other people who are like screaming in pain and they're yeah. sitting on sits bath and whatnot to actually have the relief. And these these don't need to be. And so they are they are wonderful and, and easy. Uh, this superficial cervical plexus in private practice, sir, you have uh, lymph node dissections. Yeah. Which, uh, even the surgeons are uh, scared because of yeah. the uh, great vessels uh, yeah. beneath that. So then they keep on, uh, patient keeps on moving with short GA. But with the, no, then they land up giving put uh, SGD and uh, so. So with the cervical plexus block, I've had so many coming forward to uh, with our discussion in the yeah. gas group. They're very happy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And now the extremely underutilized the whole, blocks. The whole whole book, the uh, loss of resistance book, is now actually on the uh, our app on the Medicis Gas app. So you can go to the email section, uh, go into the uh, eBooks and it is it is there for people to actually read and, you know, it's freely accessible. You can open it anytime. You don't have to have to carry a physical book. It is there in the uh, mails section. There is one, there is one query from uh, uh, Dr. Thiru. Uh, he wants to ask with uh, using xylocaine with adrenaline around the pinna. Any issues you have faced? Uh, no, Dr. never. Hardly uh, 3 ml of the drug is being used at each point. And uh, around the pinna, I'm not using. I have given superficial cervical plexus for the greater auricular and the lesser occipital. So uh, other than auriculotemporal and zygomaticotemporal, 3, 3 ml each, that is uh, along, that is uh, that comes under the scalp block. Yeah. Right. So 2 to There's 3 no ml uh, with the uh, aspiration, he must be meaning the auricular temporal artery which runs along in front. Okay, yes. So you can palpate the artery and give lateral to that. Okay. Uh, even if you inject around it, around it's not the, yeah. cause any, any problem no. at all. Yeah, no. this is these are it's not hardly like, two not ml of the drug. Area. Yeah, so it is not not a big problem. It's not that they are the only artery which are supplying that area. There's a lot of you know yes. other arteries which are. 
and they have branches with that which will likely help. So it's not not an issue in that area. I mean, if you look at the surgeons when they do the kind of a ring block around the head, they're using. Um, they don't aspirate. Know, even, no, they don't even aspirate. Exactly, they <laughs> they go all around and put local anesthetic with adrenaline without any issues. So I don't think that is that is a big issue. Uh, Dr. Jaime has a question. Yeah, for post-operative analgesia of neck surgeries, which one will you prefer, superficial or intermediate? Uh, you can use either of them. It's fine. It's not. You can actually do the whole surgery with superficial cervical plexus block. Uh, there are a lot of uh, places where do, they do a carotid endoctomy just with superficial cervical plexus block. But if you are cutting through the muscles, you are where the uh, muscles are supplied, then, then you actually would be better off with intermediate plexus block because they will also block the motor nerves. So motor nerves come from the deeper plexus and the superficial plexus, you know, there's the cutaneous branches. So if it is just a surgery which does not involve cutting of the muscle, then you're fine with just superficial cervical plexus. Okay, is Dr. Anju ready for her talk? Yeah. Any anybody else wants to add anything? Any of from the staff uh, from the faculty? I keep telling you, Dr. Devesh. That's yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I liked your presentation. I've heard you before also on yes. both these topics. But uh, every time I listen, some new take uh, home points are there. Uh, and you rightly mentioned it's a uh, grossly underutilized block. Both these blocks are grossly underutilized. Well, so everybody wants for to use ultrasound us. everywhere, isn't it? They want yeah, to but see even uh, even ultrasound uh, uh, guided pudendal nerve block can be done. I told them about yes, that. Yes. That's yes. That it's yeah. possible. Yeah, even yeah. USG guided mandible and all uh, yeah. like can be done. So <laughs> I have used mandibular block and superficial cervical for commandos, uh, PMMC flaps. I have given uh, thoracic paravertebral and these blocks along with GA, where the patient's reserves are uh, low. And they come out very well. Commendable. Uh, hats off to you for doing this kind yeah, of work. It just, just goes to prove that you don't need a clear sound to give an effective <laughs> block. Yes. No, no, I'm not joking. It is, it is, it's a fact that you can actually give a still See, give effective block without without actually you know, require, having it. We all started with landmark guided and this uh, uh, landmark guided. And I really <laughs> thank the surgeons. You know, they just put this case, he, this case is shelved because is unfit uh, what can you do no? yeah and they are the ones who push me to think ahead so, yeah, absolutely yeah no wonder uh, surgeon's cooperation is very very important very very important yeah, yeah. no wonder kalamam is one of the crowd favorites yeah. on the anesthetist group <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so dr kala amazing presentation thank uh, you sir it's been it's been the brings back the old times yeah. Really have a lot, sir. And this <laughs> is what we used to do. Yes. So, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you, thank you so much for the opportunity. The kids, the kids will, will, will see what, what we used to do and what kids still do. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of echo from your sound. Um, mm. sound. There are two devices being used. Yeah, probably. Yeah, there's another device which I must have the audio on. It says that's fine. That's okay. So Anil, you want to continue? Is uh, Anju if Anju is ready? Yes, sir. Uh, my audible, sir. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going very well. I think we are on time. We are on time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Anju Gupta. She is an assistant professor in AIMS, New Delhi. Her area of interest is regional anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia, and airway. She is going to be talking about. Uh, on the topic of blocks for brush surgeries, what's in and what's out. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Yeah. Anju? She switched up. She's uh, her. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, just a second. Please give me a second. Yeah, no, no problem. No problem. No problem. <clears throat> we didn't know because your video and audio both were switched off, so we didn't know what was happening. Yeah.
Everyone on mute now. Yeah. Uh, very good evening to all of you. So, sorry for delay of few seconds. It's, it's fine, Anju. We're doing fine. We are doing fine. So uh, thank you, Shivsal, for this opportunity to talk in this uh, esteemed platform. So my topic for today is blocks for breast surgery, what's in and what's out. Let's see. So I do not have any conflict of interest to declare other than some images have been procured from the internet-based sources. So uh, before we, we move on, let's face this question. Why are blocks, uh, why do you want to give blocks? Have you, have any of you faced this question? Why do you want to give blocks? If we, uh, be it from the surgeons or be it from your seniors. So the surgeon's arguments are, breast surgery is not associated with severe pain. We can manage with normal, usual anesthetics. Local anesthetic interferes with our surgery. Your blocks don't work. OT time is wasted. We, our OT time is being shortened. And from our anesthesia side, there are some hindrances like conventional analog analgesics are usually sufficient. There, are, there may be complications. Why do you want to invite complications, additional complications? And uh, it may be technically, these blocks are technically challenging. So let's see why there is a need for uh, blocks for breast surgery. Why is there a need for additional regional anesthesia for these uh, surgeries? M uh, the, the results have suggested, the studies have shown that uh, nearly 60% of breast surgery patients, they experience severe acute post-operative pain, contrary to the popular belief that these surgeries are not very painful. And it has been seen that severe pain can persist for six to twelve months, and in almost hundred percent of the, uh, in almost ten percent of the cases, and chronic pain was seen to develop in up to forty percent of cases in uh, having breast surgery. And uh, the patients who had preoperative and severe acute postoperative pain, and the type of surgery were seen to be the risk factors for development of chronic postoperative pain after breast surgery. So uh, there is also a recent uh, evidence of reduced cancer recurrence with uh, regional anesthesia in breast surgery uh, patients, uh, which has been uh, purported to be due to the decreased use of opioids and volatiles, as well as the decreased stress response with the use of uh, regional anesthesia. So first of all, let's see how are the how is the breast supplied? What is the innovation? So uh, most of all, most important are these intercostal nerves. The T1, uh, T2 to T6, uh, T2 to T5 are most important than variable contribution from T1 to T6 and 7. So uh, this is the lateral intercostal branches and the anterior and intercostal branches of the intercostal nerves. Then the superior aspect is supplied by supraclavicular nerves, which are branches of the cervical plexus. Then uh, this, uh, we have the long thoracic nerve, which is the nerves of bell, that is the serratus anterior, which supplies the serratus anterior. Then we have the uh, this thoracodorsal nerve, uh, which supplies the latissimus dorsi uh, muscle. So these are the anterior cutaneous branches, supraclavicular, the intercostobrachial nerve, the long thoracic and the thoracodorsal nerve, and the lateral cutaneous branches, which are very important. So how they supply the lateral pectoral nerve, uh, the lateral uh, and the medial pectoral nerve, I forgot about the lateral and the medial pectoral nerve, they are also very important. So the lateral pectoral nerve, it, travel, it is a branch of pectoral branch of thoracocromial, uh, it is a basically a branch of uh, brachial plexus and it travels uh, with the pectoral branch of thoracoacromial vessels in the plane between the pec major and minor and that is the landmark of uh, this block, the pec one block and it pierces only pec major and it communicates with the medial pectoral nerve through which it has been seen to supply the uh, these uh, two muscles. Medial pectoral nerve, it supplies both the muscles and it enters the pec minor from beneath it and ends by piercing the sternocostal head of the pec major. Then the supraclavicular nerve, I have already told you, it, is, uh, it supplies the superior pole of the breast and uh, uh, then there are long thoracic nerve which supplies the serratus anterior uh, uh, muscle and it is accompanied by the lateral thoracic branch of uh, thoracoacromial artery. 
Then the thoracodorsal nerve, which supplies the latissimus dorsi, it is accompanied by the thoracodorsal artery. Then we have the uh, anterior and the lateral uh, intercostal branches. So coming uh, to the first block, the paravertebral block, uh, is it the gold standard? Let's see. So paravertebral, basically for breast surgery, it is usually performed between T2 and, uh, T2 and T6 with usual either uh, single or multiple injections. And uh, so paravertebral space, it is a wedge-shaped space lateral to the vertebral body and posterior to the pleura and anterior to the transverse process. So it is this wedge-shaped space uh, through which the intercostal nerves, they run and it is targeted. These nerves are targeted in this space. So, uh, how do we scan? Uh, first step is the midline, uh, midline transverse uh, scanning. Then we, the step two is paramedian transverse view. And the step three is the parasagittal oblique view. So, these view we obtain to get, uh, this is the midline, uh, midline intertransverse inter uh, view, the, the, the transverse view of the, at the midline uh, level, at the spinous level. Then uh, we move ahead and we uh, move the probe laterally in the transverse view and over it is placed over the transverse process and the rib. And we will see this kind of picture, the rib will be laterally and the transverse process will be medially. And then we do away with the rib to visualize the pleura slightly cordially. So this, uh, this is how we will scan. This is again the scanning and uh, this is how uh, the needle will approach from lateral to medial. This is the transverse process and this is the pleura. When we obtain the uh, lateral parasagittal oblique view, we will get this kind of picture. The transverse process will be seen on one side and the paravertebral space will be just behind that and there will be a pleura laterally and the uh, needle will approach from lateral to medial and uh, we will deposit the local anesthetic at this level and it, we will see the a displacement, downward displacement of the pleura. So this is how uh, scanning is done. So this is the midline view. Uh, we are moving laterally. The spinous process was visualized. Then we have the uh, transverse process, the tip of the transverse process. Here we can see the rib. And now we will do away with the rib and we will start visualizing the pleura. So here the pleura comes in view, the bright shimmery pleura comes in view. So this is the way the scanning will be done from midline to lateral and then we will tilt the probe oblique. So now uh, needling is, this is this I am talking about the transverse approach. I am not practicing the parasagittal approach, so I am not talking about it. So this is the in-plane approach below the transverse process and uh, we will see the, uh, the needle is uh, targeted to rest just below the transverse process and we will uh, the uh, we will aim to deposit the local anesthetic just in this space after piercing the uh, this uh, superior costal transverse ligament and then we will visualize the pleura going down so that is the end point of the uh, correct deposition of the drug i hope you can see the pleura sagging down Yeah, so now you can see the pleura sagging down. So, so what is the evidence for single versus multiple? Uh, this study, it uh, showed that the main finding of the study was that multiple paravertebral injections resulted in more consistent and more reliable radiographic and clinical distribution of the uh, drug as compared to the single injection technique. So uh, multiple injection technique is uh, generally preferred, especially in cases where we are aiming for uh, anesthesia rather than analgesia. So these are the uh, meta-analysis which were uh, which have been published regarding the evidence for uh, paravertebral block. So th this study it showed that the uh, paravertebral block it provides effective analgesia for ambulatory breast surgery, resulted in less PUNV. Then this meta-analysis it showed that there is considerable evidence that uh, paravertebral either alone or with general anesthesia it provides better uh, post-operative pain control with lesser side effects and compared to other analgesic, conventional analgesic strategies. Then uh, this study showed that it, uh, it may, uh, this is an important finding. Uh, this study, uh, this uh, further pushed the role of paravertebral for breast surgery. 
because it showed that the paravertebral block it may prevent chronic post operative pain after breast surgery and uh, one out of every four to five patient treated could benefit regarding the uh, chronic pain thing so uh, this uh, went on to uh, to establish the role of this these regional anesthesia in preventing the chronic post surgical pain for breast surgery which is a significant uh, problem associated with this surgery so now let's see if we have so much of benefits associated with paravertebral block nobody is debating that it is not effective it is definitely very effective block so let's see why it is not so commonly practiced by everyone nowadays it needs multiple injections to be very effective it can be very technically challenging in some patients the patient needs to be in sitting position so general anesthesia will not be possible in such condition uh, such as uh, such a position Uh, so it has to be done preoperatively in such cases then vessels are oh, um, we will um, see some uh, there there are uh, critical structures including the vessels including the epidural space so these kind of things are very important and then we have pleura also which is very very near so these uh, things they make it a very critical uh, kind of uh, things which are near the uh, our uh, block area so it is not definitely not a block for beginners and uh, you need to be a technically expert expert to perform this block so then there are certain complications which are reported with this block like hypotension because of the sympathetic block then vascular puncture is there then pleural puncture has been reported uh, pneumothorax is the incidence which has been reported is 0.5% which is not a small incidence so there are um, multiple complications which are, have been reported so uh, this led to the search for more safer blocks which will provide effective analgesia uh, equivalent or almost equivalent to paravertebral block so are there any options let's come out of the paravertebral space this is the paravertebral space we will start coming out and moving laterally let's see so slightly we come slightly out of this space and uh, just out of the superior costal transverse ligament and we get the uh, mid transverse process to pleura block mtp block then we come out and below the erector spinae muscle we have the retrolaminar block we have the erector spinae plane block then we come out further laterally towards the mid axillary line we have the lateral we we try to grasp uh, catch hold of the lateral cutaneous branch through the pex and the sap block then we come further anteriorly and we catch hold of the anterior cutaneous branches through the um, anteromedial uh, blocks anteromedial chest wall blocks which i will come to later so these interfacial plane blocks earlier they were practiced solely based on the clicks and pops so but now there is a this in this era of ultrasound guided blocks we can visualize the facial plane blocks and we can also visualize the drug being deposited accurately and uh adequately so this is uh, this led to the uh, revolution and this led to the uh, booming of these uh, these interfacial plane blocks like pex sap all these blocks they came into work because of the increased usage of the ultrasound so now uh, let's see why chest wall blocks are the right option maybe the right option they they are very simple to learn uh, even our beginners they tend to learn it very easily within in, within certain few blocks they will be uh, doing it nicely then it is a lesser invasive obviously we are much outside the critical structures and it leads to less complications then it is anticoagulant friendly these kind of uh, like paravertebral blocks they are counted as a central block and we generally try to avoid these blocks in patients who are anticoagulated then these blocks are effective also studies have shown repeatedly that these blocks uh, they uh, are uh, sparing of opioids and they uh, they lead to effective post operative analgesia and decrease in pain scores and also they spare the sensory uh, the any uh, sympathetic or motor blockage is spared by the use of these blocks which is a, another advantage so now how do we classify the thoracic plane uh, wall blocks Uh, they are classified as the anteromedial chest wall blocks the anterolateral chest wall blocks and the posterolateral chest wall blocks 
so uh, uh, what blocks are come under the anteromedial chest wall blocks the pecto interfacial uh, plane block the transthoracic plane block these are increasingly being used and they are used uh, they are useful for the medial quadrant of the breast then we come to the anterolateral chest wall blocks these are the most popular chest wall blocks especially for the breast surgery the pex1 pex2 and the sap block then posterolateral chest wall blocks we spoke about the erector spinae plane block the mid transverse uh, process uh, to crura block then erector spinae plane block retro laminar block and some para spinal intercostal plane blocks so the posterolateral chest wall blocks they target the posterolateral area of the uh, wall thoracic wall around the spine then we have the anterolateral chest wall which mainly target the axillary and the uh, axillary area then we have the anterior anteromedial which target the anterior cutaneous branches at the anteromedial aspect of the breast so it was this man who popularized the anterolateral chest wall blocks which are the most common blocks that uh, this is the uh, rafal blanco so he described this first block pex1 block in 2011 so basically this block was found to be very effective particularly effective for surgeries where some uh, implants are placed under the pectoral muscles like the breast expanders and uh, like the subpectoral processes these kind of things when they are placed under these muscles so they lead, lead to the stretching of these muscles so in these cases it was very effective then coming to pex2 block in 2012 it provides complete analgesia for the breast surgery and can be an alternative to the paravertebral or thoracic epidural and it can also be a rescue block then coming to 2013 he described the sad block it is a novel ultrasound guided regional anesthesia technique they that may achieve complete even anesthesia of the hemithorax especially in combination with other small blocks and it may be a viable alternative to other techniques like paravertebral and central neuralgia so pex1 and pex2 the anatomy pex1 basically the drug is deposited between major and minor so the aim here is to uh, aim here is to uh, block the pec, uh, uh, this uh, medial and lateral pectoral nerves and so the two sensory supply to the pectoral muscles and the landmark is the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery which is running in this plane between these two muscles then the pex2 it is uh, basically the drug is deposited between the pec minor and the serratus muscle in addition to the pex1 block so here the aim is to block the lateral cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerves t2 to t4 and up to t6 uh, by the so by this second injection and lateral thoracic uh, lateral lateral cutaneous branches and the lateral thoracic nerves like thoracodorsal nerve uh, the long thoracic nerve and in addition to what was blocked by pex1 so basically it is said to uh, block the uh, provide the complete analgesia to the breast and the axilla so how do we scan the uh, how we, how do we scan for this pex block for the pex1 we place the block uh, more uh, pretty similar to what uh, how we do for the costoclavicular block in the costoclavicular fossa and we visualize these uh, subclavian vessels and then uh, we visualize we tilt the probe medially to visualize the second rib the rib which will be seen first will be the second rib at this level we deposit our uh, injection between these two pex muscle then for pex2 we slide the probe slightly uh, cordard and laterally and we visualize the serratus muscle uh, serratus muscle overlying the rib so second injection is placed uh, between the pec minor pec minor and this serratus muscle so this is the way the probe is placed in the transverse oblique manner uh, and then it is slided down to lie over the third and fourth fourth rib for the pex2 so infraclavicular fossa the probe is placed in the cephalocaudal direction for pec1 and then the probe is tilted medially and we visualize the uh, second rib and we slide down uh, to the third and fourth rib for the pex2 block uh, then this this is the image sono anatomy of the this pex1 block this is pec pectoralis major minor and this is the drug being deposited from uh, uh, cephalocaudal direction from superior to inferior we stand on the head end and we deposit the drug between these two then this is the pex2 block at the level of third and fourth rib 
we deposit make one injection between uh, these two muscles and then we bring out the needle and we make the second injection between these two so you can uh, with the single probe placement we can make both the injections or you can slide the probe after pex1 to the pex2 area so this is the sono image uh, this is a pec major minor this is the second rib and uh, this is the serratus anterior muscle and then this is how we will place the block this is the pec major this is the pec minor and needling will be done from cranial to caudal this is the needle which is approaching this plane this is the rib this will, this will most likely with the fourth rib the third and the fourth rib and the needle will approach this area okay so this is the needle insertion and the drug deposition so this is the needle which has approached this area this is for pex1 and you will see the drug being deposited here between these two muscles and this is the pex2 where the first second injection is being made between these two muscles the serratus and the uh, pectoralis minor so you can see the layering of the layering of the plane with the local anesthetic the plane being opened up so now let's see how, uh, what is the evidence this study published in egyptian journal of anesthesia it showed that pectoral nerve block for analgesia after breast surgery as compared to thorac uh, thoracic paravertebral block pectoral block was found to reduce the post operative morphine consumption in the first 24 hours and the pain score in first 12 hours as compared to paravertebral block so it was found, found to be even more effective as compared to single level uh, thoracic paravertebral block at t4 level so um, the basically as we can see the paravertebral which is the gold standard we can achieve almost equivalent or more higher uh, better analgesia as compared to the gold standard which is the paravertebral so this is the meta analysis on pex2 block uh, so the these meta analysis have been published within this 10 year of its uh, description so many meta analysis have come up and they have consistently shown that there is a moderate quality evidence that pax2 block compared with no treatment uh, reduces the post operative pain intensity at rest that is with conventional uh, post operative pain relief the as compared to conventional analgesia the pax2 provides a better uh, analgesia so however uh, we need further uh, literature is required uh, because uh, they, this uh, these studies were found to be low or uh, very low uh, evidence uh, so, however it has also been seen that pex2 block may be in these studies also showed that pex2 block may may be equally effective as compared to paravertebral block so uh, the message here is that uh, the pex2 block which is a chest wall block much more superficial much less invasive it is almost as effective as compared to pervertible block which can be considered as the gold standard and it may even be better uh, so now coming to the sap block so uh, in the sap block we deposit we come further laterally while we were doing scanning for the pex2 block uh, we reach the third and the fourth rib now we further move the probe cephalo laterally infro laterally and we reach the mid axillary line at the level of almost the nipple which is the fifth into uh, fourth uh, fourth rib and the fifth, fifth intercostal space so in this level we see multiple nerves which are traversing this uh, area and we aim to block these all these nerves which are passing this area so uh, it can be done in two ways either the local anesthetic can be deposited between the latissimus dorsi and the serratus which is conventionally done which was the conventionally described block so this is the plane where the local anesthetic is uh, deposited and then we have the second uh, uh, the deep sap block where the local anesthetic is deposited between the rib and the serratus anterior so uh, this is the lateral cutaneous branches the long thoracic nerve and the thoracodorsal nerve so what we do is this is the area we can see the anterior fold we have the uh, pec, pec major muscle 
and this is the posterior fold where we have the uh, latissimus dorsi muscle and we visualize the, uh, we basically place the probe almost oblique in a oblique transverse manner at this level at the fourth intercostal space and almost one palm below the axilla so that is the basic landmark so uh, then here is the this is the site of probe placement almost one palm below the axilla and this is the way the probe is placed almost in a transverse manner and the patient is turned in a lateral position so generally it is the most convenient to be done in the lateral position but sometimes if the patient is under general anesthesia and we don't want to turn the patient we can just place a uh, pillow below the patient's this right uh, uh, the ipsilateral thorax and we can may, uh, make the this block site higher up so this is the way the scanning is done so we are we have these two muscles in uh, view and we have this ribs this is the fifth rib and we have the this is the uh, serratus muscle and this is the latissimus dorsi we can see the fiber arrangement is slightly dif different and we can visualize so this is how we uh, the needle is uh, uh, inserted from anterior to posterior so serratus muscle is seen overlying the rib here we are giving the deep sap block so uh, the shimmering pleura, pleura can be seen between the ribs and we can then uh, just uh, deposit a small amount of saline and we can see the layering up my there is some problem with the video i am sorry so we can see the plane opening up we should always see the local anesthetic freely being deposited and it is so uh, the muscle overlying should be lifted up so that is the sign of the correct placement of the local anesthetic so let's see what are the evidence uh, regarding the serratus anterior plane block for analgesia these are the meta analysis which were published uh, for serratus anterior plane block the sap block it was seen that it reduces the opioid consumption and reduces the pain scores and there is fewer incidence of punb it was seen in one study in another one it was seen that uh, though there were no significant uh, advantage regarding the side effects but it provided uh, uh, provided a more effective post operative analgesia it, this was regarding the vat surgery and now coming to this surgery uh, this study this study compared thoracic paravertebral block with the serratus anterior plane block and as we can see the study found out that sap block was more effective than thoracic paravertebral block for post operative analgesia so this is one uh, important thing here is that we have found even for pex2 block and also for the sap block that uh, studies have shown that either it is equivalent or it provides a better analgesia as compared to the gold standard so this is uh, the study where Uh, these pex block and pex2 block and the serratus uh, block they were compared head to head for for the mrm surgery so it was seen as expected that they provided similarly adequate analgesia following the mrm so uh, both of them they provide similar analgesia and they both provide either equivalent or better analgesia as compared to paravertebral block now coming to the uh, anteromedial chest wall blocks so the anteromedial chest wall blocks they are important because the they cover the area from almost the parasternal area till the nipples so this uh, large amount of area it is covered by these anterior cutaneous nerves if the surgery is on the medial quadrant we will need to block these nerves also to provide a uh, better analgesia so this anterior cutaneous branches they traverse this space Uh, the intercostal the terminal branch of the intercostal nerve it is traveling in this groove intercostal groove so it terminates here by dividing into the lateral and the medial branch of the anterior intercostal and it traverses these muscles the pec major and the internal intercostal nerve uh, muscle so uh, the we, the target here is the anterior cutaneous branch of t2 to t6 this is the transverse thoracic plane block uh here the local anesthetic is deposited between the pec, uh, between the internal intercostal muscle and the transverse thoracic muscle so this is the local anesthetic dip, uh, being deposited here it can be seen and the probe is placed 
from in the cephalocaudal direction at the level uh, just parasternal and we deposit the local anesthetic here using a linear probe this is a uh, another block which was described because the uh, transthoracic plane block was a very very near to the pleura so there were concerns regarding pneumothorax and all so this block was described which was further away from the pleura so it was deposited between the pec major and the internal intercostal muscle so this is uh, the study which was published regarding i'm sorry this study was published uh, regarding this uh, addition of this pec uh, pecto parasternal intercostal uh, block uh, to the for the post operative pain relief following mrm uh, in addition to the pec uh, pec 1 and the serratus intercostal block so it was seen that this combination provided superior pain relief as compared to these blocks alone now coming to the posterolateral chest wall blocks which are nowadays gaining more popularity uh, especially the erector spinae plane block so erector spinae plane block it is a group of three muscles as we all know it is known as a universal block because it covers everything from cranial to caudal and uh, this is the uh, basically uh, the fibers they run vertically throughout from the sac uh, from the sacrum to the skull so that is why if we deposit the drug anywhere below this muscle it has been seen that the uh, effective analgesia is obtained in that dermatome so uh, this is regarding the uh, sono anat the anatomy the transverse processes uh, they are uh, seen and the this is the spinous processes and the muscle is seen to run over the transverse process and we decide the dermatome according to the level of the surgery like for breast surgery it is generally deposited between uh, t2 to t4 levels and then uh, we inject just beneath the erector spinae muscle so this is the erector spinae muscle so at the tip of the transverse process Uh, we aim to deposit the drug either in the parasagittal oblique view parasagittal view or in the transverse view so similar to the paravertebral block we place the probe this is the parasagittal placement of the block uh, longitudinal placement and then a cephalocardial direction we deposit the drug below the erector spinae muscle so this is the patient uh, generally it is done in sitting position though it can be done in the lateral uh, or it can be also be done in the prone position and in a cephalocaudal direction the needle is inserted at the level t2 to t4 we will visualize three uh, three muscles that is the trapezius rhomboid and erector spinae and the the needle will be inserted from cephalad direction to the caudal direction over the transverse process and this will be the anterolateral chest wall which will be blocked so this is the sono anatomy uh, this transverse process is here we can see the erector spinae muscle the rhomboid muscle and the tra trapezius muscle and uh, the needle will come from cephalad to caudal direction and this is the local anesthetic deposited so this is the a video small video of the erector spinae plane block this is the needle which is approaching from the cranial to the caudal end and it has come in the plane below the erector spinae muscle above the above the transverse process this is the transverse process and we can see the drug being deposited and uh, creating a layer of local anesthetic so what is the advantage why we want to go more peripheral and more out of the this uh, our vertebral canal more further away because it provides a easier sono anatomy there is a uh, it is a safer block definitely because it is less invasive and paravertebral and intercostal uh, blocks they are more invasive and there are they are very very proxim uh, their proximity to pleura makes them more invasive and more risky there is less or um, less or no motor or sympathetic block so there is less incidence of hypotension which is associated with the paravertebral blocks it covers more sensory area as compared to pectoral and uh, sap block it almost covers the hemithorax and catheter can be kept in place so these are the advantages so uh, we can question what is the anatomical basis how does it act this is a big question and uh, till now uh, there is no concrete answer uh, this study it showed that there was anterior pa pathway of dye diffusion from the site of injection within the erector spinae towards the dorsal rami and passing through the costotransverse foramen this was the most 
concrete most uh, creditable most uh, uh, convincing kind of evidence which was there regarding the drug spread so this made all of us uh, all of us to believe that it uh, passes through the costal transverse foramen and reaches the anterior paravertebral space so it was known as a proxy to the paravertebral block however later on the dye studies they uh, gave a uh, dubious kind of uh, this uh, results and it was not seen consistently to co- to spread to the anterior space anterior paravertebral space in all the studies however what has been confirmed is that uh, the dorsal ramus is involved in uh, all the studies across the board all the studies they showed that the dorsal ramus was changed so the spread has been seen to be limited to 2 to 5 vertebral uh, bodies then uh, let's see what is the evidence regarding a comparison between the erector spinae block versus the thoracic paravertebral block uh, which is the mechanism how we uh, we see it to act so the a study by chen et al it showed that paravertebral was uh, better in their study regarding the analgesic outcomes a study by gurkan et al they showed that and another study by jayo et al they showed that paravertebral provided similar analgesic efficacy as compared to erector spine so it has been uh, however uh, it rem- still remains to be proven whether it is uh, the outcomes are exactly similar or it depends on the volume the space of injection whether multiple injections were given or single injection the type of surgery will also matter and what multimodal analgesia were used so all these things would make a difference so uh, complications coming to the complications till now there have been a, a, a large flood of uh, reports and studies now have come up regarding the uh, erector spinae plane block and till now only one pneumothorax has been reported in adult patients and i am sure it was also when it was initially reported and patients uh, people were not uh, that adept at performing this block Uh, in children in 165 children there ha- there was no blo- uh, no pneumothorax which was reported sympathetic and motor weakness was not reported in um, uh, most of the studies recently there is a small uh, case of transient para uh, paresis which has been reported regarding bleeding it has been safely given in patients who have uh, who were on anticoagulants uh, and general risk like last and uh, myotoxicity they have not been studied and they are of uh, they are definitely possible because they are la- large volume blocks coming to the evidence regarding erector spinae plane block as compared to the lateral chest fall blocks erector spinae plane blocks versus pex2 block i found this rct it found that surprisingly pex2 block was found to be more effective though esp has been uh, esp is uh, uh, logically uh, can cover more area more dermatomes and it is closer to the vertebral canal so it uh, covers more visceral provides more visceral analgesia it has been said that it provides more visceral analgesia still the pex2 block was found to be more effective then coming to this uh, uh, trial on comparison of sap versus esp for breast surgery these two uh, these two trials i could find for breast surgery though there were other trials for vats and other thoracic surgery so this trial it found that uh, the sap block it provide better quality of analgesia as compared to esp block so uh, these two studies they have shown that the uh, the pex2 and the sap block they were uh, more effective as compared to your uh, esp block however only time will tell because more uh, better and uh, more robust uh, evidence is still required to conclude this but uh, we can safely say that these uh, blocks are almost as effective as compared to the esp block also uh, uh, a word about this retrolaminar block uh, this retrolaminar block is nothing but a more medial version of the erector spinae block over the lamina rather than the tip it has been seen that this block is dependent on volume and large amount of volume is needed for the block to be uh, effective it, the spread uh, effectively happens only when high la- uh, local anesthetic volumes are used and there is uh, not much evidence in favor of this block as of now then coming to a uh, relatively newer block that is the midpoint transverse process uh, to pleura block uh, here uh the study it was uh, found to it was initially proposed as a new alternative to thoracic paravertebral block uh this is new end point for thoracic paravertebral block 
basically the paravertebral block the drug was deposited below the superior costo transverse ligament and here the drug is deposited above the costo transverse ligament so they are saying that it is the end point for uh, this thoracic uh, for the thoracic paravertebral block because it uh, provided almost equivalent analgesia and then uh, this study uh, this case report it showed that it provided surgical an anesthesia so these kind of things have been reported but still lot of literature is required for this block to be uh, proven as uh, effective or more effective uh, for the, these surgeries so this is the schematic diagram and the sono anatomy of this block so the this is the uh, posterior aspect of the uh, transverse process and this is the pleura so this drug is deposited at the mid midpoint of this level just above the superior costo transverse ligament so this is the uh, point of deposition of the drug this is the point of deposition of the local anesthetic and the, it can be done from cephalocaudal to co or caudal to cephalon in the same way as erector spinae plane block is done now there are certain newer kids on the block that is the rhomboid intercostal and serratus plane block sub serratus plane block this block it anesthetizes the lateral cutaneous branches of the thoracic intercostal nerves for the chest wall and staining of the branches of the intercostal from t3 to t9 was seen in uh, when this was deposited deep to the esp medially so this is the transducer positioning it is it is placed over this rhomboid muscle and uh, rhomboid and trapezius and just at the level of seventh uh, seventh uh, sub vertebra and we get this sono image of trapezius and the rhomboid muscle and we visualize the rib and just place the local anesthetic over this area so this is the needle which is coming from cranial to caudal and this local anesthetic is being deposited here uh, below these two muscles personally i don't have any experience of this block but it has been seen that it provides effective analgesia uh, for the breast surgery there are few uh, case reports which have come up and they have shown that it it provided effective analgesia uh, for this thoracic surgeries and breast surgeries this is the sub serratus plane block where uh, the probe is moved further laterally over the latissimus dorsi mu uh, muscle and here the local anesthetic is deposited below these two muscles which overlie the rib at this level so basically latissimus dorsi and the serratus muscles they are lying over this area and the lo local anesthetic is deposited below these two muscles and uh, needle uh, we place the probe just lateral to the level where we placed it for the a uh, rhomboid uh, intercostal plane block and uh, it is at the level of t7 to t8 and this is the ultrasound image of local anesthetic being deposited so what is the advantage of these blocks why they have been described uh, uh, the advantage one advantage which uh, we can make out is that the site of injection is much away as compared to the other anterior and anterolateral blocks so basically some surgeons they are much uh, res resistant to these kind of anterior blocks because they say that their planes are distorted and they do not want it to be used so in those cases if the surgeon is very adamant about not uh, those blocks then we can go posteriorly and if the erector spinae plane block is uh, either the skill is not available or you find it more risky like in patients who are anticoagulated and you don't want to go near the spine in those those cases we can use these blocks it's uh it is away from the in the uh, from the serratus plane so the it avoids the lateral uh, long thoracic nerve blockage and the winging of the scapula which can be a complication of that block uh disadvantage is that axilla is not covered and the anterior cutaneous nerve and the supraclavicular nerve they are not covered so it cannot provide a complete analgesia for breast surgery thoracodorsal supraclavicular and anterior cutaneous nerves are not blocked now we have spoken about all these blocks from anterior to posterior from uh, within the spine like thoracic epidural uh, is one possibility then outside we have paravertebral block then further outside we have this uh, pa this uh, we have this erector spinae plane block then further laterally we have so many options now uh, which i have described so how do we how do we choose this is a very very busy slide and uh, but this is a amazing slide it sums up everything about the breast the innervation the choice of the block so it is a very very good slide regarding the breast surgery we can just uh, 
see the see our breast surgery what kind of surgery is being planned we can discuss with the surgeon we can then uh, see the innervation of that area and accordingly we can plan our blocks so these are all these options they are there like local anesthetic infiltration it will it can cover everything from everywhere uh, it can be cover it can cover the superior pole it can cover the medial area it can cover the lateral area but uh, we uh, it will be short lasting and not very effective then we have this intercostal brachial now let's see which block can cover it these inter, inter, infraclavicular block pex2 block and uh, serratus may or may not these all will cover this area then we can see this uh, long thoracic nerve it is covered by the serratus plane block and uh, it is not covered with the pex block and uh, it uh, it may be covered with the pex block but it is well covered with the serratus plane block then uh, we come to the this area lateral and medial pectoral nerve serratus plane block will not cover this area so for surgeries where we are planning where there is a plan for some implant uh, or some processes to be placed below the pectoral um, muscles then we might choose pex2 over the serratus plane block so that is the uh, that would be the choice for pex2 block otherwise serratus and pex2 they cover almost the same area of innervation then regarding the anterior cutaneous branch blocks uh, anterior cutaneous branch these are not covered with any of these blocks so they have to be separately blocked so as we can see the pex2 it covers almost all the branches except the anterior cutaneous branch which can be separately given and so, supraclavicular area where, which can be infiltrated easily just below the clavicle so it will provide almost complete, complete analgesia so using this uh, combination and permutation we can decide according to the type of surgery we can decide which block to be used okay so this is the these are the two blocks which in my opinion are very very easy to learn very uh, uh, less invasive and cover almost everything similar to your paravertebral block or maybe even better some things are covered with these blocks which are not covered even with the paravertebral block so these uh, blocks are the way to go so we can decide according to the area and the innervation but pex2 block is the one which covers the maximum innervation to the breast and it is uh, with further uh, more evidence if we have in our kitty we can decide uh, which block will be better now comparing these blocks head to head the thoracic epidural analgesia the paravertebral block and the thoracic wall block uh the uh, pros and cons the thoracic epidural it provides maximum analgesia and even anesthesia it provides bilateral effect so for surgeries where bilateral procedures are planned it may be still be an option though it is almost a abundant kind of block for chest walls uh, for breast surgery and so i did not touch this block too much but we still need to be aware that it is one option especially in cases where the patient is where a patient is at very high risk of general anesthesia and we want to avoid general anesthesia as has been described in task group also many a times then in uh, it it has many complication which are well known and the bleeding complication is the one which we most of us are very very scared about and we want to go more peripheral now paravertebral block it is basically a kind of unilateral thoracic epidural and however it also has the complication of inadvertent epidural or intrathecal injection it leads to sympathetic blockade hypotension pneumothorax remains 0.5% of cases and mod bleeding complication are still a major uh, concern then coming to the lateral blocks that is your uh, thoracic wall block which are less invasive much easier to perform safe in patients with anticoagulants away from critical structures they provide comparable or even better post operative pain scores and real time visualization of the drug spread is possible and it provide leads to less complications so 
the how the regional anesthesia for breast surgery has evolved over the time earlier before almost before 2010 in at least in my experience the surgeon used to do local infiltration for all breast surgery and sometimes paravertebral block was given uh, using lor uh, lor guided at that time or maybe nerve stimulator guided then in 2011 to 15 we evolved towards ultrasound guided paravertebral block and then uh, when chest wall blocks were described we moved on to ultrasound guided chest wall blocks so in my practice nowadays almost all patients they receive serratus anterior plane block under general anesthesia or sometimes uh, pex2 block but these can be done under general anesthesia and it, they take very less time and the patient discomfort is also not a, a problem and they can also be done without general anesthesia using sedation in the preoperative area to save on ot time they are very very safe depending on the type of surgery whether it is a simple mastectomy whether it is a modified radical mastectomy whether tissue expander is being placed whether ld flap flap is to be taken so we need to decide which kind of nerves are supplying like simple mastectomy only intercostal nerves are to be blocked axillary node dissection only intercostal uh, intercostal brachial nerve is to be blocked then when tissue expander is to placed to be placed then pectoral nerve and when ld flap is to be uh, uh, done then thoraco dorsal nerve will additionally need to be blocked so for these blocks as we can see the these thoracic epidural and paravertebral are option for some of them even they are not the universal option for all the blocks but as we can see the uh, thoracic chest wall blocks they are the option for all of them the pex2 is there in all of them so uh, without uh, uh, thinking if uh, we are if we are skilled in pex2 that can be easily be used and even serratus anterior plane block in my experience it provides a excellent analgesia so sum to summarize the evidence paravertebral block is a technical technique of choice in case we want anesthesia of the hemithorax nowadays in uh, uh, it is used mainly to provide anesthesia and in some cases analgesia if somebody is very fond of paravertebral blocks and it can be used to provide good um, a good anesthesia of the hemithorax in patients who are a contraindication who have some uh, some risk factors which uh, uh, which will be uh, if the patient is subjected to general anesthesia the patient stands a very very high risk in those cases it can be used as a alternative to general anesthesia and then uh, coming to the saps and uh, sap and the pex block it has a very good evidence as of now and the evidence is uh, still accumulating and uh, then coming to erector spinae plane blocks uh, earlier reports they showed it as it was inferior to paravertebral and sap block but the there are still the evidence is uh, now uh, coming up more evidence is coming up and many of the studies have they have shown that it is equivalent to paravertebral block newer block we still need lot more evidence before we start routinely using them for breast surgery they are still only in experimental stages where they are being done the studies are being done and the evidence is still coming out however we still need the to prove the non analgesic benefit like increased length uh, decreased length of stay and mortality and morbidity benefit for all kind of regional anesthesia techniques for breast surgery so that is the future research direction to conclude the primary indication for thoracic wall block is as an alternative to thoracic uh, to these central blocks like paravertebral and epidural which are more invasive the choice will depend on the area of coverage and the technical consideration uh, then the paravertebral block and uh, epidural block they are the anesthetic technique of choice as uh, rather than uh, analgesic technique so as of now they are considered more of a alternative to general anesthesia then thoracic wall blocks they are safer in patients on anticoagulants they rely on the passive spread depending on the volume and the direction and the speed of injection uh, they all these factors they affect the spread hence there is a, a slightly unpredictable amount of analgesia and these blocks they chest wall blocks they are opioid sparing rather than opioid eliminating so the final verdict is that you should always know your patient your surgeon the kind of surgery being uh, planned your your own skill and then plan accordingly so to go peripheral is the way forward thank you very much thank you ma'am for uh, such an elaborate lecture 
Uh, we'll uh, take the questions later as we are running short of time. Uh, I would. Uh, we have, uh, I think Anju has actually do, done two lectures now. It was only 30 minutes, it's gone to 60 minutes. Oh. Yeah, I think that is. Uh, I'm really sorry about that, sir. I'm, I'm very stickler. I told you, I'm very stickler about timing. I can understand five or 10 minutes. We had uh, 10 minutes uh, for discussion, but uh, we've lost that time as well. Uh, so we will invite uh, Dr. Narish Paliwal now. Can we uh, stop sharing the screen, please? Yes, sir. Dr. Narish, sir. Okay. You want to introduce him? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Narish, uh, sir, for uh, uh, topic on segmental anesthesia. Without further ado, uh, let us uh, invite him and uh, allow him to start the lecture. You need to tell something about him. Uh... <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no need. Uh, we are running short of time. We'll just start. No, 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 my... no still, that is, doesn't mean that we don't introduce you, Dr. Paliwal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Naresh, sir. One minute. Is my screen visible? All you need to tell him that he's a well-known personality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dr. Naresh Paliwal, sir, is uh, quite famous in the anesthetist, anesthetist uh, Facebook group. He's well known for his uh, posts on segmental spinal and uh, Texket uh, sedation. And uh, we have allotted a topic of uh, uh, where he is quite famous in the anesthetist Facebook group. Uh, so he's an associate professor anesthesia in uh, Amravati, uh, and he has uh, done his MD anesthesia. His other area of interest is regional anesthesia. And he's also been awarded the best paper award for Dexket in Ludwig Sanjana. Over to you, uh, Naresh Paliwal, sir, for your topic, segmental spinal anesthesia. So, first of all, good evening to everyone. And very much thankful to Global Anesthesia Society and Prakriya Hospital for inviting me for this lecture. Without wasting much time, I'll just start my lecture on the role of segmental spinal in the 21st century. Just a minute, I'll just hide this. I'll just, just a minute. Okay, well, my topic for today's presentation is role of psychological spinal in the 21st century. There is changing scenario about segmental spinals. It was some 10, 12 years back when I started presenting this topic. Uh, my title used to be segmental spinal, is it possible? But that time the idea was not actually, um, I mean, accepted very well by the people by giving spinal at a higher lumbar or thoracic levels. And there, is, there was a hell lot of criticism about this. So after two, three years, I started presenting a topic on septic concerns in segmental spinal. Then it was during this COVID pandemic that uh, everyone started just trying this segmental spinal and they found that it is a very good, uh, I mean, alternative to general anesthesia when you want to avoid general anesthesia in few cases. And it became the most trending regional anesthesia technique all over, all in freelance setups as well as in the corporate setups. And also there was a recent article in British Journal of Anesthesia about the defining the role of uh, Segment of spinal in the 21st century. So I changed my title to the role of segmental spinal in 21st century and beyond. I'll just read out the conclusion, which is very loud and clear in British Journal of Anesthesia in the recent article in April 2022. Here they mentioned that TSA has been incorporated into the armamentorium of increasing number of anesthetists around the world. The main rationale supporting its use is to avoid subjecting high-risk patients to general anesthesia while still providing a safe and effective anesthetic. Despite the absence of larger trials, there is evidence from small court studies and multiple case reports that TSA may be considered a safe, feasible, effective alternative anesthetic technique and may be used in patients where other anesthetic techniques pose a higher risk. So the conclusion was very loud and clear. Now coming back to my topic. 
Uh, what is segmental spinal? The term is often used synonymously with thoracic spinal, but the low doses of drugs used at a high number levels even produce a segmental effect. So the ideal definition should be a blocking of the required dermatomes essential for the proposed surgical procedure by giving low doses of the drugs injected near the targeted nerve roots. That often necessitates giving spinal at high number or to lower thoracic levels. Lower the dose of drug use, more likely to produce a true segmental block. There are some factors which make segmental spinal feasible. At thoracic level, the spinal cord is positioned anteriorly, leaving a significant space between the posterior and the spinal cord. The nerve roots are very slight and thin, and also the amount of CSF at uh, thoracic level is, is comparatively less. Both these factors make uh, the blocking of the uh, thoracic nerve roots very easy with a low volume of drugs used. And also, there is no difference in the onset time for isobaric and uh, hyperbaric drugs at thoracic levels, while the isobaric drugs may take a little longer time to onset at uh, lumbar levels. And there is also natural thoracic kyphosis at T765. Whenever we talk about segmental spinal, there are a few safety concerns which are always um, asked. Uh, first and foremost is, uh, can there be neurological injury when the spinal is given at uh, levels before the end of the spinal cord? Can there be a ventilatory impairment because of the extensive thoracic nerve blocks? Third is, can there be a bradycardia and hypotension due to blocking of the cardioceptor fibers T1 to T4 and extensive sympathetic nerve blocks? And last but not the least about the medical issues, as it is still not uh, in the standard textbooks. So the major concern is damage to the spinal cord. This is a midline MRI of the spinal column. Here you can see the cervical enlargement fills almost the entire spinal canal at the level. In the thoracic segments, the spinal cord is positioned anteriorly, leaving a significant space between the posterior and the spinal column spinal cord. At the lumbar level, the lateral space disappears almost completely. This is a magnified view. Here you can see there is a sufficient space to accommodate your spinal needle intrathecally for giving spinal. When you do it cautiously, you can very well give a spinal at this level. There is a sufficient space. In Belloni and Goya did a study on the low incidence of neurological complications after accidental neural puncture. Uh, in thoracic epidurals, and they provided a anatomic explanation for this. They measured the exact distance at various levels, and they found the distance to be around 5.19 millimeters at T2 level, 7.75 millimeters at T5 levels, and 5.88 millimeters at T10 levels. Again, Lee Ari did study of anatomy of the spinal canal in different positions, supine lateral and sitting positions, and they found the distance to be more in all positions at mid thoracic levels but more so in the lateral and most in the sitting positions. This is the position most of us use for giving spinal. Too. So the distance is most in sitting positions. At T6, you can find a distance around 5.95 millimeters. The spinal cord sits ventral in the apex of the thoracic curve. And when you flex the spine, the, it uh, goes further anteriorly. You can see in this figure, left hand side shows the distance between anterior dura and the spinal cord. The right-hand side figure shows the distance between the posterior dura and the spinal cord. Here again, the lateral view of the MRI. Because of the angulation which is required to perform spinal at mid-thoracic levels, the distance between the posterior dura and the spinal cord is further increased. At mid-thoracic levels, you may need an angulation of around 40 to 45 degrees to perform a spinal. Here you can see the distance is almost 8 millimeters at uh, mid to lower thoracic, mid thoracic levels, which is around 4.5 millimeters, in just half of that at lower thoracic levels. There are some additional points which favor the safety of segment spinal. In various studies, it has been shown that the incidence of uh, neurological injuries after accidental neural puncture in thoracic epidurals is very less. The thoracic epidural, as we all know, is done by almost everywhere and even by the trainees, but still the incidence of neurological injuries is very less. The reason is there is sufficient distance. And in uh, many of us are actually using high lumbar or thoracic spaces unknowingly, uh, in, especially in the obese and parturient patients. 
in one study it was found that only 29% of the anesthetists were correctly identifying the interrotable space for giving spinal it was confirmed with ultrasound that only 29% had uh, correctly identified the interrotable space for giving spinal what this means is they were inadvertently using uh, this thoracic spinal for giving spinal anesthesia and 11 of spinal cord termination is also variable. It can be as high as T11 or as low as L3. The second issue which is often raised is ventilatory impairment. Uh, here the main inspiratory muscle of respiration is diaphragm which is usually unaffected. Expiration at rest is a passive process. <clears throat> so it's not uh, affected much. Forceful expiration and cuffing may get affected due to paralysis of anterior abdominal wall muscles. But because of the low doses of the drugs used, the, there is minimal motor weakness and that preserves the cuffing ability. The third uh, issue is bradycardia and hypotension. Can there be bradycardia? The heart rate may decrease if block extends T1 to T4, blocking the cardiacetal fibers. But because of the lumbosacral sparing and less venodilatation in the lower limbs, the right atrial feeling is usually maintained and the reverse bend bridge reflex is not initiated. And that sustains the outflow from the right uh, atrium and great veins, maintaining the heart rate. The less hypotension is due to the less sympathetic blockade and lumbosacral sparing. About the medical legal issues and litigations, now there is enough evidence to prove its utility in cases where it is most indicated. We can very well use this technique in cases where it is most indicated and general anesthesia may be dangerous. So most cases of uh, Litigation are against regional anesthesia, but still uh, thoracic epidural is being performed day in and day out, even by the first year trainees also, and there is accidental puncture also. So if that can be explained, why not this segmental spinal? Uh, for segmental spinal, proper explanation and consent is must. Till the time it appears in the textbooks, we can keep our fingers crossed. About the feasibility and indications, there are four aspects of feasibility. First is technical, second is economic, third is legal, and fourth is operational. Technically, it's not very difficult and different from your routine spinal, just a change in angulations. Those who are doing the thoracic epidurals routinely, they can find it very easy. So technically, it's not very difficult. Economic, it's very, very, very economic. I mean, you just can't compare it with <laughs> anything legally. Still a question mark till it appears in the textbooks. Operational feasibility, it is operational in all sorts of setups, be it a uh, freelance setup or a corporate setup with basic minimum facilities. It can be operational with a, it has a good learning curve. About the indications, all the intra-abdominal surges, be it open or lap, breast, superficial thoracic, and even some awake thoracoscopic surgeries like bullectomy, thymectomy, lung volume reductions and all that can be done under segmental spinal. Then also the prone and lateral position musculoskeletal surgeries and some spine surgeries, which are also possible under segmental spinal. There are some advantages over routine spinal and general anesthesia. The upper abdominal thoracic and breast surgeries, which were thought to be out of domain of spinal anesthesia till now, are possible under segmental spinal. The higher levels of the blocks can be achieved with just half the dose that is used at the lumbar levels. There are minimal hemodynamic fluctuations, early recovery, and voiding with the uh, use of segmental spinals. And it has special advantages for general anesthesia in patients with respiratory comorbidities. It can avoid patients going on um, ventilator in such cases. And there is also lower incidence of post op nausea and vomiting. There are three different modes of using segmental spinal. Either it can be a single shot spinal for short to duration surgeries or it can be combined with epidurals for uh, very morbid cases when you want to use a very low doses intrathecally. In that case, uh, epidural can be used as a backup to uh, provide adequate levels for that surgery, or it can act as a, uh, act to spread the drug used intrathecally to wider uh, uh, areas by epidural volume extension technique. And thirdly, it can also be useful for post-op analgesia. And the third option is, can be a continuous segmental spinal anesthesia using spinocast. This can be used as an intentional technique 
or it can be a technique used when you get accidental dural puncture during thoracic epidurals by using fractionated low doses of local anesthetics to achieve the targeted levels. This can be useful technique in very morbid ill cases for long duration surgeries. Among the drug options, either isobaric or hyperbaric alone, or a combination of uh, the three, iso, hyper, or hypobaric can be used. In general, the isobaric drugs are preferred for laparoscopic, thoracoscopic, breast and superficial uh, or intra-abdominal surgeries in morbidly frail patients where relaxation is not an issue. And hyperbaric drugs can be a choice for open surgeries in male muscular patients where you need to have a better relaxation. Hyperbaric drugs as such are not used alone. They can be used along with either iso or hyperbaric drugs in combination you know, for achieving most of the times a cephalic spread, better cephalic spread. There are some advantages of isobaric drugs. They are less sensitive to position issues and when used in low doses, they have a propensity to block sensory nerves in preference to motor ones. This is sometimes labeled as selective anesthesia. And the onset is gradual. There is hemodynamic stability, early ablation and voiding with the use of isobaric drugs. The spinal can be given directly in the operative positions uh, with uh, isobaric drugs. Uh, with hyperbaric drugs, you uh, need to give the dependent position always for giving in lateral blocks or this thing. But with isobaric drugs, spinal can be given directly in the lateral position. Spinal can be given before epidural and a space higher than epidural. There are some disadvantages of isobaric drugs. Uh, levels of block cannot be modified by any change of positions. There can be sacral sparing when low doses at higher spaces are used. This actually can be an advantage or a disadvantage at times. There is a longer onset time at lumbar levels. The isobaric drugs take a little longer time for onset. There is less muscle relaxations in some male muscular patients can be uh, noticed by surgeons. Otherwise, it goes unnoticed in a morbidly frail patients. These drugs, isobaric drugs, are very sensitive to temperature variations that can become slightly hyperbaric when cooled at 24 degrees centigrade and when warmed at 37 degrees centigrade can become slightly hypobaric. Amongst the available drug options and additives, isobaric drugs like lubipuacan 0.5%, ropuacan 0.5, 0.75%, and chlorpocan 1%, these are the isobaric drugs. Amongst the hyperbaric drugs, till date only bupuacan heavy 0.5% was available, but now we have leo bupuacan 0.5% and ropuacan 0.75% heavy, which is available. They can be used. And in the additives, there are n number of additives which can be used, but uh, generally the additives which will not cause any respiratory depression or post of nausea or vomiting are usually preferred for post of uh, early recovery and uh, ambulatory effects. So I usually prefer fentanyl, either 20 to 25 micrograms. Apart from the itching, it is a very good uh, uh, itching which can be troublesome with fentanyl. Uh, it has no other side effects with these much doses. Dexmet can be used in the dose range of two to 10 micrograms. And Dexmet has a special advantage of uh, prolonging the spinal anesthesia in a dose dependent manner. It can prolong duration of effect almost three to three and a half hours with a dose of 10 micrograms. Ketamine can be used <clears throat> in the dose range of 20 to 25 milligrams. Ketamine, though potentially in the sensory block, is known to shorten the motor block time. And clonidine in the range of 30 micrograms can very well be added as an additive. This is important, how to decide the dose and site of injection. In general, if you keep in mind that one ml of the isobaric drug spreads two to three segments above and below the site of injection. Uh, what that means is two to 2.5 ml of the drug is sufficient to block segments from T2 to L5S1 if spinal is given at T10. The 10th thoracic space lying in the center of the surgical field for upper abdominal surgeries. So, and the dose of local anesthetic, the additive and the site of injection along the near axis can be varied according to need. For breast and superficial thoracic surgeries, spinal needs to be given at mid-thoracic levels and a dose of around 1.2 to 1.5 ml maximum 
with some additive. If you increase the dose, there will be unnecessary spread to the unwanted segments and may cause cardiovascular and respiratory issues. So it's always better to use the dose range of around 1.2 to 1.5 ml maximum. It can provide a duration of 60 to 90 minutes or a little more if the XMED is used as additives. You can combine it with the epidural or some sort of block if you want a longer duration of effect. These are the different levels which are required for uh, some breast surgeries and assessment of the levels achieved. Like for MRM, you need levels from C5 to T7. For mastectomy with transverse rectus to flap, you need levels C5 to L1. For uh, breast augmentation and partial mastectomy, just T1 to T7 is needed. The epidural scoring scale for arm moments, which is uh, used to assess the uh, motor blockage during uh, thoracic epidurals, can very well be used to quantify the blocks achieved by secondary spinal. There are four grades, zero to three. Hand grip is C8, T1. Wrist flexion is C7, C8. And elbow flexion is C5, C6. Position of the patient for giving spinal with isovaric drugs, you can use any position. But to plain liver BP can 0.5% is slightly hypovaric. And if you give spinal in the sitting position and patient kept seated for some time, you can have some higher levels of block with this sucks. So this you have to keep in mind when you're using sitting positions with DOBP. Okay. Using two drug combinations, sitting position is mandatory for giving spinal initially. Type of spinal little, you can use a CSE kit if you are uh, using epidural along with segmental spinal. This is the safest and the easiest option. Uh, it can also provide a safety. Then either quinky or pencil point needles can be used, but the problem with quinky needle, uh, pencil point needles is the fluid exit hole is around 1.7 millimeters away from the tip of the needle. So you have to enter a little bit more, around two millimeters more intrathecally. And that can lead to some paresthesia and some injuries. So it's always better to use the quinky type needle, sharp needles. These are some landmarks to identify the interval spaces required to um, locate. It can be done either by the uh, surface markings like C7 uh, cervical vertebrae is the prominent spinous process. From there, you can count down. The root of the spine of the scapula corresponds with T3. Inferior angle of the scapula corresponds with T7. Or the lower rib margin is around 10 centimeters away from the midpoint of L1. Or if you have a ultrasound, you can count the levels from L5-S1 in the parasagittal oblique view. You can Look at the 12th rib and go upwards, or you can look at the first rib and go downwards accordingly. You can look at your space for giving spinal. There are some anatomical hurdles for uh, thoracic spinal. The spinous processes from T4 to T9 are sharply angled, and there is very narrow interlaminar spaces at these levels. These are usually difficult with uh, midline approach. So either a paramedian approach or a paraspinous approach can be a better choice at these mid-thoracic levels for giving spine. This are some tips to follow for giving paramedian approach you know, for thoracic spinal. Uh, you can go just one centimeter lateral to the inferior part of the spinous process you want to give spinal at. With an angulation of 15 to 20 degrees medially and a uh, around 40 to 45 degrees cephalac, you can go and uh, either hit the lamini first and then change your angle according to the thing gradually. And you can enter the interlaminar space with the paramedian approach, or you can use a paraspinous approach. Actually, this paraspinous approach is um, most, time, most of the times used when it is difficult to palpate the spinous process in uh, obese patients. We are actually using this technique. You go just by the side of the spinous process and hit the lamini and then go cephalate uh, bit by bit. So most of the times when you are using midline approach, you are uh, using a paraspinous approach unknowingly. Slide alongside the spinous process and you can slip in the interlaminous space. Ultrasound imaging of the thoracic spine, T10 to T12 are similar to your lumbar vertebrae. T4, T9 are cheaply angled, as I already told you. There is very small window in the parasagittal oblique view. 
and there is no window in the transverse view. I have removed the other slides of uh, ultrasound to make a presentation brief. There are some safety measures for successful use of segmental spinal. You need to do a thorough pre assessment of the patient. You need to know what are the dermatomes involved in the proposed surgery. If ultrasound is available, you can do a pre-procedure scan to see if there are any abnormalities in the spine or location of the proper space and direction of the needle, identification of the landmarks, and selection of the proper drug, dose, site, and mode of segmental spinal according to need for surgery. After giving spinal, you need to assess the levels properly and monitoring and use the proper sedation. This is a slide to show just the uh, different dermatomes which are required for different surgery. Now coming to my segmental spinal profile, more than 3,500 surgeries in the last 10 to 12 years, initially only for high-risk cases, but now uh, about 50% of my SAB profile is segmental spine. Till date, there have been very few partial failures, but fortunately, no mishaps. We recently conducted two live workshops in 2022, one at Nausari and one at Amrauti. It was very successful workshops. We did along six cases in each workshop. A live demonstration was done. I usually do complete pre anesthetic evaluation of the patient. Emergency airway cart and drugs, everything is kept ready. When it's excess, minimum mandatory monitoring. No separate sedative pre medications I usually use. I use lateral decubitus position for giving spinal 27 gauge needle, drug dose site mode according to patient and surgery. For intra abdominal surgeries, for short duration surgeries, I usually prefer chloroprocaine when the I know that the surgery will not extend beyond uh, 45 to 60 minutes. I prefer chloroprocaine either lap or open surgeries and add some additives. Uh, like uh, ketamine or fentanyl. For mid-duration surgeries, around 60 to 120 minutes, I use ISO or hyperbaric drugs with some additives. This you can take as a rough estimate for each and every ASA12 patients. For average female patients, you can use 2 ml plus additive. And for average male patient, you can use 2.5 ml plus additive around T10 level. And you can do all intra-abdominal surgeries with this much of dose in patients where there are not much of comorbidities and little bit of hemodynamic fluctuation is allowed. I usually combine these segmental spinals with either transverse abdominal plane block, rectus sheet block, or erector spinal plane block for open surgeries or local anesthesia at the port site for uh, laparoscopic surgeries. For breast surgeries, I use uh, isobaric drugs, 1.2, 1.5 ml with some additive at T456 phase and usually combine it with either epidural or serratus anterior plane block. But recently I started combining it with erectospiny plane block with full concentration of drug. As we are doing only a unilateral block, I use a full concentration 0.5% of leuvipuicin, around 20 ml for post of analysia, and it has provided a very good results. About to a little bit about the two drug technique, a combination of any two can be used, either ISO, hyper, along with hyperbaric. Uh, when you want a prolonged effect at lumbosacral roots, prolonged and assured effects at lumbosacral roots for some abdominal pelvic surgeries, like TLH, then colorectal surgeries, etc., where some extensive effect which cannot be provided by using isobaric low dose isobaric drugs at higher levels. So, in those cases, you can use a combination of hyperbaric and isobaric drugs. Spinal needs to be given in a sitting position around 10 L1 level with 0.5 to 1 ml of hyperbaric drug initially, followed by 1.5 to 2 ml of isobaric drugs in different syringes with some attitudes. This technique also can be used for very high risk cases of LSCS, where you can even curtail the doses of both the drugs, which provides a very good results. Then hyperbaric drugs can be combined with either ISO or hyperbaric drugs. This is mostly done to have some wider and sparse cephalic spread with segmental block, like for uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, when you are using very low doses intrathecally of either ISO or hyperbaric drug. In those cases, you can combine it with hyperbaric drugs as the position kept in for laparoscopic cholecystectomy is head up position. So the higher levels can be achieved with uh, hyperbaric drugs and that can avoid the shoulder tip pain. 
after giving spinal, the patient turned to desired position, sensory block tested by pin prick. Usually sets in three to four minutes. Minimal gradual hemorrhagic fluctuations occur in the first 10 minutes. No respiratory issues, even with high levels of block, as it is mostly a sensory block. Initial partial involvement of the sacral roots can be seen in few cases, depending on the dose you have used and the space you have used. But that usually recurs by the end of surgery. No additional supplements if levels are adequate. Patients can be completely mobilized in four to six hours. To sum up, it's a very useful technique with many advantages, minimal risk with due precautions. No need to panic even if the block level is found to be higher than desired. It's mostly a sensory blocks. Lab surgery is mainly due to sedation as it is under all regionals. If available, ultrasound can be helpful for more safety. Then technique is reserved for experienced clinicians with good learning curve. There are some do's and don'ts. Uh, which need to follow in segment spinal. These are the new things which I have added to my presentation. In the do's, uh, before proceeding, you should know in detail about the technique. Uh, what are the various drugs, doses, additives, and sites of injection that you all can uh, are available with you and you can use. Then you should know about your surgeon too. If you are not, uh, I mean, he's not your regular surgeon, then you need to know something about your surgeon, how adaptable your surgeon is to the regional anesthesia techniques. How, I mean, is he used to doing it in regional anesthesia, especially laparoscopic surgeries? How flexible your surgeon is? I mean, um, if you ask him to do, keep the minimum IAP of around 12 to 14 initially or the minimum flow rate initially, will he listen to it or he is adamant? and how efficient your surgeon is, then you know, how much time he will take what, for that particular surgery. So accordingly, you can choose your mode of segment spinal. You need to know about the surgery also. Uh, apart from being it is open or lap, you need to know about the approximate duration of the surgery and extent of the surgery. Then about the patient also. How cooperative your patient is. Is he willing for uh, sole regional anesthesia or he will need some sedatives or some, some supplement uh, during the spinals. What are the comorbidities of the patient and the risk benefit ratio of general anesthesia versus segment of spine. Always do the spinal in the position which you are comfortable unless there is a specific indication for using a specific uh, position. You do, if you are accustomed to doing it in sitting position, do it in the sitting position. In lateral, do it in a lateral position. If available, you can do a pre-procedural ultrasound scan. When, especially when the spine is a difficult one, there is scoliosis or some obese patient can just mark the landmarks. Do use a CAC kit. Whenever you find that uh, you are not uh, very confident about giving spinal at uh, thoracic levels and you are used to using uh, thoracic epidurals, then you can just Locate the thoracic epidural with the, your epidural needle and then use a spinal needle through your epidural needle to your spinal. Do always use multimodal analgesia in the form of some blocks or the drugs like paracetamol, dexamethasone or diclofenac, which will not produce post-op nausea, vomiting and respiratory depression especially for the cases where early ambulation and voiding is needed. As always with uh, other uh, spinals, you do prepare and keep ready your backup plan in case there is inadequate effects or levels that you be ready with your backup plan. There are some don'ts. Don't force the surgeon if he is not accustomed to do, doing it in regionals, especially laparoscopic surgeries, unless there is a strong indication in favor of secondary spinal. Don't be rough and rusty. Advance gently, millimeter by millimeter. There is no harm in removing stillet with every loss of resistance. You can just see for the free flow of CSF after every loss of resistance. Many times there is a gap in the this ligament of flavum at the mid thoracic levels, and you may not get the sensation of piercing that ligament of flavor. So, there's no harm in removing stillet after every loss of resistance. Don't proceed if slightest of paresthesia is encountered. Just withdraw the needle and change the direction. 
Don't use higher doses of local anesthesia at the mid or high thoracic spaces. The dictum should be higher the space, lower the dose. If you want to use the higher doses, go to the lower space. Don't unnecessarily add too many additives together. If you are not accustomed to using these additives individually or used to it uh, using it, so don't unnecessarily add too many additives together. Don't use excessive sedation with higher levels of blocks, especially in laparoscopic surgeries. If you use uh, heavy sedation, then there can be some airway issues and the surgeon may find it difficult to proceed with the change of respiratory pattern. Don't panic with early hemodynamic and respiratory issues. Most of the times when the patient complains, uh, he's, uh, he or she is having difficulty in breathing. So it is most of the times is due to the hypotension and hypoperfusion to the respiratory centers, which uh, leads the patient to complain about uh, difficulty in breathing. Just correction of the hypotension most of the times corrects this. And many times there is a loss of sensation of breathing with such high levels of drug. Just reassurance and O2 supply is what is needed. So whatever hemodynamic fluctuations are there, they are minimal and gradual and easily manageable. Don't hesitate to call for help or communicate in case of any doubts. Now I will just uh, quickly go through some of the videos just to show how I mean, straightforward it is at the lower thoracic levels. This is a case of probably umbilical hernia. I am using a 27 gauge needle. Low thoracic spaces are as easy as your lumbar spaces. This is laparoscopic cholecystotomy in a morbidly uh, female patient diabetic hypertension along with ETCO2 monitoring. I'll just go quickly. This is with ETCO2 monitoring under segmental spinal. This is MRM with epidural at T45 and a spinal at T56 with just 1.2 ml of the drug. And you can see the levels being tested. You can see how comfortable the patient is, even with such high levels of block. Here achieved a level from C8 to T10. <clears throat> you can see here, she had no sensation at C8, but her grip strength was good, indicating only a sensory block. This is MRM being done. This was a case of traumatic diaphragmatic hernia. I think probably for the first time it was done under the sole regional anesthesia. I didn't find any report of it to being done under sole regional. I did it under a combined uh, segmental spinal and epidural. Epidural was put at T78 and spinal was given at T89. You can see here the whole of the left hemithorax was filled with intestines. This is diaphragmatic mesh repair being done. The same patient at the end of surgery is ready to move himself. The next day of the same patient, complete expansion of the left uh, lung. This was obstructed umbilical hernia. You can see his respiratory pattern. It was done under combined <coughs> epidural and segmental spinal. Epidural was put at T910 and the spinal was given at T1011. There was a full length transverse incision in the abdomen. The surgery went on for almost three and a half hours. This was a huge uh, ovarian cyst, almost to the size of a twin, uh, full-term twin pregnancy. It was compressing all the intra-abdominal structures. This was a morbid old lady, diabetes, hypertension. It was done in a two-drug technique. 0.5 ml of the hyperbaric drug was used at T12 L1 level initially. And then 2 ml of isobaric drug at the same level in different syringe. You can see this patient, she is comfortable up to the, her cyst was so big that it had to be ruptured. Her cystectomy, omentectomy and hysterectomy was done. 
this is again MRM being done combined epidural and secondary spinal. For spinal, the lateral approach had to be used. The few of the uh, I mean, few of the surgeons they complained that the cautery um, just uh, thirds up during um, this regional techniques. So, if you use a little bit of lower currents and use a bipolar cautery, then or uh, very high end cauteries don't have such issues. You can see here during axillary dissection also, he's using bipolar cautery and no such issues. The same patient at the end of surgery getting herself shifted. This patient had her full course of chemotherapy, so she had no hairs. This is TLH with two drug technique. Laparoscopic hysterectomy. You can see at the end of surgery, complete regression of effect. This is a patient of CA vocal cord with uh, post record occlusion for feeding gastro uh, gastrostomy. Uh, tracheostomy was already done. Segment of spinal was given with just 1.5 ml of the drug at T89 level. And see, he's moving his legs during the surgery. This is acute ruptured ectopic spinal at T1112 with 2.5 ml of the chlorprocaine plus 25 micrograms of fentanyl. You can see I'm talking Hello? to the patient, patient is comfortable. Whole of the abdomen is filled with blood. This is a patient with uh, Posted for TLH, uh, AAD with uh, bacillary invagination. There was a diffuse disc bulge at uh, C56. Uh, her C1, C2 fixation was done and there was limited mouth opening. And patient used to get vertigo and some giddiness during her neck moments. And she also had some tingling numbness in the upper arm due to C4, C5, C6 bulge. The patient was very much worried about her neck moments. She was given the option of segmental spinal. She was a relative of a doctor and she happily accepted this. And she was very happy at the end of surgery. It was done under sole two drug technique. This is ruptured liver abscess in a 21 years young female. Hemoglobin was just 4.9. A CRP was raised, creatine is 1.27, and her total load count was around 48,000. It was done with a single shot segmental spinal. All of the abdomen was filled with pus. You see, this is how we usually monitor ETCO2. When the special probe for monitoring ETCO2 is not available, I just cut a 20, uh, 12 gauge uh, nail cat tip and attach it to ETCO2 monitor probe. This is a simple appendicectomy with ETCO2 monitoring. Patient getting herself shifted. This is a pediatric patient, eight years old for laparoscopic appendicectomy. Uh, see, I am using the same twenty-seven gauge needle. Just remove the stellate at the first loss of resistance, then proceed gently. You can see the patient is comfortable. Only dex kit was used as a sedation. Let's see the patient. This was a, a very obese patient, 132 kg for hysteroscopic removal of a polyp. The spinal was given in sitting position at T12L1. This was a patient after one hour of the procedure. She was propped up and moving her legs. And this is after three and a half hours. She was completely mobilized. This was a patient who had a typical history. He was posted for laparoscopic uh, polycystectomy. He, was a, he had a bit difficult airway and uh, intubation was very difficult. So after doing intubation, Somehow the uh, resident uh, did an accidental uh, 
extubation of this patient before the start of surgery. And then there was a lot of issues. So the surgery was postponed and then again was posted after three weeks. This time I convinced this patient for a secondary spinal and it was done with secondary spinal. And you can see the patient is watching his surgery. Consent was taken for posting this video. I was very happy with secondary spinal. This is during our last uh, workshop. I'll just show the erector spiny plane block for MRM. This is erector spiny plane block for post-op analgesia with full concentration of the drug and a spinal a T45 with 27 gauge needle in lateral position. This was during a workshop at Amrati. These are my two publications on segment spinal in Indian Journal of Anesthesia and Analgesia and one in the International Journal of Anesthesiology. And thank you very much for patient listening. Thank you, uh, Narissa. I hope was... I was uh, loud and clear. Yep. It was fantastic lecture. Wonderful. Sorry for already... going very fast. No, no, that was a pretty nice uh, kind of pace. It wasn't too fast or too slow. Uh, good pace. <laughs> uh, one of the, I think the members has written, Arnold Ashu has written, the man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I'm sure that was for you. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a question, sir. Yeah. Uh, when you approach, uh, you told about the paraspinal approach. Uh, is there a risk of uh, nerve root injury or uh, have you faced any kind of uh, nerve root injury or a paresthesia being elicited? Paresthesia before? is elicited at times. Yeah, but uh, subsequent there was no, uh, I mean, uh, any neurological complication afterwards. There are paresthesia. Uh, many people have experienced uh, some. Uh, you may quote a percentage around four five percent. But if you don't inject, uh, if you elicit a paresthesia and withdraw the needle and change the direction, then nothing usually happens. You should not inject uh, when you elicit a paresthesia. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, uh, the blocks, when you combine blocks, uh, for example, for MRM, you told that uh, you would be adding erector spine. So yeah. the uh, process is you first give erector spine and then give uh, spinal, right? Uh, this is just to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, let the block settle before okay. you use spinal. Because after giving spinal at such high level, you need to monitor the patient for initial 10 minutes. Even though you are giving a very small dose, still you want to monitor the patient in a supine position for any inadvertent uh, like respiratory or cardiac issues. So it's always better to use a block first, which will take some time and then use spinal so that immediately after spinal, you can turn the patient supine and you have access to all, I mean, airways and all uh, venous line, etc. So, I usually do that. And whenever I fail to give block, uh, I usually ask the surgeon to give PEC1, PEC2 blocks. I have posted those videos also on Facebook. So that is the simplest way, actually. You can ask your surgeon to give under vision PEC1, PEC2 blocks or serratus anterior plane block at the end of surgery. If he, he is not happy with your blocks uh, before surgery, you can ask your surgeons. You can guide him to give between PEC1, PEC2 and uh, at serratus anterior plane blocks for post-op analgesia, and they work very nicely. You do a surgery in single shot segmental spinal and ask your surgeon to give PEC1, PEC2 blocks under vision. That's the simplest thing. Yeah, so we got a few questions. Uh, one of the questions uh, from Gopal Jalwal from Ames Batinda. Is yes, sir, in which surgeries you prefer two drug mixture for a segmental block? Two drug technique. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, actually what happens when you use an adequate dose in the segment of spinal suppose if you use uh, around 2 ml or 2.5 ml there is some effect in the lumbosacral roots also with this much of dose yeah. and that much is usually sufficient for a duration of 60 to 70 minutes after mm-hmm. that the effect starts receding from the lumbosacral roots yeah so if you want a duration more than this for uh, pelvic manipulations like Uh, your tls surgeon may take around 2 hours yeah then you can combine a hyperbaric drug along with isobaric drugs to have a dense and assured effects and a prolonged effect at lumbosacral roots yeah and Absolutely. you can even add dexmit if you want yeah. a even little more duration uh, i have uh, got a duration almost up to 3.5 hours with dexmit just 5 micrograms in the same doses Uh, the another question is from Jay Prakash Kupasami, and he's asked, "Sir, do the doses change for supine versus sitting position?" Pardon? Is are the doses for your segmental spinal different for if you have you're doing the spinal in a sitting position or little position? For isobaric drugs, you don't need to change the drugs. Actually, for uh, hyperbaric drugs, if you are using a sitting position and very low doses, then there. you can have some issues with the levels achieved because by the time you inject the drug they can have some sacral spread and you may not achieve the adequate levels suppose for laparoscopic cholecystectomy you are using a hyperbaric drug in sitting position mm-hmm. then by the time you inject the drug there can be some lumbosacral spread of the drug by gravity and yes. then any amount of tilt may not uh, achieve your uh, this thing so in that case if you are using a sitting position you can combine a hyperbaric drug with hypobaric drug absolutely um <laughs> this is rambo i don't know who rambo is <laughs> which rambo this is uh, how to start about doing these i have met stiff refusal to even consider this for sick patients <laughs> yeah. so i think is just uh, wanting to have reassurance that somebody is doing it and how would you convince the surgeons to at least use it you just do a thoracic epidural and get your dura punctured <laughs> then I mean, that time you can that's, that's how that's I the simplest thing yeah. i mean whenever you get a accidental dura puncture during thoracic epidurals don't just uh, go away don't remove no, the needle just, just uh, push in, in a little drug catheter and get an effect no you can get your catheter in i think this can get a catheter in also yeah, yeah. no If same epidural, even the this, epidural catheters yeah i mean it's recommended anyway if you do yeah, it yeah. Puncture, you can actually just keep it for 24 hours yeah, to avoid pdbh yeah. uh, no i i just suggest maybe this uh, lecture is already recorded rambo can get his surgeons to, to see this video yeah absolutely he <laughs> can give the link <laughs> I posted one video of my surgeon who was initially not very, I mean, uh, in favor of regionals for uh, breast surgery and all this, and he himself posted that video. I posted on this World Anesthesia Day, yeah. the surgeon recommending this uh, segmental spinal. Yeah, he had done some four surgeries uh, recently under segmental spinal only. uh rajan has got a query for you he says routinely you used to describe our preparation of hyperbaric drugs it's missing here so would you like to just say anything how you prepare your hyperbaric drugs do you still order hyperbaric drugs prepare? is uh, i mean the drugs we are using isobaric drugs you cannot make a hyperbaric drug to a hyperbaric by any addition Yeah, you need to add uh, distal water to isobaric drugs to make I it see. hypobaric. Hmm. The drugs which are available, like Leovip, you can with a specific gravity of point nine 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 zero, is already on the verge of being hypobaric. And even a little addition of distal water, I mean, depends on for uh, what purpose you want uh, this thing. You can use a point one five percent of that. Uh, suppose if you add one point five ml of the drug. And three point five ml of distal water, you get a point one five percent of uh, leovipuvacin, which is truly hypobaric. Yeah. 
but the problem with hypovaric drugs is you need to use a higher volumes and they can have at times some unpredictable spread so these are uh, more useful when you in a very critically ill cases like mm-hmm. severe aortic stenosis or uh, some debridements in lower limbs for uh, uh, patients with arf or diabetic patients or when you and to want to have some higher cephalic spread in cases of some laparoscopic cholecystectomy so in the, those cases you can add these hypovaric drugs to your iso or hyperbaric drugs yeah i mean most of the isobaric drug i think like uh, 0.5% levobupic and plain do behave slightly more like hyperbaric than isobaric they are they are basically yeah. on the verge of being hyperbaric and yeah. as i already told you that if you keep the patient seated for some time after giving spinal they can achieve some higher levels of block higher because levels they are to... just uh, on the verge of being hypovaric and is also the temperature variations prefer, is that why you prefer little patient in most of no no i am actually of your used videos, to you had little patient no 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 i am actually used to doing it in lateral position lateral position as i always think is uh, comfortable for patient and sitting position is comfortable for anesthetists Yeah, patients that's... are more comfortable in lateral position. Yeah. Also, that's... the vasovagal is usually avoided. Absolutely, absolutely. And if at uh... all you want to use any sedation, you can use in better lateral position. There is one more question. I says, do adding fentanyl or dexmedrolin make any changes to baricity? Yeah, yeah. Uh, fentanyl is uh, hypovaric. Fentanyl has a specific gravity of point nine nine three six zero. Is truly hypovaric. and adding no, no, it to will they, will they will they affect so if you add it yeah, yeah it makes it more hypovaric they, they make it yeah so it it, it increases the spread of isobaric drugs it does that's yeah. why i usually prefer fentanyl in my yeah. segmental spinals yeah. they achieve a better spread better spread and yeah okay yeah right. and next med you use in a very small amount to just uh, rinse the syringe so it makes any difference i'm reading that yeah yeah and do you How use do you a 5 ml syringe to be, use the to rinse it and then use it for your local anesthetic or do you use it for rinsing the syringe with dexmed do you use your 5 uh, i usually i i usually prefer 2 ml or 2.5 ml syringes for all my secondary spinals yeah, i hardly use a ml volume. syringe yeah, yeah it changes the volume yeah absolutely yeah okay. with 2 ml syringe around it is 2 micrograms with 5 ml syringe it is around 3 and with 10 ml syringe it goes to around 4.8 to 5 micrograms yeah. the dead space in very small small doses do you say yeah that? around 2 micrograms and that is sufficient most of the times i think it's been a been a long day and uh, i think it's time to wind up over to som thank you everyone thank you naresh it's a very enlightening very eye opening presentation i've never uh, seen i've been resistant, resistant myself uh, when our team wanted to do it but after talking to naresh over uh, the last couple of months i'm more receptive to the idea and uh, we look forward to trying it at our own center uh, recently in indonesia they conducted a three days workshop on this segmental spinal yeah we i had the opportunity to give a lecture at indonesian society and recently dr om gons he has posted some videos about his yeah. three days workshop yeah so yeah well hope so okay it, it will appear in the textbooks it will it will i think uh, so uh, once som and his center starts doing it we might actually because his bangalore is i think more central and people if you want to actually there are many them, many freelancers who are doing it actually yeah, there they are, are there are some of the freelancers absolutely so getting the, a daily feedback about this I, i think the important thing is to have a system of audit when people do it and then they say i did this and you know there is no credibility attached to it because the numbers are not you know the data yeah. is not uh, you know uh, collecting that i started uh, i mean uh, yes putting it in the medicis app uh, posted and last two months i have entered around 40 cases right. in that I, i think that's that's where we all uh, you know really fail uh, we, we don't have data that's properly collected that's retrievable that's verifiable uh, that's something yes. that uh, as a fraternity we have to try to do yeah uh, especially with the regional 
anesthesia and, and especially so with something that is trend break trend setting like uh, you know segmental spinal uh, thoracic segmental spinal so uh, naresh uh, thank you very very much uh, my eyes are wide open my brains wide open uh, i've been enlightened i and, should thank uh, you for providing me this opportunity and uh, would like to thank all the faculty who taken their time out on a saturday to be with us uh, to enlighten all of us including all uh, the people who joined in us joined us uh, on the youtube uh, it's been a great long day but you know we've loved every every minute of it thank you very much everybody hope to see all of you again tomorrow uh, at 11 o'clock for another long day a uh, longer day i would say uh, with even more uh, interesting sessions uh, tomorrow thank you uh, everybody once again and have a good night get, get some rest for for the long day tomorrow yeah okay uh, i will thank stop you. Uh, streaming on the uh, thing